وَإِن تَعْجَبْ فَعْجَبٌ قَوْلُهُمْ أَيْذَا كُنَّا تُرَابًا أَيْنَّا لَفِي خَلْقٍ جَدِيدٍ أُولَئِكَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا بِرَبِّهِمْ وَأُولَئِكَ الْأَغْلَالُ فِي أَعْنَاقِهِمْ وَأُولَئِكَ أَصْحَابُ النَّارِ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أستاذ عبد الرحمن حسن وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته How you doing today? I'm good alhamdulillah barakallahu fi Mashallah So I want to do something a little bit different to what we normally do on the hot seat today inshallah This is our last episode of the year 2020 And for those that don't know the hot seat podcast has actually been around for quite a long time It's something we started in 2019 I've not just had yourself on the podcast but I've also had other guests like Sheikh Muhammad Tim Humble Hafizahullah and Anybody who might have come across this podcast in the last few months or so, I encourage them to go to our channel, look on the playlist section, and they can find the entire, I think, 20 or 21 episodes that we've done so far. Having said that, there's no doubt in 2020, since we relaunched the hot seat, it's gone up a notch. And now our episodes become longer, they become a little bit more detailed, we've got a new set. And one thing I wanted to do today is kind of review the episodes we've done so far this year. Uh, there's nine episodes in total and I want to go through them and really just talk a little bit about what we spoke about on the episode. Uh, I'd really like to get an insight. I think for a lot of the students of knowledge out there who might be watching this, they'd really like to know what kind of books you read in preparation for each of these episodes. And then one thing I've done is gone through the comments on each episode and I've gathered maybe two to three, maybe four questions from the viewers uh, on the, each episode. And I think it'd be nice to answer them in this session, inshallah. So the first episode we started with was an issue uh, that dealt with homosexuality, the LGBTQ movement, and how we as Muslims should navigate around that movement. And this was actually an episode that was released on YouTube, but Qadr Allah YouTube have actually taken it down, which of course they have the right to do that. It's their platform. If anybody wants to listen to the episode, it is still available on the iTunes podcast app as well as Spotify. But I think it'd be good to, at the start just to give a, a reminder to the viewers who did get to watch the episode what we spoke about. Our religion of Islam, um, there's a concept known as the fitrah, the natural disposition, the way that Allah wa Taala created a particular person, or the way Allah created all mankind. And the fitrah, its usages is a lot in the religion, yeah, and it has many different definitions, many different meanings. But from one, one of its definitions is the way Allah Subhanahu wa Taala created this person and things that he has placed inside this person to know what is right from what is wrong inclinations to things and if you look at the quranic discourse you find that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made what is known as a male and a female there's a purpose and a wisdom behind it there's other issues that islam talks about when it comes to the concept of sexuality and that is the concept of having sexual intercourse with a woman that you're not married to mm. deliberately having sexual intercourse with her and this is called zina in islam also, Islam has a very strong position regarding that. Allah says in the Quran, Wala zina. Do not come close to zina. Innahu kana fahishatan wa Do not come close to zina. For verily, it's an evil act. Okay, so what should a Muslim man do if he's having homosexual thoughts? Is he expected to completely rewire his feelings of attraction? Me and you both agreed earlier that it's impossible for us to even imagine being homosexual for a day. Um, or is he meant to just leave marriage and attraction altogether? And we obviously know marriage is a big part of the sunnah. It almost feels like he's got no way out. One of the ways that a person uh, can work on is concept of patience and self-restraint. Restraining yourself, resilience, yani having control over yourself, disciplining yourself. The Prophet Sallallahu he said in Hadith Bukhari and Muslim both narrated, if a person comes with chast, Allah will help them with the remaining. Anyone who becomes with patience, Allah Ta'ala will help them and give them the patience that they need. And that Hadith mentioned, there's nothing given to a person better than patience. Also Allah Ta'ala told us in the Quran, anyone who strives in the cause of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, they fight to follow the commandments of Allah Ta'ala and stay away from the prohibitions. You fight, Allah says, we will guide them Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to that which is good for them. And Allah is with those who are uh, righteous and noble. What is your position on working with uh, a gay rights movement, an LGBTQ community to uplift that oppression? Would you do it? 
I wouldn't work with them because I find that word very like working with them in tales back and forth and I wouldn't work with them to be honest uh, and I don't think any Muslim should but what I do believe is if anyone's oppressed and a situation arises and I'd have to take a position where I would have to come with so many different communities in order to get that rights brought back to its place I would do it and if the only community the that people, was supporting it was the LGBTQ community, only them supporting it. Uh, well, whoever is doing it. I said, by the way, LGBTQ community is not worse than disbelievers. I said, I'll stand with the disbelievers okay. in order to bring that rights back. Okay, fine. That's been t- but I ha- that thing that I'm bringing back has to be something which is shar'an, legislated. So as you can see, we really dealt with the issue from two different perspectives. We looked at what is the ruling of homosexuality in Islam. And then how do we navigate through this whole political movement known as the LGBTQ movement? And are we allowed to engage with them or not? What were kind of your thoughts during that episode? Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Lahu alhamdul hasan wa thanao al-jameel wa ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah wahdahu la sharika lah Yaqulu al-haqqa wa huwa yahidi al-sabil Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa tabi'in lahum bi ihsanin ila yawm al-deen amma ba'd what I try to, inshallah ta'ala, advise myself and also want to advise the people who are watching and listening is the importance of only seeing the Quran and the Sunnah as your main source where you take your religion from. It's mm-hmm. important that whether you uh, uh, speak the Arabic language or not, uh, whether you're a beginner student of knowledge or not, you always have to know in your heart that the Quran and the Sunnah is where we take halal and haram from. If we want to say this is halal, we take it from the Quran. If we want to say something is haram, we take it from the Quran. وَلِذَلِكَ اللَّهُ تَبَارَكُ وَتَعَالَى says in the Quran, وَعَلَى اللَّهِ قَصْدُ السَّبِيلِ And the legislation is for Allah تبارك وتعالى. In the حكم إلا لله. The legislation to say this is halal and this is haram to sanction things are for Allah سبحانه وتعالى. Humans don't choose. Um, this, humans are, don't have the rights to say this is halal based on their own whims and desires but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the rights he's the one who created who, he's the one who brought us into this world he has the rights to make things halal and he has the rights to make make things haram and the Prophet sallallahu is one who conveys to us that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sanctioned we have to follow both of them Allah azza wa jalla and his messenger Allah says in the Quran uh, Subhanahu wa ta'ala wa ma kana li mu'minin wa la mu'minatin idha qada Allah wa rasuluhu amra an yakuna lahum al-khayratu min amrihim if Allah and his, if Allah and his messenger pass a ruling in a matter we have no choice to be honest mm. we have to submit and listen and in this ayah Allah says if Allah and his messenger and in both of them we have to take wa ma kana li mu'minin wa la mu'minatin idha qada idha qada Allah wa rasuluhu amra Allah and his messenger pass a ruling in a matter we have to have to submit also Allah says in another ayah فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ حَتَّى يُحَكِّمُكَ فِي مَا شَجَرَ بَيْنَهُمْ ثُمَّ لَا يَجِدُوا فِي أَنفُسِمْ حَرَجًا مِمَّا قَضَيْتُ وَيُسَلِّمُ تَسْلِيمًا What is upon you is when you see these textual evidences come to you from the Quran and Sunnah and of course they are authentic from the Quran and they're also authentic from the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is that you surrender to it you give you give in to it and you you are pleased with what Allah yeah. wa ta'ala judged Sometimes you will understand the wisdom behind things. And sometimes you may not understand the wisdom behind things. But the point that's required from you as a slave is to surrender. It is to ad- adhere to the commandments of your Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And come with the, the real meaning, the real reality of servitude. There's a master who's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you are nothing but a slave. Mm-hmm. And that you truly honor that station. Ridalika, Allah wa ta'ala spoke about Nabi Allah Muhammad at times when he was, you know, at the best moments, yani, uh, Allah will refer to him as a slave. Mm. Allah says, Subhanallah, asra bi abdi layla min al masjid al harami ila al masjid al aqsa. Allah referred to him as a slave. When Allah wa ta'ala spoke about the Quran coming down on the Prophet, he said, Alhamdulillah, ladi anzala ala abdi al kitab wa lam yaja'allahu iwaja. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke about the Prophet standing up to give da'wah, he said, وَلَمَّا قَامَ عَبْدُ اللَّهِ يَدْعُوهُ كَادُوا يَكُونُونَ عَلَيْهِ لِبَدَا And he served, Allah didn't use any other word except Abd. It's something that nowadays many people have this negative connotation of the word slave and, and without doubt outside of Islam it might take that negative connotation for many people. But certainly when you look at being a slave of Allah, this is not something negative this is something honorable noble. very honorable and, and and the sign of a slave is that the master says something and you just say i hear and i obey you don't question him 
You trust him, you believe him. And that is inshallah ta'ala, if I wanted to achieve anything in, in this podcast that I did was to say to the people, Ya ikhwatil kiram, my beloved brothers and sisters around the world, the Quran and the Sunnah are what we have to adhere to. We have to be slaves to Allah and His commandments and surrender to them and give in to them. We also have every solution, every issue we have, the solution is in the Quran and the Sunnah. It's there right in front of us. We just have to learn how to take it out yeah. of the Quran and the Sunnah. Yeah. And Alama Muhammad al-Amin Shankiti used to say, Man arad dunya al-Quran. Anyone who wants the dunya, let him learn the Quran. Man arad al-akhirah, let him learn the Quran. And anyone who wants the hereafter, let him learn the uh, يعني Quran. The, يعني the Quran. And if you want the hereafter, uh, ومن أرادهما فليتعلم القرآن. And if you want both of them together, then learn the Quran. And of course, the Sunnah is there. It's a revelation from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a great introduction, and I think those points really hold true for not just the uh, podcast we did on homosexuality, but for all of the podcasts that we've done. And we do want to tackle these difficult contemporary issues that many people might shy away from. And it's no doubt an issue that has been more prevalent in the last 20 or 30 years, the issue of LGBTQ being on the rise. Um, people in the West are really struggling with this one. They're not sure what to do with their kids even being in schools. So I think that was a really comprehensive podcast where we dealt with a, dealt with a number of different things. Um, what kind of books did you read for in preparation for that episode? In general, all of the topics, there are like common books I use. Maybe some topics I might use other books and I may not use it in this particular topic. But generally what I do is I first of all go to the Qur'an and I see that to be very important for me because again as I mentioned the Qur'an is the source of legislation for every single Muslim who believes in Allah and the Day of Judgment. So I always go to the Qur'an first and when I look at the Qur'an I always look at the Qur'an based on the exegesis and um, which is the explanation, the commentary that the great scholars of Islam have put on it. Mm, the tafsir. The tafsir book. So I go to definitely first of all tafsir ibn Kathir uh, or Tafsir Mujarir, sorry, first. Mujarir Tabri's Tafsir is considered for, to be from the uh, Tafsir al Ma'thur, which is that his Tafsir, you benefit from it, the quote of the early Salaf, the pious predecessors, the ones that the Prophet ﷺ told us, nasi qarni thumma thumma that the best generation are my generation, and those to come after, and those to come after. So Mujarir Tabri, what he would do is he'd bring an ayah. And it will give you the tafsir of the sahabas and the tabi'in and the atba'u and tabi'in. And I really love to know their commentary first before anybody else. And a lot of the times Ibn Jarir al-Tabari rahimahullah when he brings the tafsir uh, and it's really يعني, happens that the tafsir is يعني, uh, tafsir uh, al-tadad because the tafsir is two types. Okay. There is tafsir which is al-tanawu' and tafsir al-tadad. Tafsir al-tanawu' means they're all saying uh, different wordings but really you can you can reconcile between their views. Qatada is saying something, Sudi is saying something, Mujahid says something, Ikrima says something, Hassan al Basri is saying something, Qatada is saying something. But when you look at it, it's it's easy to reconcile between their views. So it's not a big problem. That's For example, they're just looking at an iPad, or obviously we're looking at an iPad. And people describe it in different ways. Someone might say this is this is an Habit. Apple product. Someone might say this is grey. Someone might say this is big. Like just, yeah. but they haven't contradicted each other in any way. Yeah, yeah, I'm true. It's true. So it's called اختلاف التنوع And the second type is called اختلاف التضاد Which is that uh, the views are going against one another One is saying something uh, Like for example أولا مستم النساء Which we mentioned in some of the episodes The word lams The two mm. views of Ibn Abbas and Ibn Mas'ud Are contradicting one another Because based on that There's going to be a khilaf A dispute in this matter sure. So great mufassirin like Ibn Jir al-Tabari Will try to reconcile between their views after that And I like how he does the tarjih And how he strengthens it Rahimahullah rahmatan wa So I always go to his tafsir Tafsir Al-Allama Ibn Jarir Al-Tabari The great Mufassir He's considered to be Or they refer to him as Imam Al-A'imma um, uh, They call him Sorry Imam Al-A'imma Imam Al-A'imma is, is uh, Abu Bakr Ibn Khuzayma Sorry They call him Imam Al-Mufassirin Ibn Jarir Al-Tabari Rahimahullah Ta'ala I also go to Tafsir Al-Baghawi Which is A very summarized kitab Like in Allah It's very important kitab Tafsir Al-Baghawi Rahimahullah Ta'ala Tafsir Ibn Abi Hatim I go to it as well Tafsir al yeah, Ibn Kathir al-Si'di I also go to Tafsir al-Amin al-Shanqita I really think it's very important I've quoted him quite a lot yeah. His Tafsir is, 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 is a, it's a unique, One of the unique Tafsir that's out there And he proved the concept that the scholars mention Which is Kam How many yani How much has the early scholars have left behind for for the ones to come later So yani, you would think to yourself How many books of Tafsir have been written Can really someone come after and write a Tafsir book 
لكن محمد الامين الشنقيطي ريسنتلي يعني كومبايلد ذس تفسير بوك ويتش بروفز يو ذا رايتنج اوف تفسير از اولويز جوينج تو بي هابينينج اتس ون ذا ميراكلز اوف ذا قران سبحان الله اتس عجيب والله اند وات هي داز سبحان الله سو يونيك اي اونستلي He's he's one of the early books I go to in the tafsir of an ayah if I want to see it because he speaks he speaks about it from a from a perspective of language from a perspective of usul fiqh he speaks about it from a perspective of balagha and bayan al badi' and his kitab is actually called is called adwa' al bayani fi idah al quran bil quran so he does that best type of tafsir of the quran which is tafsir of the quran with the quran. Yeah. So if he gets an ayah here, he'll explain it with another ayah. Right, right. Yeah. Rahimahullah, wa so, The way he does it is so, it's so unique, rahimahullah ta'ala. So I really go back to it. Mm-hmm. Um, I also go to kutub al-qira'at when it comes to Quran. If I'm looking at an ayah, if he has different qira'at, I like to, especially if I see that Ibn Jarir mentions it in his tafsir, or Ibn Kathir mentions it, or Baghawi mentions it, or they mention, or Amin al-Shakhiti mentions it, I like to look it up even more and research a bit more into it. So I go to the nashr, fi al-qira'at al-ashr. By Ibn al-Jazir, rahimahullah, I'll look into it more. He'll explain it even more. He'll expand on it. I look into it. Um, uh, also, I, I will look at the uh, Shatibi's, Ushaq uh, al-Shatibi's, Hirz al-Amani, which we turn in the Qara'at al-Sab'a, and the Shuruhat and explanations put in it. Kutub al-Hadith would be the second place I'll go to, generally okay. speaking. I'd go to the Sahih al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, Imam al-Bukhari sahih because it's the most authentic kitab by kitab Allah, Azza wa Jalla. The great Imam, Imam Al Iraqi, he says, "وأول من ألف في وأول من ألف في الصحيح محمد وخص بالترجيح ومسلم بعد وبعض الغرب مع أبي علي فضلوا ذا لو نفع." So the most first person to have written an authentic book is Imam Al Bukhari, رحمه الله. Uh, so I go to that kitab if the hadith uh, is mentioned, or I can find I, I need a hadith and it's in Bukhari. Uh, I go to Sahih al-Bukhari first. Okay. I look at the 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 bab that Bukhari put it under. I look at under the chaptering he puts it under. I would also look at the explanation of firstly Ibn Kathir, Ibn Hajar, sorry, Fath al-Bari. I'd first of all look at the Fath al-Bari of Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, rahimahullah. Second, I would go to is the Fath al-Bari of Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali. Because Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali's Fath al-Bari, a student of knowledge cannot be without it. Because he brings you aqwal al-Salaf a lot. مواقف السلف you won't find it as much as you find it in Ibn Rajab Ibn mm-hmm. Kathir حتى, Ibn Hajar sorry Ibn, I keep saying Ibn Kathir Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani he doesn't bring you as much of the مواقف السلف the way Ibn Rajab does Ibn Rajab subhanallah sometimes he will explain a whole hadith with the aqwal of the salaf <laughs> like Ibn Jarir does with the eye of the Quran so it's, in, it's very unique and he took the name Ibn Hajar from uh, He took it from uh, Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, took it from Ibn Rajab, who was before him. Ibn Rajab wrote the Kitab Fathul Bari, and he passed away in Kitab al-Janais. Oh, wow. Ibn Rajab, yeah, the chapter of funeral. Ibn Rajab died there, and he didn't finish the book. If he finished it, subhanAllah, subhanAllah. So Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali's Kitab, so, yeah, there's a muhaqqiq of the Kitab al-Sharh al-Ila li-Tirmidi by uh, Hammam Sa'id. Or, uh, yeah, it was Hammam Sa'id. Uh, he mentioned something like, Nuri, there's two muhaqqiqat of Sharh uh, al-Tirmidhi Nuruddin written in Hammam uh, Abdul Rahim Sa'id. Hammam mentions something like uh, Ibn Hajar didn't copy the name from Ibn Rajab because he never saw it. But that's incorrect because I, I saw in Fathul Bari twice at least he quoted from Ibn Rajab ah, al-Hambali. Okay. So he must have taken the name from him. Hmm. Uh, also Sahih Muslim would be the second kitab I'd go to if the hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim. I'd also go to Sahih Muslim and I'd look at the Sharh of Imam Nawi rahimahullah ta'ala. Nawi's explanation is profound. It's, it's amazing. And then I'll go to the other books. The third book I generally go to is Al Muwatta of Imam Malik, rahimahullah ta'ala. And uh, Muwatta Malik, I will look at the riwayah of Yahya ibn Yahya al Laythi, because that's the last and the most great, that's the best copy of uh, the Muwatta. And I won't go to, you know, yani comparing the different riwayat of Muwatta, but I would sure. go to that one first. And I'd, I'd be happy with that one. Okay. And that's the one that Ibn, Ibn Abdul Barr. You know, used for his Tamheed and Istithkar, both of them. And I'd go to those two kitabs, Tamheed by Ibn Abdul Bar and also the Istithkar by Ibn Abdul Bar. And there's a difference between the two, many people don't know. The Tamheed, it more focuses on the Sana'atul Hadithiyah. Mm-hmm. It focuses more on the Hadithi pers- perspective. It more deals with the Hadith and the Marfu'at. Okay? It deals with more what's attributed to the Prophet. 
Whereas the istidkar deals with the more with the mawqufat and the, the sana'a al-fiqhiyya, the fiqhi issues. So if I'm really wanting to focus on a fiqhi issue, I'll go to the istidkar. And if I wanted to go to more to the issue related to the hadith itself, I'd go to the tamheed by Ibn Abdul Bar. Okay. Uh, Bashar Awad's ma'roof's tahqiq is so far the best. Even him, he's been critiqued for some of the point, some of the you know, any mistakes that he, were found from his manuscripts that he relied on. Bashar Awad ma'roof. Um, but that would be the in terms of hadith. And I would also look at the other kutub al hadith like Sharh al Sunnah Imam al Baghawi and Al Muntaqa by Ibn al Jarud and you know Musnad Ahmed. I would look at it with the Fath al Rabbani. معجم الطبراني في الحديث ازاي كتب الحديث I would focus more on the daru ta'sil tabah I wouldn't try to look at any other tabahat because the other tabahat are not so, so far they're not uh, صحيح ابن خزيمة صحيح سنن الدارمي سنن البيهقي I would look at those كتب الحديث uh, give a lot of importance to it just to know the different uh, I did rely a lot on when I was looking at the athar of the sahaba مصنف ابن أبي شيبة I looked at it a lot I compare the Muhammad Awamah's one and Sheikh Sa'ana Shitri's Tabaat. I look at both of those two copies. Um, Tarh al Tathrib, I'd look at it by Al Iraqi. I mm. really think it's powerful. Riyadh al Salihin is very important for me, especially the Nawawi, the chapter he puts it, where he places it in. I, I like it. If the hadith is also, in, sometimes I can't be you know, able to go to the hadith from the, the big books like yeah. uh, Sunan al Bayhaqi, or I can't look at it, but Sunan Abi Dawood and Shuruhat Sunan Abi Dawood, like Aun al Ba'bud or Tuhfat al Ahwadi, I just stick to Subul al Salam by Amir Sanani. Amir Sanani has an explanation. On Bulugh al Maram. So I'd look at that from Shokani Nailul Al Taraf used it uh, from so especially from music perspective. Yeah. I looked at it a lot. Um Kutub al Takhrij, uh, authenticating and grading the hadith that you sometimes brought in the podcast you were discussing with me. Yes. I would go to the Kitab Tarkhis al Habir, uh, which is Ibn Hajar's uh, Kitab in Takhrij al Hadith. I'd go to Ibn Mulakin's Kitab Tuhfat al Muhtaj, uh, Nasbur Raya by Zayla'i. نتائج الأفكار باي ابن حجر I'd go to the kitab تحفة الطالي باي ابن كثير الموضوعات باي ابن الجوزي رحمه الله تعالى and علا المتناهية باي ابن الجوزي as well um, البدر المنير also I uh, looked at it but I don't fully use the بدر المنير because of the fact that I, I suffice myself with the تلقيس الحبير like for example الميزان والاعتدال باي ذهبي for example I would really focus more on لسان الميزان because I like ابن حجر's you know for example the tahdib abu tahdib al the tahdib of abu al hajjaj al mizi for example tahdib al kamal al hajjaj al mizi i wouldn't really focus too much on it. i'll look at it here and there but yeah. majority of my focus would be the tahdib al tahdib by ibn hajar okay because i like to, ibn hajar's you know nukat and his taliqat and his i give a lot of al bani's irwa al ghalil i really looked at his silsila hadith al sahih and daifa uh, it's one of my early books that I go to. I look at Sheikh Nasser's authentication of hadith. That doesn't mean I always blind follow what he says. <laughs> 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 of course. <laughs> but I like to see what Sheikh Nasser has to say well, about it. We're smiling because obviously it came up in the niqab uh, issue, which yeah. I'm sure we'll come to. Kutub yeah. al-Rijal, uh, like the narrators and a bit about who they are. And, yeah, and if I want to research more, I don't, I'm not convinced with Sheikh Al-Bani's arguments. I go to Kutub al-Rijal, I look at the Du'afa by Uqayli, I look at the Kabir for Du'afa by Ibn Adi. With Ibn Adi one, I like the tahqiq of Sheikh Masir is Mazir, Mazir, uh, Sheikh Mazir Asrsawi. Sheikh Mazir Asrsawi's tahqiq, he personally gave it to me when I went to, when, when, when I was in Qasim. Oh, wow. I actually met him wow. in Qasim. And he actually gave me the copy himself. Tariq al Ausad by Bukhari, I'll look at that. Ilal by Ahmad ibn Hanbal. The Ilal of Ibn Ahmad, I like the tahqiq of Sheikh Rasulullah Abbas. Okay. And I use that a lot. Tariq Abi Zur'at al Damashqi, I like that. Al Hajjad al Mizah, I said already, his tahdib, I would use it. It's 35 volumes. Bashar Awad Ma'roof's one. Uh, but I wouldn't use it as much as I would use the Tahdib al Tahdib by Ibn Hajar al Asqalani. And Sir Alam al Nubala, a must go to for me. Mizan al Atidal, I also look at it, but not as much as I look at the Lisan al Mizan by Ibn Hajar. I like that more. Tahqiq al Abstaha al Gudda. What's funny is that, or oh, good news for the students of knowledge, is Tahdib al Tahdib, inshallah, soon. Darul Birr is going to publish it, inshallah ta'ala. Okay, inshallah. Uh, sorry. Also, the Kitab al Du'afa by Nasa'i and the Daru Qutni is Ilal. Daru Qutni is Ilal means a lot to me, and I really, Ilal Warida. A Jarhu Ta'adil ibn Abi Hatim, Abdul Rahman ibn Abi Hatim, the son of Abu Hatim al Razi, and Kitab al Majruhin ibn Hibban. Those are books I look at. Kutub al Mustalah, sometimes just to check up Mus'ala or Mustalah, I go to mainly two Kitabs, and the rest are just. Go to if there's a need for it. 
I'd go to the Fathul Mughith by Sakha, which is the Sharh of Al Fitul Iraqi. And I think that majority of time I just stick, stick to that, Kutul Mustalah. Mm-hmm. If I feel like I want to see more and I want to look at more, I go to, and the second kitab I, I go to a lot with the Fathul Mughith is the Tadrib al Rawi by Suyuti. I think these two kitabs are very important for me. Beyond that, I look at it just in case, just if I need more. I look at the kitab, Ma'rifat uh, al-Hadith by Haikim. I would look at the Taqid wal Idah by Iraqi. I would look at the, uh, the kitab, uh, sorry, Nukhbat al-Fikr, Ikhtisar al-Ulum al-Hadith and others like that. Kutub al-Aqeedah, mm. um, all of the books of Shaykh al-Sam Taymiyyah. Yeah. I would look at any, all the kutubs of Shaykh al-Sam Taymiyyah and his student, Ibn al-Qayyim. I don't give any exception to that. Yani, the, all of their books are important for me. So, Muqtasar Sawa'iq al Mursala, I'll take that kitab and I'll look at it and give it importance. The Nuni of Nurqayyim, I'll look at it. Um, very important. Rahimahullah, uh, Rahmatan Wasi'ah. Yani, Ibn al Qayyim, and he's the teacher, his teacher at Ibn al Taymiyyah, I believe any student of knowledge who does not read their works, you can always see that they feel empty. Mm. You can always tell. Ibn They've Taymiyyah, got gaps. They've got there's gaps. a gap missing yeah. from you. Um, الشريعة لإمام الأجر رحمه الله تعالى الرجع على الجهمية بعد داريمي شرح أصول اعتقاد أهل السنة بعد أبو قاسم هبة الله لا لك أي شرح, سك... شرح السنة بعد عبد الله بن أحمد بن حنبل uh, كتاب السنة لابن أبي عاصم على لكادات um, I quoted a lot from the kitab رسالة الزيد سجزي بع إلى أهل زبيد I quoted that from when I was talking about الحرف والصوت I read that معارج القبول the Sharah of uh, Salum al Wusul, Ila Al Wusul, Bahaf al Hakami, the three volumes with the Tahkik of Halak, Dar ibn al Jodi. I really go back to that law. Kutub al Fiqh. Mainly, I go back to two kitabs. When I, if I want to look at Fiqh al Muqaran, three books, three books mainly. Wahala ibn Hazmin, Mujmu' by Nawawi, and the Kitab al Mughni ibn Qudama. Those are three, compar- they are, I consider them to be comparative Fiqh. I mean, they are comparative Fiqh. They're called Fiqh al Muqaran, which before was never called Fiqh al Muqaran. This name, Fiqh al Muqaran, is a is a contemporary name that was given to it. Like in the early scholars, they used to call it Al-Khilafiyat. Comparing between the, the different madhabs. The different madhabs. Okay. So I, I generally go to Al-Mughni, what Ibn Qudama said. Mughni is an explanation of the kitab, Mukhtasar Al-Khiraqi. Ibn Qudama is explaining Mukhtasar Al-Khiraqi. And Nawawi is explaining the Muhaddab al Ishaq Al-Shirazi, Al-Majmu'ah. I like to go to those two, and I like to look at Ibn Hazm and his Muhalla. It's very important for me. Those three books give me an understanding of the views in the issues of fiqh. But I also understand a very important point, and I want also students of knowledge to understand it, which is Ibn Qudama's quoting of the madhab of the Han- Hanafiya, for example, hmm. or the madhab of the Malikiya or madhab of Shafi'iya is always not accurate because okay. that's not his madhab. Yeah, he's a humble. So when I look at it, I look at it as an overview just to understand it. But I also go to their madhab books and I look at it. Uh, I, I don't see. always just stick to the 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 referencing. Yeah. Also, Al Ausal Ibn Mundir as well. The Ausal Ibn Mundir would fall into the fourth book for me. I really think it's very important. Also, um, then of course, Kutub al Shafi'iya and Kutub al Madahibs, I'll go into it. Usul al Fiqh, I, I, I love to go to Sharh al Kawqib al Munir, it's very important for me. And of course, the Maraq al Su'ud, the Mubtagh al Ruqi al Su'ud. Abdullah ibn Hajj al-Shanqiti I go to that kitab and I'm re- me, I mainly focus on the Nashr al-Bunud Nashr al-Sharah I use the Nashr al-Bunud um, also Irshad al-Fuhul I really like it Shawkani rahimahullah ta'ala because it's tahqiq for ilm al-usul he's Shawkani is not held back by a madhab mm. so he's yeah. I, I like uh, his views so there's mainly three kitabs or four kitabs in usul al-fiqh I really go back to Irshad al-Fuhul by uh, uh, Muhammad Ali Shawkani, the Kitab Maraq al Saud, the Mubtagh al Ruqi al Saud, the Nashr al Bunud. I go back to that. I think it's important. Kawkab al Munir, and also the Al Bahr al Muhid by Zarkashi. Those are the main books. Qawaid al Fiqhia, because the Qawaid al Fiqhia is like really, especially the three Madahibs, Marikiya, Shafi'iya, and Hanabila, are not really far from each other. Mm. I don't really yani, go too deep into it. I mm. like any two kitabs generally al qawaid al fiqhia by hafiz ibn rajab's one ibn rajab's qawaid book and i also like the al qawaid al muthib fi qawaid al majmu' al muthab fi qawaid al madhab by salah uddin al ala al kaykaldi rahimahullah al shafi'i his kitab al majmu' al muthab fi qawaid al madhab is a kitab qayyim jiddan and the mashallah the wizara of oh kuwait have published it mm. um, those are the those are the two main ones i use 
Um, تاريخ of course I look at the كتاب uh, تاريخ الإسلام by ذهبي for example البداية والنهاية بلو كثيرا رحمه الله شذور الذهب لابن عباد وفيات العيال لابن خلقان and all those كتابات if, if I need to if it's particular individuals I want to look at their lives now I always go to like for example ابن تيمية I will go to كتاب العقود الدرية الدرية في بعض مناقب شيخ الإسلام تيمية by ابن عبد الهادي I will focus on that and I will read that also كتاب البدر الطالع by شوكان is also very good الدرة الكاملة is also ابن حجر is very good I like to read that. If it's the ulama of Da'wan Najdiya and their, 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 their life, which we haven't really done much on, no. I like to go to Abdullah Bassam's kitab, Ulama Najd, Khilal Thamaniyat al Qurun. Nahu, to be honest, me, I, I focus more on just Al Fiyat al Malik and the Sharh ibn Aqil. Rarely do I go to Amshak al Shatibi, Sharh of Al Fiyat al Malik. Um, because what we need from this podcast is not more than what's mentioned Al Fiyat al Malik. Yeah. So Al Fiyat al Malik, Sharh ibn Aqil is what I stick to. Uh, Arabic language dictionaries and Lisan al Arab, Tadibu al Lugha by Azari, Misbah al Munir, you know, Al Qamus al Muhid, Mukhtar al Sihah, and Mu'adjum Maqayis al Lugha ibn Faris, those are the books. Kutub al Adab, yani books in Adab and, and, and uh, Arabic literature. No, the first one is diction, the, the literature. I really, I don't think I've had to use any. Uh, literature related issues in our podcast yeah like in adab al katib ibn qutayba ayun al akhbar by ibn qutayba i like it keep al kamil ibn mubarrid is very so also kitab i like these are what i would just read by myself even the kitab al bayan wa tabin by jahid al mu'tazili i i just i read it for my own personal sake mm. you know and i really give a lot of importance to mahmud shakir's works um Al-Alama uh, Mahmoud Shakir, the brother of Ahmed Shakir. I like his works. Very, uh, uh, very profound for me. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So these are kind of like, uh, I think my initial intention from uh, kind of asking you what kind of books did you read in preparation for each episode, I think you've asked the person that and as, you, as you've given something that a student of knowledge can take the last 10 or 15 minutes, almost keep that video and use that throughout his years of seeking knowledge and understand the different kind of books. What's interesting for me is that you kind of organize your mental library in different sciences like hadith is aqidah this oh, yeah. fiqh this that, that's something that you kind of have in your mind that if you come to preparing for a podcast and you know this particular issue of fiqh is going to come you go to your fiqh library and say okay is that is that how it I works know. like it's just I interesting know. to get an insight so yeah the, in terms of studying and see there's two things researcher has to be a person who already studied before mm. yeah and you can't just go to a book and just read it yourself and you're going to get misguided um well, you if you really want to learn They have to have a sheikh to teach you. So well, that's why I say to students of knowledge, for example, if you study fiqh, ala madhabi, according to a madhab, like Imam al-Shafi'i, for example, you study madhabi shuja'i, you finished it with the teacher, and then you, after that you done the kitab uh, Yaqut al-Nafis, and then you did Umdatu Salik, Umdatu Nasik, Ibn Naqib al-Masri, and then you did Al-Zubad, Ibn Raslan, and then you did Al-Minhaj by Imam al-Nawi, you finished all of that. After that, you go, go, mutala'a, go kutubs, research. You know, don't let no one stop you Now yeah. you've studied with a, a teacher He's taught you these books You've gone through this program You're free to go Tawheed for example You study Thalatatul Usul And you study Kashf al-Shubuhat And you know Kitab al-Tawheed And Nawaqid al-Islam And Usul al-Sitta And all of those Kutub al-Tawheed That you studied And then you study Kutub al-Aqidah By Al-Wasat al-Hamawiyah Tadmuri al-Tahawi You study all of those books Now you should be reading الحجة في بيان المحاجب أبو قاسم التيمي You should be reading Usul Shalh Usul al-Tawheed Hali Sunnah Abu Qasim Hibatul Allah 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 You should be reading uh, the Kitab I'tiqad al-Aimati al-Salaf by Abu Bakr al-Ismaili and Aqidat al-Salaf Ashab al-Hadith by Abu Uthman al-Sabuni. You should go, go. Mm -hmm. You've studied with a teacher. He's taught you these, the main important framework. Yeah. He's given it to you. Researching this. Yeah. You study Nahaw, for example, Al-Jurumiya. You've done Tumutamimatul uh, Al-Jurumiya. Then you did Lamiyatul Al-Af'al. Then you went back to Qatr al-Nada wa Ballu al-Sadali min Sham al-Nisri. And then... You did Al Fiyat ibn Malik. Why, why are you yeah. going to wait for a teacher to explain for you? Mughni yeah. Labi by Ibn Husham. You don't need it. Oh. So, and now you've got the keys. When you open, for example, those books, it's not, you're not, you're not reading something, you're scratching your head. I'm like, I don't understand this. Yeah, yeah. You've got the foundation. Ah, of to, course, of yeah. course, you understand it. Yeah. I think, to, so to bring it back to the hot seat, one thing that's always really intrigued me is that we're dealing with contemporary issues. These are people, these are issues that many people see are kind of like new issues that are coming up. 
And time and time again, we sit opposite each other and you'll bring in classical sources. And it really shows that the classical scholars of the past, the early generations, like the, some of the books you've just mentioned, they really didn't leave any stone unturned. No matter what issue comes up, you could be able to bring it back into one of those books. Mm -hmm. Having said that, is there any times, do you ever look at non-Muslim sources to get really an understanding of particular topics when we're talking about you know, a particular issue we're going to discuss on the podcast? Do you ever go to the, the Western sources? Um, definitely, I do. I do look at some Western academics, what they've written on work, works. But remember, I'm going to mention some some places and some things I look at. But what I try my best not to do is to bring contemporary things from, especially even even contemporary scholars. Yeah. Like I try to make it classical. I try to keep it to the the classical thick books mm. um, and the classical scholars instead of quoting contemporary. I rarely try to. I try avoiding. Quoting contemporary scholars Not that there's nothing Anything wrong with it That's fine It's good It's just not what I focus on Yeah I believe These early scholars Have already given us These answers So especially when it comes To western academic researches Alhamdulillah A lot of our youngsters along, along, A lot of Muslims In the western countries Have already read these things This is available for them So I And a, a lot of the speakers Today in the world Muslim speakers They, they bring these things they, they, they bring these things To the Muslims anyways so, but what Muslims I feel like are hungry from their need of their dying, they desire uh, is the knowledge of the classical scholars. And I've seen that in my circles. Like, have the ulama spoken about these issues? Have they said something? Is there research on these mm -hmm. issues? Um, a lot of people ask those questions. Like, there's not enough Islamic research on these issues. And I say there is. There are. The people don't need to they're filled with these things. Yeah. You just have to learn how to bring these things out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you know what it is? These scholars have given us the, you know, the framework. They've given us the qawaid and principles. Someone needs to take those qawaid and apply it on these contemporary issues. The scholars are not going to give you every single time one plus one is two. They're not going to say that to you. They just teach you that plus does this. Yeah, yeah, I see. Yeah. So if one plus two is given to you, you know it's three now because you know what plus does. It's like when you learn the Tajweed rules, you don't learn every single individual letter, you just learn a rule and then you apply it to whatever letter falls under. Exactly, under. exactly. So, the poet, he said, فَدِينُنَا لَمْ يَخْلُوا عَنْ حُكْمٍ عَلَى مَرِّ الزَّمَانِ لَوْ بَدَى مَا أَعْضَلَ لِأَنَّوْ قَدْ إِحْتَوَى قَوَاعِدًا تُسْتَقْرَجُ الْحَكَامَ عَنْهَا رَاشِدًا Our religion hasn't left anything behind. That's why, that's why it's a powerful religion. It's قَوَاعِد and it's ضَوَابِط principles. You need to be grounded enough and sharp, take those principles and apply it. Yeah. So Ibn Taymiyyah, when the time of the Tatar came at his time and the Magonians were, 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 were basically um, invading the Muslim lands and killing and massacring their people, Ibn Taymiyyah had to take these Masail Jihad, apply on his situation. Mm. Do you understand my point? Yeah. The Mustajidat and the, you know, the, the, the Nawazil that were taking place at the time of Ibn Taymiyyah, he has to go and to the Quran and the Sunnah and apply it in these situations. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's there. It's yeah. really there. It just requires thorough research. It requires deep understanding of these classical works. And I hope, inshallah ta'ala, I can dedicate my life to bringing those things to the English-speaking world. Inshallah. So let's talk, uh, before we move on to start taking a question from the Homosexuality Podcast, um, again, just this introductory kind of your approach to preparing for a podcast. Most times, we kind of agree a topic, then you go away and do your research, I go away and do my research, and we don't really even communicate to each other that much. Maybe the, the odd issue here or there, but not really in detail. Uh, what is your kind of approach? Do you, le you know you're going to be coming onto a podcast where a lot of questions are going to be raised, a lot of doubts are going to be raised. Do you first look at the doubts or do you first look at what's for you and then look at what's against you? Like what is the process you undertake? So for example, you mentioned a topic we're going to be speaking about. I don't know what your questions are going to be. So my focus is First of all, I need to bring usul and dawabit. And I know majority of the times, any point you're going to bring, majority of the times, I have an understanding because of the fact that it's, it's sad to say this, but people just keep regurgitating the same points. Like humans yeah. just keep repeating the same points they were responded to, but they still bring it back again. It was responded to, they keep bringing it back again. And so, and they might try to slightly alter it, but it's kind of the same point. It's just a different wording, and it doesn't escape one of the principles that you've already learned about. Yeah, I rarely sit in a, the podcast with you, rarely, and I, I feel like, oh, that question is actually really. Mm. Your much your style of doing it, along with that, <laughs> is really unique, and the way you present those points are very strong. 
and uh, you're gifted with that Allah alhamdulillah <laughs> but generally the, the arguments i feel like i've heard them before i'm i understand those so what i do is i don't first of all go to the shubhano i go and i bring the principles that are comprehensive okay. that when i set this foundation your shubha that you bring you can't get out of these dawabid which are amma yeah. so if you look at the quran that's how it works you know, the Jews, for example, what did they say? They said, Yadullahi uh, Allah Allah's hand, subhanahu wa ta'ala, is maghlul. He says, hid, it's closed. It's, it's, Allah is stingy, that's what they said. Allah, tabarak wa ta'ala, he said, Gullat aydihim wa lu'inu bima qalu bal yadahum wa basutatan. Yani Allah spoke longer than they did. Their yes. shubha is very small, but Allah responded to a very long response. So, the point I try to do is, I try to get to the dawabit, the principles, the qawaid. First of all, I set that down. Then when we come to your shubuhat, it's easy to def- 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 deflect them because of the fact that these dawabit and these qawaid are solid. They're really hard for you to go outside them. Yeah. So whatever you bring is either not going to be sarih or it's going to be daif. So it's either going to be weak that you're bringing me something which is weak that I, it's easy to just prove the weakness of it because I've looked at the uh, sanid and the riwayat or it's, um, it's not sarih, it's not directly that you uh, 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 It's not direct at the point that we're speaking about yeah. um, So uh, For me personally I feel like If I read the Shubhas first What it does to me It, it doesn't let me focus on bringing the principles first mm-hmm. So I first try to bring the principles first What is for me I, Then I go into the books and I write all the Shubhas they, There is yeah. this issue um, yeah. there, there have been quite Quite a few times To be honest Here or there That you've brought a doubt mm. That at this moment I had no You know uh, I wasn't fully Acquainted with that mm-hmm. Particular Shubha like that Yeah And I never looked at it Like that But it always returns back To the original but it always, principles It's always easy already. for me To bring yeah. it back to the Qawaid Amma And the Dawabid That I, I previously mentioned And I, th- I think One thing that the viewers Have to understand as well That the way the hot seat is designed is it's a very one-sided conversation. You're always on the defensive. I'm always yeah, yeah. asking, asking, asking. You have to answer the questions. If we flipped it and it was actually a normal discussion outside of the settings and you were allowed to ask me questions or you'd have to flip it on me and kind of come on the attack. It's happened a few times off camera and it's a totally different story. Like it, yeah. it's a very, Allah, very Allah, easy. Allah, I have to give it to you, mashallah, Allah, may Allah reward you. You know, your, your, your efforts are very strong, Allah, and the points that you bring are very, very strong points, to be honest. And... But that's important for you to know that it's very easy for like it, 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 if you were able and I gave you the opportunity to kind of flip the argument, actually ask me questions. It's so clearly that you're on the truth. It's just the way the podcast is represented. It's only me allowed to ask the questions. That's important for the viewers to know. And that's one of the reasons why I like not to read or know what your arguments are yeah. for me personally, because number one, it sharpens my thinking process and how I look at the points. Um, and secondly is um, uh, it should be authentic. I mean, these these mm-hmm. people they should feel like their arguments are authentically presented. Yeah. Um, they feel like their their points were brought. So now, nah. okay, let's go into the Q and A. So with the other episodes, I did mention what I've done is go through the comments that we've got on the other episodes. Obviously, with the uh, topic on homosexuality, it was obviously removed by YouTube, and when that went as did the comments. But I did look through our email address and just to remind the people at home if they do have any questions, they can email us at questions at amau.org. And we did have a, a, a question um, that is relevant to this podcast. Somebody asked um, via email, am I allowed to work in a school that heavily promotes LGBTQ tolerance? I mean, the country that you're in right now, for example, if this person is in the UK or in America, I mean, the whole country... <laughs> Is tolerant towards the LGBT community. There's not really much you can personally do. Um, the I mean, so if if the if the school is tolerant but isn't propagating it, in a, not not necessarily propagating, but if it's not pull, you know, I mean, pushing it down your throat in order to push it, and it's not telling you you have to talk about LG, you have to promote it. That's not what they're saying. And then and also it's not affecting your deen and it's not affecting you. Then uh, inshallah ta'ala it shouldn't be haram. But I would encourage you to leave that kind of environment and walk away from it. Try to find somewhere else. Uh, but if it, if they're not forcing you to push it, for example, they're telling you you have to teach this and 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 and, and, and mention you know this is fine. And if they're not saying that to you, and also you're not your deed is not getting your your deed is not getting affected. 
then inshallah I don't see a prohibition in 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 it's interesting you mentioned that it's, you know your country itself because moving on to the second podcast that's exactly what we spoke about we spoke about the issue of hijra yeah. and we wanted to look at it really from the perspective of whether it's obligatory or not and that was really what we wanted to focus on so let's just give the viewers a reminder of the kind of things that we discussed on that podcast the question that i want us to answer together is not whether hijra is a good thing it's whether it is obligatory upon the muslims and i'd really like to focus our conversation around that point Hijra is three, first of all, three types. There's hijra of amalus su. You do hijra from evil action. The second type of hijra is hijra to belad su, migrating from an evil land. The third type of hijra is hijra to ashab su, migrating and leaving and staying away from evil people. Ibn al-Arabi, rahimahullah, he said hijra means the type of hijra we're talking about is from the land. It is to leave the land of the disbelievers. The le- before we even go into the concept of hijra or not, the concept of al-wala wal-bara, within the Muslims, within, sorry, the lands of the non-Muslims and coexisting with them and and staying with them, it weakens this concept. My question is, do you think that maybe based on your personal experiences, you're taking this a bit extreme? The Western countries now are working towards assimilating the Muslims with the non-Muslims. They're forcing you to accept the British values. Muslims are being put in situations where they're asked, are you a Muslim first or are you a British first? Two conditions when they're present, the hijrah becomes wajib. The first one is Adam al ala din. You can't practice your religion. Mm-hmm. The second one is you have the ability to leave that, leave that land of the disbelievers. So what does it mean, the concept, or what does it mean, idharu din, that you can show your religion, you can practice your religion. What does it mean? Great scholars have come and explained what it means. It means two things. The first one is i'lanu shaair al-Islam, that you can symbolize, you can bring to the open the symbols of al-Islam in its totality, not portions of it. Okay. Like the Adhan and the Salah and the Siyam. The Adhan. You, I'll ask you now, can in the UK we do the Adhan in the open? There are some massages that can, yeah. But in the whole entire UK? Uh, in the whole entire UK, no, you no, can't. Okay. So we have in the entire United Kingdom f- for now, and as much as me and you know, sure. only one masjid that's, allow, that's basically open to do them. That's considered Sha'air, the symbols of Islam. That's the biggest symbol. Okay, how does that affect anybody other than the Mu'admin? I'm a normal, I can, I can, I can go a bit, I can wear a thob, I can live my life. No, but you said that you can implement your religion. Yes, Islam. I can implement my religion. I don't care about the Adhan being called, I can implement my religion. I'm not calling it the Adhan. It's, yeah. not, it's nothing to do with me implementing my religion. Mm. Theoretically, I can't really dispute what you've been saying. Practically, this is where the game changes. Nowadays in a Muslim country, there are clubs, there is alcohol, um, even when you send your kids to school, they're non-Muslim expats. You're living next door to a non-Muslim in an apartment building. Where should Muslims go? Where? There was a guy, English guy from the UK. We all don't. We, we all of us don't want to hear it. If you want to hear it, close your windows. Listen to it yourself. Don't impose it on everybody else. You know what he did? He closed the window. He put the music down. But the point I'm trying to come to you, I can never do that in the UK. It's, it's, it's a beautiful picture, but it's going to come to an end because none of these Muslim countries give you visas and citizenship and ultimately you and your family are going to have to end back into the UK. That's Who said hijra possible. is something very easy? Who? Where, did we say that it's, 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 you have to, in order to do hijra, you have to get a, 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 a countries have to let you in? No, it's not. It's hard. People who are able to do that are very, very few. And therefore you issuing a rule of, ruling on all of the Muslims because of what a few of the Muslims can do, that seems unjust. There's an ayah in the Quran where Allah wa ta'ala connects hijrah with jihad. And those, you can imagine the weight of that. Allah wa ta'ala, he says, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَهَاجَرُوا وَجَاهَدُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَالَّذِينَ آوَوْا وَنَصَرُوا أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ حَقَّا لَهُمْ مَغْفِرَةٌ وَرِزْقٌ كَرِيمٌ Allah says, those who believe, migrated, fought, for the sake of Allah wa ta'ala. They are the ones and those who gave shelter and victory, they are the true believers. We are talking about this discussion all this time. What I was talking about is a man staying in these countries. The story changes when it's a mother and kids. So some of the points we discussed there, we talked about the definition of hijra. We talked about when it becomes obligatory. We talked about, is it even practical? Like where can the Muslims go? And I think a lot of things that also came through in that is that more from your side, a kind of like emotional, heartfelt plea to the Muslims um, and kind of advice to them on this topic, especially the Muslims living in the West. I don't know if you have any thoughts about what you can remember from that podcast. Yeah, to be honest, you see, 
even if we put aside the ahkam and the rulings and the regulations, as a Muslim who lives in a land like that where the religion has been, you know, disrespected like that, your deen, and the non-Muslims are attacking your deen, right, left, center, Nabiullah Muhammad has been put down and he's been belittled. Mm. Hijab has been banned, for example, in France. Things like that, put halal and haram aside, put the hukum shara'i aside. As a Muslim, does this not affect you? 100%. 100%. This is where, this is where personally, I was pleading to the people's hearts. Like, yeah. where do you think you stand in a situation? I'll give you an example. If you went to someone's house and they never fed you, or they kept telling you, I don't like you in my country, get mm. out of my, or they tell you to get out of my house. So get out of my house. I don't want you to be in my house. Or the person was making you sleep on the floor, or the person was insulting your parent. Mm. I mean, things like that. Would you still stay in that place? Of course not. Yeah. You'd say no. You so know, it's, it's almost humiliating to, to kind to of stay, stay, right? Yeah. So why do you stay in a land like that? Where yeah. you're the non-Muslims have come out, they've clearly and categorically said, We don't want you in our country. Yeah. Now, I know this sounds very harsh. And a lot of Muslims might get upset with this, but this is their country. Now, don't don't lie to yourself. For example, Pakistan is your country, right? A white guy flew over to Pakistan. Is he a pa- is that is that his land? No. What about even if they give you a Pakistani nationality? Do you so, still consider him to be a Pakistani? No. So I don't see why the table changes yeah. when it comes to them. And I agree. And I think, you know, when we see these issues that are coming up in the West, like Muslims lobbying and kind of complaining that why are they teaching our kids about LGBTQ issues in school? That's that's their country. Yes. They have the right. If you don't like it, you have to leave. That, that's, that's kind of the way, the way it works. And I, I would almost flip it. And imagine if we were in a country and in a Muslim country, and obviously the whole system is based around Islam. It's made easy to practice Islam. And a non-Muslim comes in and say, why can't I find alcohol here? You kind of look at him a bit weird, like, what did you expect? Like, you know, and some Muslims, maybe they don't see it from this perspective. Maybe they've been in the, in the West for so long, so many generations. But ultimately, I do empathize to a certain extent with those people who say, you know, um, why are Muslims even complaining about what we teach in schools? Mm. It's got nothing to do with them. Mm, like, mm, mm. I do get where they're coming from. It's uh, yeah, it's an interesting one. Um, I think this is my personally my favorite episode. I think that we've done so far. I think it's very, it's, a, it's an issue that obviously both of us were born and raised in the in the UK. We both now made hijrah. We came to the, um, this country, and it's something that I would say is in my top three decisions in my life. Alhamdulillah, it's one of the top three to five decisions that I've made in my life to do hijrah. And it's one of those things where I never understood the impact it would have on me. Never. I actually thought that I was I was able to practice in the UK. I really did. I thought I was good you in the UK. You realized when you left the country? 100%. Because I realized only, you become so desensitized to it when you, once you're in the environment. I mean, to give context, it's not that I was comfortable in the UK. I love the UK. I, I, I've got stories from my parents that they tell me that when we used to go on family holidays and I used to come back to Heathrow Airport, I used to kiss the ground and say, I'm home. Really? This is, yeah, honestly, this is the UK. Okay. And like come from that mindset Allah to Allah. really leaving and realizing. It's only once you leave, you actually realize Sorry. that life, you're allowed, you know, it's, uh, and let's put, even we're talking about Islam, obviously, but even secondly for that, just the safety. It's okay to go outside when it's dark. You can't, you can't do that in the UK sure, sure. in certain parts. So it's a whole different mindset. But even adding on to what you just mentioned, I really think a lot of people, when it, when it comes to Muslim countries, the first country that comes to their mind is Saudi Arabia, mm. UAE, Qatar, Bahrain. There's 50 Muslim countries. Subhanallah. There's Bangladesh, that's a Muslim country. There's Bahrain, there's Brunei, there's Djibouti, there's Egypt, there's Jordan, there's Kuwait, there's the Maldives, there's Malaysia, there's Mauritania. There is Morocco, there's Nigeria, there's Oman. Nigeria, is it a Muslim country? I'm not sure. I know more it's heavily 50%. Christian and Muslim. I don't know. I don't know. But Muslims are more than 50%. Mm. That's uh, one of the questions we're going to come to, in fact. Okay. Yeah. Nigeria, for example, Oman, for example, Pakistan, it's a Muslim country. Qatar is a Muslim. Saudi Arabia, Somalia, um, Sudan, Tunisia, Turkey, United Arab Emirates, and Yemen. Yeah, I and mean, some countries I mentioned, like Yemen, for example, and Somalia, maybe you, know, you might think to yourself, you know, there might be wars. You might think that. Even though the one I personally, what I've seen is that the way that is, things are projected to when you're really there is different. Mm. Some of these countries, when you see it from outside, you know, you're watching on news and you're like, oh, this place is... But in reality, it's it's not like that when you go there. The point I'm trying to come to, even Gambia, for example. Gambia, the population of the people of Gambia is 1.8 million, approximately. Okay. 95% of them are Muslims. Wow. 
Why are you going to? I have good news. I've heard about it. I've spoken to brothers about it. Very low cost of living, even. I've Very heard. low cost living. Even Sheikh Abdul Zakhal Bader has opened a university, Islamic university there. Mm. Yeah, any good khair and nashat, ilmi and good is happening in Gambia, mm. for example. Um, also, uh, in my country, Somalia, for example, there's good nashat ilmi. There's marakiz Islamia. There's a lot of things happening. You cannot, you you know, Pakistan. So ulama, ulama, I know that are there that are spreading da'wah to Ahlul Sunnah, that are spreading khayr and Islam and everything. What Malaysia? I I travelled and I went there. Yeah, you know Turkey. Mm. Allah mabari. Yeah. The news, that's, the good news that's coming from Turkey and the khayr that's happening there and the freedom of da'wah and everything. It's amazing. Yeah. So what I'm saying is that Sudan. Yeah. It can go on and on already. I can really go on. Yeah. Why do you first of all think about Saudi Arabia? Why do you first of all think about? You understand my point? Yeah, totally, totally. Yeah, I think uh, it really is a topic that I could talk for hours and hours upon. I just think that since I've been in this country, which is four and a half years, the West, particularly the UK, which I really have more of an understanding than US, the UK has just got worse and worse to the point where I th- often think for people staying in the UK, you might think you're okay. You might look at yourself, your wife, your children, and think you're okay. But if you don't leave that country, then generation after generation, who knows when somewhere in your lineage Atheism, oh. Christianity, someone's mm. going to go off That's and true. certainly your whole lineage is cut off. So do you think like St. Albans is also the same as London? Uh, like there are a lot of people who are saying maybe London, the crime rates, the Muslims, you know, being exposed to this, um, these, you know, filth and evil and stuff like that. Maybe in rural areas. Mm. Is it say, say, <laughs> it's a city, you know? It's a, it's a city, but it's a small city. It's it's just outside London, it's in Hertfordshire, so it is, it is much smaller than London. Yeah, I think um, there's no doubt that different areas within the UK are different to each other in terms of their practice of Islam. We would never say Birmingham is the same as St Albans, for example. Birmingham is a much more bigger mis- Muslim community, and there is a point that the crime rate in London, in particular, is very very high. But you're never going to escape the fact that no matter which area in the UK or which area in, in, in England, for example, or even in the UK, there's principles that are standard for everywhere. Mm-hmm. Like, for example, the laws that allow you to teach these kind of things in schools. Like, for the f- example, that the Adhan is not called out loud. It is in one masjid in London. Um, the fact that, you know, even wearing a thobe and a beard and, and having a beard and walking around the street, you just don't feel comfortable and I don't feel comfortable for my wife for example to walk outside with a hijab or jilbab like these kind of things will stay standard no matter where you're in the UK I feel why do you distinguish between hijab and jilbab we're going to come to that later on like I know some people do so we, <laughs> don't worry it's coming this is the hot seat reverse yeah <laughs> okay um I do want to get through some of these questions because we actually had a lot of questions for this particular episode. Uh, the first one is, and you alluded to this earlier when you said, is Nigeria a Muslim country? Some people actually, and I think this was actually my fault that I should have really asked it on the podcast. We should have gone into what exactly is a Muslim country? Like, how do you define a Muslim country? So, yeah, the concept of Daru Kufrin or Daru Islamin. This is something, to be honest, when you look at the kalam of the Fuqaha, the great scholars of fiqh, whether they be the Hanafiya or the Malikiya or the Shafi'i or the Hanabila, you there isn't one يعني, concrete response that the scholars have in the Manat al Hukmi al Dari bil Kufri or Islam. Mm. That this land is land of Kufr or it's a land of Islam. There isn't like a clear cut statement where the scholars and they have evidences for it like that. Okay. Everyone has their view, everyone pushes their view. And uh, to yeah, I mean, do you do you judge it based on the ruler? Do you base it on the people? What do you base it on? So there's very conflicting views, and there isn't a clear cut evidence in the issue. There are two evidences generally, there's two strongest evidences that are used: the hadith of Buraida, uh, radiallahu anhu, found in Sahih Muslim, where he said, "Kanan Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam ida amara amiran ala jaysin aw sariyatin aw sahu fi khasati bi taqwa Allah wa ma maahu min al Muslimin khayra." The Prophet said, if he would ever send an expedition, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or he send an army, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he would advise them. He would remember, he would tell them, you know, be conscious of Allah, fear Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and he would tell them, Ughzu Bismillahi fi sabilillahi qatilu man kafara billahi Ughzu wa la taghulu wa la taghdiru wa la tumathilu wa la taqtulu walidan. Yani, don't kill children, don't kill women, don't deceive, don't steal and loot. You know, fight with those who are disbelieving in Allah. Restrict your fighting to those who are, yani, the disbelievers. Don't kill other people, yani, the women and children. Don't kill them. 
وإذا لقيت عدوك من المشركين فادعوهم إلى ثلاث خصال أو خلال and if you meet your army don't fight with them straight away mm. call them to three things so in this hadith the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم إنه he says ثم ادعوهم إلى التحول من داري من دارهم إلى دار المهاجرين وأخبرهم أنهم إن فعلوا ذلك فلهم ما للمهاجرين وعليهم ما على المهاجرين يعني the Prophet used the word دار here right. let them move if they accept this message from you then let them move to the dar of the dar of the muhajirin and the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم uh, mentioned the dar al-muhajirin so the scholars they try to say from this that the dar al-muhajirin it means that the muhajirin have power يعني okay. they are in charge of that land You're kind of talking governmental now. Yeah, some fuqaha they took from there that, okay, maybe it's a you know, governmental perspective. Some scholars, they said, no, we look at the people who are in that land and the people who reside in that land. So, for example, Shaykh Al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, he says, وَكَوْنُ الْأَرْضِ دَارُ كُفْرٍ أَوْ دَارُ إِيمَانٍ أَوْ دَارَ الْفَاسِقِينَ لَيْسَ صِفَةً لَازِمَةً لَهَا بَلْ هِيَ صِفَةٌ عَارِضَةٌ بِحَسَبِ سُكَانِهَا Ibn Taymiyyah says, first of all, calling Or Darul Fasiqin, he says it's not first of all a sifatul lazima talaha. It's not something that's consistent. That this okay. this land is always going to be. It can change. It can change. Time to time. But here sifatun aridatun bi hasabi sukaria. It changes from time to time, and we look at the population. Right. So he's indicating more instead of the government, it's more the people. Exactly. Even okay. another place, Rahimahullah, he says, "Wal biqaa wa taghayyir wa hakamuha bi taghayyir ahwal ihaliha." The land changes. Because of its people, فقد تكون البقعة دار كفر إذا كان أهلها كفارا ثم تصير دار إسلام إذا أسلم أهلها. This land can be down the lands of the disbelievers if the people of that land are disbelievers, mm. and it can change it to become دار إسلام if the people are the Muslims. كما كانت مكة شرفها الله في أول الأمر دار كفر وحرب. And so مكة was once upon a time دار كفر وحرب. So it changed. Yeah. Also, that you can sense from that the Hadith Anas ibn Malik in Bukhari and Muslim. It say it mentions and it says كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يغير إذا طلع الفجر فإن سمع أذان أمسك وإلا أغاره. Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم used to listen to the fajr prayer. He wants to hear the adhan. Mm. And if he heard the adhan صلى الله عليه وسلم, he would hold back. If he heard the adhan, he would leave them. And if he didn't, then he would wage war on them. So the symbols of Islam have to be apparent. The people have to be Muslims. Um, ولذلك ابن القيم even attributes this in his كتاب أحكام أهل ذمة. He mentions this is the call of the Jumhur. He says, فالجمهور, The majority of the scholars are of the opinion, دَارُ الْإِسْلَامِ هِيَ الَّتِي نَزَلْهَا الْمُسْلِمُونَ It's the land that the Muslims stay in. وَجَرَتْ عَلَيْهِ أَحْكَامُ الْإِسْلَامِ And the rulings of Islam f- apply on it. وَمَا لَمْ يَجْرِ أَحْكَامُ الْإِسْلَامِ لَمْ يَكُنْ دَارَ إِسْلَامٍ And the land where the rulings, the symbols of Islam and أحكام of Islam are not applied, then it's not a dar of Islam. So it's, it's, it's conflicting views. Sure. Sure. ولذلك الإمام الشوكاني on the other hand he says الاعتبار بظهور الكلمة فإن كانت الأوامر والنواهي في الدار لأهل الإسلام بحيث لا يستطيع من فيها من الكفار أن يتظاهر أن يتظاهر بكفره إلا لكونه مأذونا له بذلك من أهل الإسلام فهذه دار إسلام ولا يضر ظهور الخصال الكفرية فيها لأنها لم تظهر بقوة الكفار ولا بصولتهم and then he says وإذا كان الأمر بالعكس فالدار بالعكس رحمه الله in other words he says That the land, what we say is whose commandments applies in that land. Who, when they say something, it has to be done in the land. Who can prohibit, who can legislate in that mm. land, that's where it goes back to. Okay. Even he says that if there's disbelievers, يعني, kufr, things that are happening in that land. And for example, there's kufriya taking place. Mm. Um, it still doesn't take away from it being a land of Islam. And he also mentioned Rahimahullah Ta'ala and Muhammad Ali Shawkan. He was this issue of Daru Kufrin, Daru Imani, that a lot of people make it into a um, big back and forth. He says, and Imam Shawkan, he says, he says there's really not a big fuss about it, to be honest. Because he says, Yani the Khilaf, there's no Thamaraf that's taken from it. In a sense, in a sense, mm. if a Muslim goes to the land of the disbelievers, he's still, in, you know, Ma'asum. You know, his blood is sacred to you. You can't touch him. You can't kill him. And if a, a, a kafir was muharib, a kafir which is harbi, if he goes to the land of the Muslims, he's still a harbi, even if he's in the lands of the Muslims. Mm. But it does make a difference in, in terms of the hijra discussion, right? Because people are told to migrate to a land of Islam. So in that sense, then this is quite an important, uh, uh, important definition. But I suppose the least we can say is that a country that has a Muslim government, majority Muslims, 
and that the symbols like the Adan, the symbols of Islam are, are, are apparent, no doubt that's a, that's a land of uh, Even, what's his name, in Aqeedah books, sometimes they, they mention it, like Abu Bakr, Ismaili, rahimahullah, the great Shafi'i, Faqih, and Alim, uh, in his kitab, I'tiqaj uh, Aymat al-Hadith, he mentions, um, he says, وَيَرَوْنَ الدَّارَ they see, يعني, أهل السنة, they see, وَيَرَوْنَ الدَّارَ إِسْلَامٍ لَا دَارَ كُفْرٍ They see, uh, أهل السنة, they see the land to be the land of the Muslims and they don't see it as the land of the disbelievers. Mm. كَمَا رَأَتُ الْمُعْتَزِلَةِ The Mu'tazila seeing the lands of the Muslims, the land of the Kufar. Right, right, right. مَا دَامَ النِّدَاءُ بِالصَّلَاةِ وَالْإِقَامَةِ بِهَا ظَاهِرِينَ أَمَا بِهَا ظَاهِرَينَ وَأَلُهَا مُمَكَّنِينَ مِنْهَا آمِنِينَ He says, they see that land to be the land of the Muslims and not the land of the disbelievers. Not like the way the Mu'tazila see it. Basma Ata and Amr ibn Ubay, those who came from them. مَا دَامَ النِّدَاءُ بِالصَّلَاةِ وَالْإِقَامَةِ بِهَا ظَاهِرَيْنِ As long as the salah and the iqama are apparent. وَأَهْلُهَا مُمَكَّنِينَ And the people have been given tamkeen. They've been grounded. They've been, يعني, governance has been given to them in that land. So he mentions those two shurots as well. Okay. For me personally, I've looked at the aqwal of the ulama. I've spent yes. years, years looking at this issue. I can't really pinpoint what seems to be right. But Sheikh Ibn Baz rahimahullah ta'ala, he says the hukum is for the aghlabiyyah, the majority of the people of that land. Okay. And Sheikh Al-Alama Al-Bani rahimahullah, something like that as well. Mm. Okay, cool. Um, I think like when it comes to individual countries, it often gets difficult because of this very reason that it's hard to place a, a general principle. Uh, but we did have on the comments a number of different countries. People asked about Lebanon, Turkey, a number of different different countries. But I think one country that probably is worth mentioning because it was mentioned over and over again on the comments is India. And India is, as you know, I think one of the large, I think the third third largest population in the world in terms of number of Muslims, mm -hmm. just in terms of number of Muslims, not percentage, but number of Muslims. Uh, the I think the, I've not been to India, but I know you have. Is the Adan called out loud? Yeah, yeah. Sir. The Adan is called out loud. There's more masajid in India than many Muslim countries. However, at the same time, under the current government, the Indian Muslims are also being oppressed. Would this be classified as a Muslim land or would it be classified as a land that someone has to make hijrah from? No doubt, it's not the, it's not, India is not a Muslim country. That's a, that's the a reality. But um, whether the people need to do hijrah and the situations regarding that per se in India really Wallahi, requires like the ulama of that land to look into the yeah. situation. I, I've, I have visited there, mm. but visiting there doesn't give you the rights to give a general ruling. And it requires somebody who knows the land very well. Um, visiting is, um, is not enough to give a ruling on it. Yeah. So really I think the issue of India... There, it has its scholars, it has its people of knowledge. And inshallah, I think they can give a, a more fruitful and beneficial uh, verdict. Okay, you really liked your trip to India, didn't you? There's, I actually, really, I really there's, there's a video on our channel, I think it's called something benefits from my trip to India or something like that. And I really encourage a lot of people to watch that, inshallah. Yeah, I really think I, I benefited a lot from that country. Yeah. And there are great scholars in that country. You know, it hurts the heart of every Muslim to see mm. the way that the Muslims are being dealt over there. It really hurts. And, where, and, and other places like China and countries like that, it hurts to see what's happening to the Muslims. May Allah uplift from the Muslims um, the, the pain and the suffering that they're going through. Whichever of those who pass away and get killed in that way, may Allah resurrect them with the martyrs, Yawm al Qiyamah. And may Allah give the Muslims and Islam the honor that once upon a time the Muslims had. I mean, Islam always, always has honor, but may Allah give the Muslims the honor that they had once upon a time, the upper hand. Um, okay, the next question I have for you is. Uh, is as follows It's true that Somalis and Pakistanis Have origin countries That they can return to But what about American slash UK reverts Where can they go? If you look at the hadith That I mentioned And the evidences That I provided Regarding migrating From the lands of the disbelievers You can sense that the Prophet Was talking to a people That were migrating To a land that's not their land mm, True The people yeah. of Mecca Were not the people of Medina They were foreigners Into that country mm -hmm. And the Prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he had said, "Ana bari'u min kulli Muslimin yuqimu bayna adhhuri al-mushrikina," Hadith Abu Dawood and Tirmidhi narrated, and uh, many of the scholars they graded this Hadith to be uh, Sahih, like Sheikh Muhammad Nasr al-Din al-Albani, in his fifth volume in his Irwa al-Ghalil, he authenticated. Alhamdulillah, rahmatan wasi'a. Even that though some scholars they said it's Mursal, like Sheikh Nasr, he discusses it in great details in his Kitab Irwa al-Ghalil. Irwa al-Ghalil. The Prophet here he said, "Ana bari'u, I am free from min kulli Muslimin, every Muslim." So he didn't. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam And you know the word Kulli mean is yeah. It is يعني, The strongest form of Adawat al-Umum It's the strongest form of Generalizing something yeah. It's literally saying Every Muslim 
So the Prophet said, I am free from every Muslim who lives amongst the non-Muslims. Also when the ayah came down, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ تَوَفَّهُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ ظَالِمِ أَنفُسِهِمْ قَالُوا فِي مَنْ كُنْتُمْ قَالُوا كُنَّا مُسْتَضْعَفِينَ فِي الْأَرْضِ قَالُوا أَلَمْ تَكُنْ أَرْضُ اللَّهِ وَاسِعَ فَتُهَاجِرُوا فِيهَا فَأُولَئِكَ مَأْوَاهُمْ جَهَنَّمْ وَسَاءَتْ مَصِيرًا إِلَّا الْمُسْتَضْعَفِينَ مِنَ الرِّجَالِ وَالنِّسَاءِ وَالْوِلْدَانِ الَّذِينَ لَا يَسْتَطِيعُونَ حِيلَةً وَلَا يَهْتَدُونَ سَبِيلًا فَأُولَئِكَ عَسَى اللَّهُ أَنْ يَعْفُوَ عَنْهُمْ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ عَفُوًا غَفُورًا Here Allah only gave an exception who illa al-mustadhafina min al-rijali wa al-nisa'i wa al-wildan elderly men who are unable to migrate women who can't migrate and children who cannot migrate لا يستطيعون حيلة ولا يهتدون سبيلا فأولئك عسى الله أن يعفوهم أن يعفو عنهم these are the ones who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive subhanahu wa ta'ala وكان الله عفوا غفورا so يعني the Prophet didn't صلى الله عليه وسلم or even the ayah didn't you know give the reverts an exception he gave the ruling for every, every, every one of them ولذلك أبو نخيلة البجري أبو نخيلة البجري he said that Jarir bin Abdullah al-Bajari came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The hadith you can find it, Al-Imam Abu Abdul Rahman al-Nasai mentions it in his uh, Sunan. That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, Jarir bin Abdullah, the Prophet gave him pledge of allegiance. Hmm. Uh, and the thing that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, so Jarir came to the Prophet and he said to the Prophet, Ubusut uh, yadaka hatta ubayyaka. Open your palm, O Messenger of Allah, so I can give you pledge of allegiance. And وَاشْتَرَطْ عَلَيَّ The Prophet gave him a condition. The Prophet ﷺ uh, gave him a condition. This was what the Pledge of Allegiance was based on. Okay. Which is أُبَيِّعُكَ عَلَىٰ أَنْ تَعْبُدَ اللَّهُ وَتُقِيمَ الصَّلَاةُ وَتُؤْتِيَ الزَّكَاةُ وَتُنَاصِحَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ وَتُفَارِقَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ In the hadith it mentions وَتُفَارِقَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ you, st- you, you, you depart from the disbelievers. So this is the Conditions that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was based upon it, his pledge of allegiance. So there's no like separating hmm. reverts from the actual Muslims. By the way, Muslims are brothers and their lands are one, and that's how it should be. Right. And I, I mentioned there are many Muslim countries that the person can go to. You yeah, can go to Bangladesh, to Bahrain, Brunei. Uh, he can go to Djibouti. It's actually a hot country, but it's open. You can go there. Egypt you can go to Jordan you can go Kuwait you can go Maldives you can go Malaysia you can go if you want to Mauritania you can go Morocco you can go Nigeria Oman Pakistan Qatar you can go if it's Saudi Arabia you can go Somalia you can go Sudan Tunisia Turkey United Arab Emirates for example mm. and many many other Muslim countries Gambia there. like you mentioned before Gambia even, uh, which is a very uh, good example I mean there are many other African countries that you could go to and you can stay there and you could you could you could be It doesn't have to just be the Middle East that you look at as a Muslim yeah. country. There are other many other many 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 other Muslim countries that you could live and you could go to. And as they say, uh, if there is a will, there is There's a way. A way yeah. So if you have the will and the drive and you really want to, you'll find a way, inshallah ta'ala. Okay, inshallah. Um and of course uh, add on to that lots of dua and ask Allah to make it easy for you, there's no doubt be be made easy for you, but uh, the next question I have for you is if my Muslim country of origin is heavily upon bid'ah and nearly bans a da'wah to Salafia, whilst in the Western country I live in, I can attend Salafi circles of knowledge, what should I do? The issue of innovators is lesser than the land of the disbelievers. It's not the same as staying in the land of the disbelievers. The land of Kufr is worse than Bid'ah, la shak. Mm. Generally speaking, Kufr is worse than Bid'ah. So, where you can't practice your religion, the levels are looked at. So, for example, if you're in a land where it's the lands of the kuffar and you're a Muslim and kufr against yani, tawheed, then ashaka to migrate becomes higher. And if you're in a land where you can't practice the sunnah because bid'ah has been used against you, I'm a Buddha has spread, then also migration the same. The same applies with the land where there is fisq mm. and ma'asi and you can't do ta'a and obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yani, it's not innovation, but they're preventing you from your lihya, they're preventing you from yani, ta'at. Yeah, yeah. Then la wa raib. You should migrate from that place and go where you can practice your religion. Remember when we say religion, we mean the true meaning of al-Islam. Yani, Salafiyyah is nothing except al-Islam as-Safi. It's the pure Islam. The Islam that Nabi Muhammad was upon. The Islam that Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali were upon. The Islam that the Sahabas were upon. Salafiyah is not a group, as some people may think. Hmm. Salafiyah is just following Islam before 
qadariya and the jahmiya and the mu'tazila and the ashaira and these the these groups before they came what was islam at the time of the prophet that's salafiya that's it so you look for a place where you can practice that islam uh now nah. Okay, um, let's move on to the next topic. So you mentioned in the ayah about hijra that there is an exception for those who are weak and they they don't have the ability to to migrate. And that's kind of where we took the conversation then in, the, in our kind of like series on the hot seat. We spoke about people who are stuck in a Western country. Um, what should they do now? How can they correct the society around them? And this really focused on things like, should we go from the top down and try and change the government or should we build from the bottom up? Um, so let's give the viewers a reminder of the kind of things that we discussed on that podcast. The question I want to answer today is what should these people do? How can they rectify the society in the non-Muslim land they're living in? Ibn Jarir rahimahullah he says that Allah does not change a situation of a people except when they change their own actions. Let's be honest, let's stick to the real world, the 21st century. In the West, why don't we influence the government whilst not compromising on our religion but influence the government to bring rules and laws and regulations that make it easy for the muslims to practice their deen isn't that surely the way forward no shahid that's really not the way forward for the muslims to start from the top and come down is not the right way it's not the prophetic way by the way Quraysh presented to nabi allah muhammad power they gave it they presented everything to him they said here it is it's all yours we will listen to you the prophet could have said i go to the top and I'll get everything corrected. I'm saying, why can't we just lobby the governments? Just show them that we are a minority that has a big voice in the UK. And when we come together... Yeah, your people are not even... Shahid, that's what I'm saying. When you strengthen your community, you would tend to get a voice, an agreement amongst the community. You have a community that's united. That's, what, that's when you, you're in the masjid and you're teaching, you bring the people together. We, we will work towards something. Our community have lost their religion. Our community are divided amongst themselves. Allah told us in the Quran, Fir'aun was only placed upon the people because of their own actions. Okay, you're saying that the leader will come from the people that you, uh, you correct on the ground. Ah. In a non-Muslim society, the leader does not come from the Muslims. So who's going to lobby? When we choose the person, who's going to represent us as Muslims? And you, you can't give me a response to that. Shahid, in Islam, look at from the time of the Prophet وسلم, until, yani, till Sheikh Abdul Aziz Mubaz, carry on. All the ulama, even till now, look at it. The people who took the people out of azamat, calamities and problems were not individuals who are nothing. Ulama took the people out. The Prophet was the first one, alayhi salatu wasalam, and then there were ulama after that. Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, Sahaba to Rasulullah. These people who are activists now, who are running around trying to say that we need to remove the problems from the ummah, they are taking it upon themselves to... Uh, Respond to the doubts that the Orientalists and the non that are trying to put themselves out there to defend the religion, and they're not ulama, and they are harm to the community and a problem to the community. Ulama are who? Ulama are the people who've inherited the message of Nabi Allah Muhammad. We do know the work in the West better than the scholars. No, I mean, there's no denying. I don't think any sane person would deny that. Mm -hmm. We do know the work. Better than I know the UK better than Sheikh Salah Fawzad. That doesn't give me the rights to give fatwa in the religion. I've only got one portion. He has the ilm. I have not got knowledge. By the way, when I say ulama, a lot of people are just going to think, oh, he's referring to the Saudi scholars. Of course, they're part of the scholars I'm referring to. But they're not only the scholars. There are scholars around the world. A alim is a person. First condition is that he has the Quran and the Sunnah. Is protesting from the means, is protesting in a non-Muslim country, is it from the means that are permissible for us to undertake to try and impact some kind of change? So the scholars, they gave a, a ruling. They said it's not allowed. It's not permissible. They got it from the Quran and the Sunnah. There is in it things that are in opposition to the Quran and the Sunnah. And there are harm and problems that come from the mudaharat. Using a protest to overthrow mm -hmm. a non-Muslim government in so. a non-Muslim country. Give me harm that is that is connected to the protest in and of, with its, in and of itself. Yeah, and it goes against, especially da'wah to Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His da'wah stood up on what? Starting from the people and making your way up. These are ways that people change. The ibadah is not connected to protest in and of itself. The ibadah is connected to making better laws for the Muslims in the UK. This is just a means, just like me driving to the masjid. That's not an ibadah in its, in and within itself. It's just a means to get to the masjid. This last final reason of being of of there being harm, shara'i harms, is high. 
اختلاله الأمني safety you think at the beginning okay I've got this under control we've got people you can't promise because people are more than you and you don't have a, a, a soldiers to pin the people down and take them to the corner and drag them out of the political machine you don't have that you're just all assumption يعني the truth of the matter is our honor is going to come once we all obey Allah wa ta'ala our honor will come through when we take the prophetic method so as you can see we spoke about the issue of lobbying governments trying to get politically active i think we broke down the or rather you broke down the issue of protesting in islam comprehensively to the point where i'm not sure i've seen that in the english language again, uh, before or since i think we spent from memory about 45 minutes on the issue of protesting alone so i really encourage people who want to understand these kind of issues more they can refer to the entire episode what what can you remember from that episode i know it was a while ago but do you have any thoughts that you'd like to share there was a lot of things we discussed right we broke down the types of um, you know mudaharat what purposes that the person can do it for and we said the strongest argument to say that the mudaharat is uh, not allowed was mainly the things that it's going to lead to or the mm. things that are connected with the mudaharat that you cannot yeah. detach it from, from yeah. the harm and the problems and we know in, in our religion there's a qaida which is dar ul mafsadati awla min jalb al maslaha am daf ul mafasid muqaddam ala jalb al masalih repelling the harm takes precedence over bringing any good so before we think about يعني, bringing about good we first of all have to look at يعني, what is uh, the harm that might be in doing this action if mm. we know there's going to be harm in it the good that we're trying to bring about we pause that because the harm is what we need to push away that's very important it's a قاعدة yeah. مقررة منبثقة من الكتاب والسنة it's taken from the Quran and the Sunnah it's مقررة في علم أصول الفقه نعم Yeah, I think I remember what stuck out for me from that episode is when we talked about how to fix a society, do we go from the top down yeah. or the bottom up? And I know a lot of people logically thinking, they think if we can just change these few individuals at the top, our lives would become so much easier. But you really went into the issue and you showed that the prophetic method is actually to go from the, the ground up. Mm-hmm. And secondly, even logically speaking, if you manage to change the people, the governments will automatically change themselves because they are in essence going sway left and right depending on what the people believe the only reason that lgbtq rules came in from the government is because they saw the people they want this they accepted this and the second thing is that no matter what the government pushes from the top if you've correctly fixed the people at the bottom and you taught their dean it's not going to affect them they can put down whatever they want from the top and people can easily look at that and say this is not from my dean this is even not if you look dean. at the quranic discourse if you look at the hadith of the prophet is the prophetic tradition you find that it's focusing on the person It's an individual observation. Mm-hmm. Then the concept of yeah, Islam is is taghir nafsi. Everybody, you change yourself. For example, when Allah says, "Inna Allah la yughayru ma bi qawmin, hatta yughayru ma bi anfusim," ذلك بأن الله لم يكن مغيرا نعمة أن عمها على قوم حتى يغيروا ما بي أنفسهم. You hear the word "anfusim," "anfusim" yeah. in both verses. It's nafs. It's taghir nafs. Everybody, just rectify yourself first. You know, the hadith even I mentioned where the Prophet ﷺ said, إِذَا تَبَيَعْتُمْ بِالْعِينَ وَأَخَذْتُمْ أَذْنَابَ الْبَخَرِ وَتَرَكْتُمُ الْجِهَادِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْكُمْ ذُلًّا لَا يَرْفَعُ عَنْكُمْ حَتَّى تَرْجِعُ إِلَى دِينِكُمْ Until you return back to your religion. Mm. In the hadith, the riwayat of Tabarani, what does he say? حَتَّى تَرْجِعُ إِلَى أَمْرِكُمْ الْأَوَّلِ Until you go back to your earlier affairs. يعني Yeah. So I've always said to the brothers and the people I discuss these issues with I say look it's kind of arrogant for us to say I don't need to change myself mm. it's not me it's just those guys if they fix right, it everything right, will be fixed right. it's kind of arrogant to say you know what I'm actually contributing towards the problem that the ummah are suffering from you know I have to put my hand up and say you know what you know I need to fix myself my children my family ya ladina amanu qu anfusakum wa ahlikum nara And I need to rectify myself, number one, and then my children's situation. You know, even in the ayah, Allah says, ظَهَرَ الْفَسَادُ فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ بِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِ النَّاسِ The calamities and the hardship that you see on this earth is happening because of what? Mm. Allah says, in the ayah, وَمَا أَصَابَكُمْ مِنْ مُصِيبَةِ فَبِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِيكُمْ وَيَعْفَ عَنْ كَثِيرٌ Everything is you, you yourself, for you, you. The problems and the calamities that you see is because of you. Is because of your situation. And so, You know when I mentioned the ayah uh, where Allah Taala mentions 
ان الذين اتخذوا العجل سينالهم غضب من ربهم وذله في الحياه الدنيا وكذلك نجزي المفترين This ayah Allah tabarak wa ta'ala the last part of the ayah is what I want which is Allah mentions وكذلك unlike that we destroy the muftarin those who lie about our religion Ibn Kathir rahimahullah mentions in his tafsir that this is referring to the innovators mm, okay because the ayah Allah mentions those who've taken the ijl which was they took the um, the cow when Nabi Musa left Musa went to Tur Sina Tur Sina and then they came and they made a uh, a uh, a cow and they started worshiping that cow they innovated after Nabi Musa left and then Allah mentioned in the verse that Allah placed upon them humility and Allah tabarak wa ta'ala's wrath descended on them and Allah was angry with them in the ending of the ayah Allah says wa kadhalika and like that we deal with those who lie about our religion because those people what did they do they lied about the religion yeah. of Nabi Musa Ibn Kathir rahimahullah mentions this is for the innovators who innovate in the religion who add things to the deen and then he brings a statement of Sufyan al-Tawri rahimahullah that every single innovator is humiliated. Mm. Uh, this is referring to. So what I mean is if we come with Tawheed and we come with Sunnah and we come with Ta'a, those three, Tawheed and a Sunnah and a Ta'a, then we hope from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring about good and rectification yeah. of our situation. That's how it should be working. But um, us sitting back, pointing our fingers at other people and other leaders and other governments and, yeah, and he's saying it's because of them. Everyone's playing their role. You are part of a problem. You are part of the problem. The leader is also part of the problem. The, the, and it's everyone, everyone. So he points it at us and says, it's you guys. I can't judge the religion of Allah because of you guys. And we say, no, it's because of you. We keep pointing fingers at yeah. each other. Everyone should really focus on their self. That's, that's the that's how it is okay let's move on to the questions uh, the first question I have is um, so obviously uh, just to, to give some context to the question we did speak about politics and lobbying and influence in governments in that podcast and the question is I wonder what the sheikh's opinion on the hadith I wonder what the sheikh's opinion is on the hadith the greatest jihad is a word of truth in front of a tyrant ruler especially when he is encouraging Muslims to forget politics and focus on themselves. First of all, the hadith that you mentioned, that Afdal al-Jihadi, Kalimatu Haqqil Inda Sultanin Jair, and Imam Tirmidhi and Ibn Majah narrated an Ahmed bin Hadith Abi Sa'id al-Qudri. The hadith is sahih. But we have to understand the meaning of the hadith. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Afdal al-Jihadi. Other wordings have come. The greatest. Yani Afdal, ala sayyagati af'al is a superlative. Yani Afdal al-Jihadi, the greatest form of jihad is kalima to haqqin, it's a statement of truth in the sultan in Jair, in the presence of a tyrannical leader, in the presence of a tyrant leader. You are in the presence of a, an individual, taghi, uh, who exceeded his limits, who is killing and spilling the bloods of the Muslims. What do you do in that situation? You're right in front of him. If you speak to him and you ta- remind him of Allah and you tell him to fix up and he gets you in prison or he kills you, then what you fall under is under this hadith that we just mentioned. Mm. You are a person who is a mujahid. Not only that, your level of jihad is high. It's at the highest level. You have to do it in his presence. Now, if he or, if he's right in front of you and you do it to him and there are other people as well, it's not a problem. And so even if there are other... What do you mean, sorry? There are other people sitting there yeah. and the leader's right in front of you okay. and you advise him in front of the people. It's no issue. No problem. As long as he's there. Okay. The reason for that is because he can defend himself. Mm. And you're reaching a goal by advising him. Yeah. Well, the Salaf used to do this, rahimahullah. They didn't care who was around. They would advise him. And Imam al-Muslim, rahimahullah, he says, Bisanadi from his train, he says, Haddathana Abu Bakr ibn Abi Shayba, Haddathana Waki'i, yani Waki'i ibn Jarrah al-Ru'asi, and Sufyan in Ha, and he does the Hawil of the Senate. He says, Wahaddathana Muhammad ibn Muthanna, Qala Haddathana Muhammad ibn Ja'farin, Qala Haddathana Shu'bat Abu Bistam al-Ataki, Kilahum an Qaysi ibn Muslimin, and Tariq ibn Shihab. Uh, and the hadith is Abu Bakr قَالَ أَوَّلُ مَنْ بَدَأَ بِالْخُطْبَةِ يَوْمَ الْعِيدِ قَبْلَ الصَّلَاةِ مَرْوَانِ فَقَامَ إِلَيْهِ رَجُلٌ فَقَالَ الصَّلَاةُ قَبْلَ الْخُطْبَةِ فَقَالَ قَدْ تُرِكَ مَا, نو... ما, هو... ما هُنَالِكِ فَقَالَ أَبُو سَعِيدِ الْخُضْرِ أَمَّ هَذَا فَقَدْ غَضَى مَا, عل... ما عَلَيْهِ سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول من رأى منكم مكرا فليغيره بيده فإن لم يستطع فبلسانه فإن لم يستطع فبقلبه وذلك أضعف الإيمان الإمام مسلم narrated this that Marwan ibn Hakam what he did was he changed the the Eid, the Eid which one comes first the Khutbah or the, the Salah the Khutbah Salah comes first and then the Khutbah is done after he put the Khutbah before the Salah 
And so a man stood up and he reminded him and he said, that's not the sunnah. The sunnah is to pray the salah first and then the khutbah comes after. But he advised him in public. Abi Sa'id al-Khudri said, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that this man, what he did is what I heard the Prophet sallallahu mention in hadith, man ra'a minkum munkaran falyugayiru biyadi fa illam yastati' fa bilisani fa illam yastati' fa biqalbi wa dhalika ad'afu al-iman. Whoever from amongst you sees evil should try to change it with his hand and if he's not able to, he should change it with his tongue and if he's not able to, he should hate it in his heart and that's the lowest form of iman. This man saw the, the leader doing a munkar by innovating and he advised him and Sa'id, uh, Abi Sa'id al-Khudri used this hadith. Hmm. So this hadith Marra biyadi, is not in the absence of the leader, but it's in the presence of the leader. Okay. This is fine. There's nothing wrong with it. Also, the hadith Bukhari also narrated from his teacher again, Abu Bakr ibn Abi Shayba, who narrated from Abdullah ibn Idris and Hussein and Umar ibn Ru'aybata. He said, Ra'a Bish ibn Marwanin ala al-Manbari. Uh, Umar ibn Ru'ayba, he saw Bish ibn Marwan on the pulpit, Rafi an yadihi, he raised his hands doing this. And then he said to him, Umar ibn Ru'ayba said to him, قبح الله هاتين اليدين الله تبارك destroy your two hands. لقد رأيت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم I saw the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم ما يزيد على أن يقول بيده هكذا and وأشار بإصبعه المسبحة. He pointed his finger like this and he said, I saw the Prophet do this. Now he had gave him his يعني point in the presence of the leader. Mm. This this is different from a person who's politically engaged or in politics. You came in front of a leader. You got this opportunity. Say what you want to say yeah. to him. You mentioned it on the podcast. I think I asked you, what if you're on a flight and Boris Johnson was sitting next to you and you said, I would advise him about Islam, of course. But to make your entire da'wah and your entire goal and your objective about just influencing the poli- and getting involved in politics, that doubt is a problem. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Also, what needs to be known is that the person who's advising the leader must be a person who has the aliyah and he has the knowledge to advise the leader. Um, because when you're rectifying a problem, you have to have knowledge of what you're rectifying. Whether mm. even, not even just the leader, even another person, if you're going to stop them from something bad, you need to know that first of all, it's munkar in the religion, uh, or you'll be speaking about a matter in the religion you have no knowledge of. Yeah, and we actually went through, I, th- I believe it was on that podcast, the conditions of a scholar yeah. and what makes a scholar. Yeah. Um, okay, the next question I have, and I'm going to read this question as it came. No, but I don't want people to understand that if you want to advise the leader, you have to be a scholar. Oh, sorry, you're right, you're right. Yeah, In you're no right. way, shape or form, yeah, right. I said, I'm just saying, make sure when you're advising, whoever, any Muslim that you're advising, whether it be a non-Muslim or, whether, sorry, it be a leader or a, uh, or a, army, like a or general a, person. You thing. have to have knowledge of that thing that you're going to advise them on. That's just my point. Just that particular yeah. issue that you're yeah, going to yeah. talk about, have knowledge of it. Don't be a person who has no knowledge. You're just talking. Because an opportunity like that where you get the leader, where you're, you can personally advise him, it's not, it doesn't happen every day. And at that moment, you really want to speak from the Mishkatul Kitabi wa Sunnah. You want to get it from the Quran and the Sunnah. You just want to take the gold and the gems from the Quran and Sunnah to advise them. That's what you want to do. And guess what that goes back to? It goes back to teaching the religion, teaching the people the religion very at correct, the bottom. Very correct. Okay. The next question is, in the country I live, the most popular political parties are the far right. They explicitly state that they want to ban all religious signs, for example, the hijab, from all workplaces. They have already banned the niqab from all public spaces a few years ago. They also want to change the curriculum for the religious schools, stop financial aid for religious institutes from foreign countries, stop ritual slaughtering of animals without drug use, and much, much more. But you are telling me not to engage in politics at all and just basically ignore it. Allah mentions in the Quran subhanahu wa ta'ala he says ya ayyuhalladhina amanu la tattakhidhu bitanatan min dunikum la ya'lunukum khabala wadu ma anittum qad badat al baghda'u min afwa'ikum wa ma tukhfi sudur akbar and Allah is telling us the enemies of Islam what they have in their hearts is so treacherous what they are now saying on their tongues is just a little bit compared to what they're really holding in their hearts the animosity and the hate that they have for you in their hearts is more than what they even are saying to us mm. Allah tabarak wa ta'ala he tells us the solution for it how can we, uh, people hate us that much who are saying to us, now they're clearly saying it to us. They're treating us in the way that they're treating us. Allah says, Bala in tasbiru, la Allah wa ta'ala gives us two qualities that we need to come with. He says, if you come with patience and piety, their plotting and their plannings and the evil doings that they come with, it won't harm you. And I mentioned Hadith, hadith Abu uh, Dawood in his Sunan where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said إِذَا تَبَيَعْتُ بِالْعِنَى وَأَخَدْتُمْ أَذْنَابَ الْبَقَرِ وَرَضِيتُمْ بِالزَّرْعِ وَتَرَكْتُمُ الْجِهَادَ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْكُمْ ذُلَّ لَا يَنْزِعُ حَتَّى تَرْجِعُ إِلَى دِينُكُمْ We have to go back to our religion. 
If we want Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala to uplift from us humiliation and hardship, we have to. The hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Bukhari Muslim, both narrated in the hadith, Abi Hurairah, Abdul Rahman ibn Sakhrin, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Man hai tukum anu fachtanibu, wa ma'amar tukum bi fa'atu minu mustata'atum, fa'ina ma'ahlaka al-lidhina min qablikum, kathratu masa'ilihum wa akhtilafum ala anbiya'ihim. The previous nations were destroyed, why? The hadith mentions to us, فَإِنَّ مَا أَهْلَكَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ Those who came before you were destroyed. Why? كَثْرَةُ مَسَائِلِهِمْ They asked too, too many questions. Mm. And that, them asking too many questions was their way of wanting to go against the religion. Right. وَاخْتِلَافُهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَنْبِيَاهِمْ You know how people ask you questions, is it halal? What's your evidence? Provide evidence. Yeah. Their reason for that is not to really go with the Quran or the Sunnah. Mm. They just want to find an inconsistency in your argument. You might not be the strongest person to, to, to relay this point, But they know what you're saying is right. You see? Yeah. But they're just trying to look for, what's the evidence? Exactly, you can't prove it, so leave me alone. Like for yeah. example, I remember a brother advised another, but he said, he said, what's the evidence? Of course his brother doesn't know the Quran, but he knows Khamar is haram. Yeah. And so does the other brother as well. Exactly, and he knows that Khamar is haram. Yeah. So he goes to him, exactly. Yeah. So don't talk mm. to me. This is kathratu masa'ilim, asking too many questions in order to get out of it. Some okay. scholars have said it has another meaning. وَاخْتِلَافُمْ عَلَىٰ أَنْبِيَاهِمْ And opposing their prophets. So Allah destroys a nation because of them opposing their prophets. Mm. And going against what the prophet uh, came with. And I, was, I mentioned before the ayah, يعني, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ اتَّخَذُوا الْعِجْلَ سَيَنَالُهُمْ غَضَبُ مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ وَذِلَّهِ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَكَذَلِكَ نَجِزِ الْمُفْتَرِينَ And the قَوْلُ بِنُ كَثِيرٍ رَحِمَ اللَّهُ What he said about it. That he said this refers to نَائِلَةٌ It refers to كُلُّ مَنْ افْتَرَى بِدْعَةً Anyone who initiates an innovation. فَإِنَّ الذُّلَّ الْبِدْعَةِ وَمُخَالَفَةِ الرِّسَالَةِ مُتَّصِلَةٌ مِنْ قَلْبِهِ إِلَى كَتِفَيْهِ وقال سفيان بن عيينة كل صاحب بدعة ذليل Every individual who innovates in the religion is humiliated. Mm. So Allah is going to humiliate them subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah. And there are two verses in the Quran that really drives this particular point for us to really understand. One is mentioned in Surah Al-Saba, where Allah says, لَقَدْ كَانَ لِسَبَئِنْ فِي مَسْكَنِهِمْ آيَةً جَنَّةَ رِعَ يَمِينِ وَشِمَالٍ كُلُوا مِنْ رِزْقِ رَبِّكُمْ مَشْكُرُوا لَهُ بَلْدَةٌ طَيِّبَةٌ وَرَبٌّ غَفُورٌ فَعَرَضُوا فَأَرْسَلْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ سَيْلَ الْعَرِمِ وَبَدَّلْنَاهُمْ بِجَنَّتَيْهِمْ جَنَّتَيْنِ ذَوَاتَيْ أُكُلٍ خَمْطٍ وَأَثْنٍ وَشَيْءٍ مِنْ سِدْرٍ قَلِيلٍ ذَلِكَ جَزَيْنَاهُمْ بِمَا كَفَرُوا وَهَلْ نُجَازِي إِلَّا الْكَفُورَ إِنَّ اللَّهَ سَيَجْعَلْنَا بَيْنَهُمْ وَبَيْنَ الْقُرَى الَّتِي بَارَكْنَا فِيهَا قُرًى ظَاهِرَةً وَقَدَّرْنَا فِيهَا السَّيْرَ سِيرُوا فِيهَا لَيَالِيَ وَأَيَّامًا آمِنِينَ فَقَالُوا رَبَّنَا بَعِدْ يُو كَانْ سَيْفِ وَأَنَّ سَنَادَ الْقِرَاءَةَ And there's another qira'ah where you can say فَقَالُوا رَبَّنَا بَاعِدْ بَيْنَ أَسْفَارِنَا وَظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ فَجَعَلْنَاهُمْ أَحَدِيثَ وَمَزَّقْنَاهُمْ كُلَّ مُمَزَّقْ إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ الْآيَاتِ إِلُّ كُلِّ صَبَّارٍ شَكُورٍ Allah mentions the story of the people of Sabah. Allah says they had a garden on their right and a garden on their left. Allah tabarak wa ta'ala, he said to them وَرَبٌ غَفُورٌ You have a law that's forgiving. You eat, enjoy yourselves. Allah says فَأَعْرَضُوا They turned away. فَأَرْسَلْنَا Worms to destroy their gardens and everything, and Allah destroyed everything they had. Mm. Allah, even Allah mentioned Subhanahu wa Taala, they used to travel from one village to another village. They could see the other village; they were so close to everything. Just a ni'mah. They didn't have the struggle of traveling. Allah made that. But then, what did they do? They turned away. فَأَعْرَضُوا فَأَرْسَلْنَا عَلِيَّ فَأَعْرَضُوا They turned away from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. They turned away from the religion of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and that's when Allah Tabarak wa Taala sent upon them what their destruction. And Allah mentions, وَهَلْ نُجَازِي إِلَّا الْكَفُورِ Is there any other way that we should deal with those who are transgressive? Mm. Those who don't show Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala gratitude and they're not thankful. And Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala mentions in the ayah, He says, فَقَالُوا رَبَّنَا بَاعِدَ بَيْنَ أَسْفَارِنَا وَظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ فَجَعَلْنَاهُمْ أَحَادِيثًا We made them a parable. Something people can take a lesson from. وَمَزَّقَنَاهُمْ Allah said, we ripped them apart. Mm. كُلَّ مُمَزَّقٍ إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَا آيَةٍ This is a lesson. فَهُوَ لَكِنْ لِكُلِّ صَبَّارٍ شَكُورٍ Everybody who has these two qualities, patience and gratitude. They didn't have that. They were not patient upon the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No, they were not. They didn't show gratitude to Allah tabarak wa ta'ala in the blessings that He gave them. The second story is, سَنَسْلِمُهُ عَلَى الْخُرْطُومِ إِنَّا بَلَوْنَاهُمْ كَمَا بَلَوْنَا أَصْحَابَ الْجَنَّةِ إِذْ أَقْسَمُوا لَيَسْرِمُنَّهَا مُسْبِحِينَ وَلَا وَلَا يَسْتَثْنُونَ فَطَافَ عَلَيْهَا طَائِفٌ مِنْ رَبِّكَ وَهُمْ نَائِمُونَ فَأَصْبَحَتْ كَالصَّرِيمِ فَتَنَادَوْا مُصْبِحِينَ أَنِ اغْدُوا عَلَى حَرْثِكُمْ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَارِمِينَ فَانْطَلَقُوا وَهُمْ يَتَخَافَتُونَ أَلَّا يَدْخُلَنَّهَا الْيَوْمَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِسْكِينٌ وَغَدَوْا عَلَى حَرْدٍ قَادِرِينَ فَلَمَّا رَأَوْهَا قَالُوا إِنَّا لَضَالُّونَ بَلْ نَحْنُ مَحْرُومُونَ يعني الله speaks about a story of a father who had a garden. And this father, they said that he used to make sure that this garden that he had, he used to give the poor and the needy. He would take care of them. He used to follow the ayah, وَآتُوا حَقَّهُ يَوْمَ حَصَادِهِ 
Give from your gardens the rights that is upon it. Mm. So he used to give from his garden. He used to take care of the need. Rather, what he used to do is that he used to open his garden for the people in need. And he would say to them, come, choose what you want from it. Whatever vegetations or fruits that you like, come, it's all yours. And so they would come and they would take what they want and they would leave. That's the type of father he was. And that's the type of person he was. But when he passed away, his children took over the garden. And when they took over and they became in charge of it, they said, Allah Today, our father was a generous man. He was too much. He was OTT over the top. We're not going to be like our father. We're going to make sure that we bring rules and regulations. We need to be reasonable. We need to think about the family, properties, blah, blah, blah. They read those. So what did they do? Uh, they made sure. So at night time, they made that decision and they woke up in the morning. When they woke up in the morning, they found that They woke up in the morning Everything Allah just showed it, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when they woke up in the morning They were like We are the ones who are misguided Not the masakeen And then The middle one said to them Did I not tell you guys to exalt Allah They turned at one another Blaming one another It was your fault You did this Allah they says The punishment of Allah is like that But the punishment of the hereafter is worse Allah is going to make us lead as Muslims Allah is going to put us in charge of this world Allah is going to put us in charge of this world the other day I was really thinking about this issue very deeply and I was like, subhanAllah. You know, when you look at the world today where Muslims are and where the West is, mm. let's be honest, the West have reached a high level. I'm not praising them to, to glorify them. I'm just trying to say this is the reality. I mean, I'm not saying that this believer is a Sayyid, a master. But I just ask myself, mm. how are we ever, ever, ever going to reach that level? And you know what hit my heart? As I was thinking, Wallahi, to Allah wa ta'ala is nothing that Allah makes America a force for Muslims that they turn to Islam. Yeah, it's true. It's easy for him. Allah can make them Muslims and they become a gov Islamic government. Yeah. We don't even need to fight them. They come into Islam mm. and they become Muslims. Allah turns them to Islam. So we don't know how Allah is going to do things. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's happened in the past. Yeah, of course. Like countries like Indonesia and other mm. countries like that. Muslims just opened it. Muslims opened it without any weapons, without nothing. So in Allah wa ta'ala, Allah has treasures and what he's got in store is nothing weakened. No one knows Allah's armies and the way that things are going to be. We don't know. Our knowledge is very little. Allah knows everything. We just have to come with our part, yeah. which is patience and certainty and gratitude and taqwa and tawheed and sunnah and ta'a. When we come in those things, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will not forsake us. Allah Taala will not forsake us. وما كان Allah Taala isn't. وما ربك بظلام للعبيد. Allah does not oppress his slaves. No. Yeah, and and you know, just to add on to that, just a question at the end that said you are telling me to ign basically ignore it. Of course, it's not what you're saying. You're saying do it the prophetic method though, mm -hmm. and do it from the ground up and teach the people their religion. Um, and we covered that topic extensively in, in the in the main episode. And also, people of knowledge should take this responsibility. Mm. Like we don't mm. We don't want that We want people of knowledge People who are grounded People who look at awaqib al-umur People who have the ability People who are not Who have aged Who are senior who are grounded in knowledge. That's what Allah says in the ayah. وَإِذَا جَاءَهُمْ أَمْرٌ مِنَ الْأَمْنِ أَوِ الْخَوْفِ أَذَاعُوا بِهِ وَلَوْ رَدُّوهُ إِلَى الرَّسُولِ وَإِلَىٰ أُولِي الْأَمْرِ مِنْهُمْ لَعَلِمَهُ الَّذِينَ اسْتَنْبِطُونَهُ مِنْهُمْ وَلَوْ لَا فَضْلُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ وَرَحْمَتُهُ لَتَّبَعْتُمُ الشَّيْطَانِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا Allah mentions subhanahu wa ta'ala that if they were to take these matters back to who? They were to take it back to Allah first of all. Mm -hmm. And if they were to take it back to the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And if they were to take it back to the people of knowledge. Ulil Amr here means Al Imam Al Qurtubi Abu Abdullah Al Qurtubi the Mufassir. He says Ulul Amri. He means Hum Ahlul Ilmi Wal Fiqh, and he transmitted that from Hassan Al Basri and Qatada to the Amat Al Sadusi, the people of knowledge. Well, it doesn't matter what country that person is from, it doesn't matter what ethnicity and background you are, it doesn't matter. People of knowledge take this responsibility. You being politically engaged and running around and you have no knowledge, you're going to be part of the problem. Yeah, we've seen that. We've yeah, seen we so have, many. We have, we've yeah. seen so many people who think, okay, you know what. Wallahi, let's be very frank. Who's the mayor of London? Yeah, Is he a Muslim, a Muslim guy, right? He's a Muslim guy. He claims yeah. to be a Muslim. 
Okay? This individual, the crime rate in the UK has gone up into the sky. We know that. That's a worker. We, we've seen it. The time he came into power, of, you know, the mayor of London, the crime has been unparalleled to compared to the past. What's he doing in the COVID-19 COVID situation? Wallahi, you'd hope a non-Muslim stays, stays in that position because of what's happening to our youngsters mm -hmm. and our youths. You understand yeah, my point? Yeah. So I'm saying the point I'm trying to say is that we need ulama, ahlul ilm, rabbaniyun, truthful people, sadiqeen, who are sincere, who have no hidden agenda. Umar radiallahu anhu, he, uh, Nafi ibn Abdul Harith, he said, laqiya Umar bi Usfan. He met Nafi ibn Abdul Harith, he met Umar radiallahu anhu in Usfan. And then Umar radiallahu anhu placed him as a governor over the people of Mecca. And then he said to him, and Usfan, when you're coming to Medi from Medina, you can, you'll see it, the pebbles will show you, Usfan is here. Okay. It's close to Mecca. So Umar radiallahu anhu, uh, said to him ala ahli wadi? Who, who, who have you left with the people of the village And then he said فقال ابن أبزة ابن أبزة is, Umar radiallahu anhu said ومن ابن أبزة Who's this ابن أبزة mm. He said مولى من موالينا He's a slave or person who went through slavage slave of, From our slaves He said فاستخلفت عليه مولى You placed upon the people of the village That Mecca <laughs> You placed over them a, a slave And he and he doesn't know, in other words, Umar radiallahu anhu is trying to say, he's not a slave anymore, he's not, but he went through slavery, slavery. In other words, he is not educated, generally speaking, he hasn't got knowledge, that's what Umar was speaking okay. from his perspective. And then he said to him, Nafi ibn Abdul Harith understood why Umar asked the question, he said, Inna qari li kitabillah. This man I placed in charge has memorized the Quran. Wa inna alimu bil faraidhi, and he's a scholar of the inheritance. Umar radiallahu anhu, he said, <laughs> I heard your prophet say, Nabi Muhammad, in Allah, Yarfa Ubi Hadal Kitabi Akwama, Wayada Ubi Akharin. And Imam Muslim narrated in Hadith Umar al Khattab. Allah raises a people based on the Quran. In Allah, Yarfa Ubi Hadal Qurani Akwama. Allah, because of this Quran, Allah raises a people. So this man, he placed a person in charge. He didn't place any person, he placed a person of knowledge mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so to true. be in charge of the Muslim situation and run it. So what he's saying, let this matter be for the scholars and let them talk amongst themselves and they will tell us where to go, what to do and what not to do. They will guide us for the masalih of the dunya and the hereafter. Mm -hmm. no. uh, so that kind of brought us to the end of this, uh, the first mini series we did on this hot seat season where we're talking about the uh, Western, you know, people living in the West, Muslims living in the West. We then went on to a different topic, which is now talking about issues within Islam. And specifically, we spoke about the issue of the madhahib. Um, uh, so let's give the viewers a quick reminder uh, by playing this short clip of what we discussed on that podcast. We now want to talk about something a little bit closer to home, an issue within Islam that is affecting the Muslims. And that is the issue of the madhahib. A lot of people believe it is necessity to follow a madhab because they have no other choice because they can't go to the Quran and the Sunnah directly. The okay. people are three types. There's an ammi, the general mass, who doesn't know anything of the religion. Then the second camp of people we have, a group we call the muttabi'ah. A muttabi'ah is a person who's a student of knowledge. And then we have the scholar. Ta'asub means fanaticism. I'm not fanatic to Shafi'i. I believe he can get it right or wrong. Isn't this the whole, one of the big problems with this issue? That you're obviously, like you said, it played a role, right? And we can see that the work of the reality just shows us that, that a lot of people from Somalia pick Imam Shafi. A lot of people from Pakistan, India pick Abu Hanifa. Yeah. This is an issue of deen. Yeah. Where we're from should not come into it. It shouldn't play a role. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam died, he died in the city of Medina. And when the Prophet died in Medina, Alayhi Salatu Wasallam, a madhab came out from that city. It's called Madhab Ahl al-Hijaz, specifically Madhab Ahl al-Medina. Yeah. And the forefront for that was the Imam Malik. Yeah. There came another madhab, which is Madhab Ahl al Iraq, if you're more specific, يعني, Madhab Ahl al Kufa, the madhab of the people of Kufa, run by Imam Abu Hanifa. Shafi'i and Ahmed have taken from both. You're saying Tamadhub and Taqlid are one and the other. This is one of the mistakes that many people fall into. They believe Tamadhub means automatically Taqlid. Pay attention to that. Mm -hmm. Tamadhub means I'm following a madrasa. This madrasa has been going on for 1,300 something years. Mm -hmm. Taqlid means one individual, I'm holding on to him. The Muqallid. I believe most people will fall into this category. This person, you said there's no issue with him just asking his imam. He has to go to somebody of religion and someone who has pi uh, piety and someone who's got knowledge. Knowledge. And, that, and part of that knowledge is not to just be a blind follower himself. This concept of 
the four madhabs. I don't believe that the haqq is only restricted to the four madhabs, Aslan. You have no other option. Allah got rid of the other madhabs. Sufyan Athori's madhabs gone. Allah actually refined it so we only have these four left. You Isn't that Allah showing you that the truth is within these four? No. You're not allowed to use universal evidences to affirm a shar'i evidence. How can four great imams, greater than you, greater than the modern day scholars like Sheikh Al-Bani, Sheikh Salaf Fuzan, how can four imams agree on an error? This is, this is exactly the reason why Ibn Taymiyyah was actually imprisoned and the whole issue with Ibn Taymiyyah took place. You're following a madhab, or I say I'm following a madhab, for example, and I have a sahih hadith in Bukhari, for example, and I agree this hadith is authentic. Hmm. Am I now going to leave the madhab and follow the hadith? A uh, ammi cannot go to the hadith himself and extract rulings yeah. from it. So again, his job is to go to the alim, a scholar, and okay. take what the scholar says. Okay. The mutabi'ah, he has to get the ayah and the hadith and support it with the understanding of a great imam. The way that you say this hadith is sahih, therefore it goes against this madhab and I'm going to take the authentic hadith. Who created authentic? Bukhari, Sheikh al-Bani. These are men who are fallible and infallible. Mm, yeah. You're always following men, either way. But we're not following the men. We're, look, we're following a science that is placed. Do you, do you see it's a framework that's written? My, it just comes back to my scholar said this, your scholar said that. Like, no, it's not. I'm it's, saying to you, the default position that many people are getting wrong is that they're looking at the scholar as though he's infallible from the big get-go. It's the in implication. I almost now want to change hats. And I want to go to the other party that will attack you from the other side. This party believe that there should be no madahib whatsoever. Get rid of them all. Some people equate to tamadhub taqlid. Yeah. Tamadhub doesn't necessarily mean it's taqlid. Tamadhub can be a stepping stone and it has been a stepping stone for each tihad for great scholars of al-islam learning a madhab is as hell is easier simpler and more beneficial you'll see the fruits that you reap first of all teach your students before you go through the madhab books that the madhab is a means it's not the ultimate goal so as you can see we spoke a little bit about the different madhab the history behind the development of the madhab uh, you divided the people into three different groups the muqallid the mutabi' and the mujtahid so the, the 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 person who doesn't have any knowledge or the layman mm -hmm. the kind of student of knowledge and then the scholar who is able to go into the quran and the sunnah directly and you explained how each group or each person that falls in, in one of those groups should deal with the madhabs and they all have different approaches uh, with the madhahib um any thoughts? I know it was a while ago, like I said before, but any thoughts that you have from that podcast that you can remember? What I generally say to people is that when it comes to the madahibs and speaking about the madahibs and the discussion revolving around the madahibs, don't fall into the extreme exaggeration or the extreme negligence. Mm. Always be careful. Yani, shaitan will all either make you fall into extreme where you start thinking, I'm a mujtahid. I can go to the Quran and the Sunnah myself. You know what? I will extract rulings from the Quran and the Sunnah. By the way, you don't have to be a mujtahid to go to the Quran and so you can read it yourself as a Muslim. But I'm saying the entire Quran, I can extract rulings independently without the understanding of any scholar before me is a path of destruction. Yeah. And yeah. It's, it's, it's an extreme path. What is also another extreme path is the fanaticism that we see to asub for people and individuals that we we find people falling into. So don't be a person who goes extreme exaggeration or extreme negligence mm. in every matter of the religion. Try to look for that middle path, which is always the hardest path. Allah made us that middle path, subhanahu wa ta'ala. The religion is not extreme in any way, shape, or form. The Prophet said, Stay away from being extreme. Allah says, Don't go overboard in your religion, or don't go negligent on your religion. And yeah. Alama Muhammad Amin Shakhiti on the ayah, he says the ghulu here means ifrat or tafrit, extreme exaggeration, extreme negligence. The liberals, we say yeah, they're extreme. You see, yeah. the khawarij, we say they're extreme. Mm. For us as Muslims, both of them are extreme. The liberals are extremists. We should call them extremists. Yeah. The khawarij and those who bomb innocent people and kill innocent people and la yarqubuna fi mu'minin illa wa la dhimma. Those are also extremists to us. Yeah, many people really just only associate extremism or being extreme with, for example, the Khawarij or the exactly, people. Exactly, exactly. And they don't realize that actually there's there's a middle path it's and true. there's two extremes on either end. And I think that kind of balanced approach that came through in the podcast might have surprised some people because often people think that the, the quote-unquote Salafi mm -hmm. approach to the madhabs 
is let's get rid of them. There's too much ta'asub. Like, let's just get rid of them totally. We don't need them. Let's go straight to the Quran and the Sunnah. Aina. But you actually present a very, very balanced approach. And Aina. I thought that Aina. came across very well. I remember one time, subhanAllah, there was a brother that was with me and there was, we, we, we were with a sheikh. It's one of the things that touched me, really. And it humbled me as a person as well. We were with a sheikh and a brother must have said, Sheikh, why do you propagate Shafi'i Madhab, Sheikh? Taqillah, Sheikh Al-Kitab, Al-Sunnah. And he started reciting the ayah. فَلَا وَرَبِكَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ حَتَّى يُحَكِّمُ كَفِي مَا شَجَرَ بَيْنَهُمْ يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمُنُوا أَطِعُوا اللَّهُ وَأَطِعُوا الرَّسُولَ أُولِي الْأَمْرِ مِنْكُمْ فَإِنْ تَنَازَعْتُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ فَرُدُّوهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ كُتُبُونَ on the shelf, he picked up Kitab al-Risala, Imam al-Shafi'i, Riwayat al-Rabi'i ibn Sulaiman al-Muradi. He gave it to him. And he said, read it. Okay. He couldn't read it. You know, Fatah Kasra. <laughs> Struggling. <laughs> he can't even read. <laughs> Just <laughs> read it. He can't even read. <laughs> yeah. يعني ما يستطيع. He couldn't read a sentence without doing a grammatical mistake. Right. يعني I was, يعني, and then you speak, you say, I can come and speak, you know, uh, I can go straight to the Quran, to the Sunnah, and you know, you can't even read. Myself. And you can't even, what are you going to read? Yeah. The kalam of Imam Shafi'i that you're against. Here is his Kitab al Risala that he wrote, and he's considered to be the first Kitab in Usul al Fiqh. Muhammad ibn Shafi'i al Muttalibi, wa gayruhu kana lahu sariqa, mithlul ladhi lil urbi min khaliqa. Shafi'i was the first person who wrote in Usul al Fiqh with the command of Abd Rahman ibn Mahdi. Abd Rahman al Mahdi said to him, uh, to Imam Shafi'i, write a science. For the people they need it, you know, you need to, to know how to take the delil and the madlul, hmm. the Quran and the Sunnah, how to understand it. So he wrote the Kitab Ar Risala. The first Ar Risala is lost; we don't have it. It's mafqood, and the new version of the Risala that Shafi'i wrote, the second one, uh, is the one we have, which is why I mentioned the riwayah of Rabi' al-Sulaiman al-Suleiman okay. al-Muradi narrated from him. Rabi' al-Sulaiman al-Muradi is from the students of Shafi'i in in uh, in Egypt. Uh, Yaqub al Bwaiti and Ismail Mihail Muzani and Rabi' al Sulaiman al Muradi, and they're his, his, his students over there. So he couldn't read it. So, uh, and an Imam Shafi'i, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, Abdul Malik ibn Quraib, he mentioned Al Asma'i, he said, I sat down with Shafi'i, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, and Shafi'i is a hujjah in the Arabic language. I sat with Shafi'i and I said to him, the, the, the language of the people of Hudayl, I want to check my, you know, the poetry onto you and I want to write some things from you. Abdul Malik ibn Quraib is mean, A'immatul Lugha. But he corrected his versions of the poetry and he verified the versions that he has and if it's right from Al Imam Shafi'i, Rahimahullah. So, what I mean is Abu Hanifa, the same can be said about him, a great Imam in fiqh. The same can be said about Imam Malik, rahimah, Imam Bidari al-Hijra, rahimahullah, rahmatan wa asiyah, who wrote the Kitab al-Muatta. And the same with Imam Ahmad ibn Muhammad, uh, ibn Hanbal, rahimahullah ta'ala, Imam fi al-Fiqh wa al-Hadith, Imam fi al-Sunnah, Ahmad ibn Hanbal. Mm. Yani for you to think to yourself, I can directly go to the Quran and Sunnah, ignore these people, whom rijalun wa nahnu rijal, they are men, and I'm a man. We say the first part we accept. But the second, let's, yes. let's, let's, let's discuss it. Barakallahu <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, I know like you mentioned at the start, there's general books that you read for all the episodes. For this particular issue of the Madahib, is there any particular books that you read? Again, I always go back to the Quran, but generally because it's Masail, tata, masail related to يعني, Al-Ijtihad and Taqlid, it's بس, Masail tata, يعني, Masala in Usul Al-Fiqh. Mm. يعني, usul Al-Fiqh is divided into four. There's a Muqaddimah where the scholars speak about uh, the ta'arif of fiqh, what does it, usul al-fiqh mean? Yani, uh, usul and fiqh, bi'atibari mufradayhi, you know, usul and fiqh, they define it, what does usul mean, what does fiqh mean, you know. And then they go to the second part of usul al-fiqh, which is they speak about ahkam, ahkam al-shar'iyyat al-wad'iyya, ahkam al-shar'iyyat al-taklifiyya, scholars, they talk about that. And they divide ahkam, you know, taklifiyya into five, wajib, mustahab, mm-hmm. mandub, makruh, mubah, you know, those five. Yeah. And al-wad'iyya, they speak about five as well, which is a shart was sabab, uh, and a mani' and a fasid. And, you know, they speak about those issues. And then, dalalatul al-fad, which is aam, mutlaq, muqayyad, mujmal, mubayyan, all of that. The last part, they talk about ta'arud wa tarjih. How do you reconcile between evidences? And mm-hmm. in there, they speak about the mujtahid because he's the one who brings the evidences yeah. together yeah. how do you reconcile between the evidences the mujtahid that's his job the muqallid his job is so in there they, there's a mabhat where they talk about the mujtahid who is a mujtahid shurut al mujtahid how long does the what can break the ijtihad 
uh, what about if new information comes and you've done ijtihad before? Yeah, issues related okay. to ijtihad. So generally, I Kaukab al-Munir, I Shalhu Kaukab al-Munir, I read it to Kaukab uh, al-Kaukab al-Sata, which is the Nadam of Jam'ul Jawami' by Suki. I, I don't look at the Kaukab al-Sata per se because it's the Nadam of Suyuti. Like in Jam'ul Jawami' and the Shuruhat and the Hawashi that are placed on it, I look at it. Sahibu uh, Maraqi's Kitab, Abdullah ibn Hajj al-Shanqiyati, I mentioned in Nashr al-Bunud, I look at that a lot. Irshad al-Fuhul by Shawkani, I looked at it a lot on this issue. Uh, I read all of those books, those particular areas. I focus on them. And then uh, also Ilam by Ibn al-Qayyim, I can't be without it. The Ilam of Ibn al-Qayyim is very mufid, jiddan, jiddan, mm-hmm. when it comes to these issues. Rahimahullah, rahmatan wa sa'a. So I read all of those, and that's how I came to the podcast. Okay, uh, let's go into the questions that people had for you then or they, they, they left on the YouTube uh, video. Uh, the first one is, how can you say the truth is not restricted to the four imams when the usul of the other madhahib have not been preserved? What I want to say first of all is this view is one of the views out there that the late mutaakhirin al-usuliyin a push as Al-Alama Muhammad al-Amini Shankiyatiyu mentions. That this is the view of the late mutaakhirin of the usuliyin which is that the haq is restricted with these four. Okay. And Imam Sahib al-Maraqi, he says, وَالْمُجْمَعُ الْيَوْمَ عَلَيْهِ أَرَبَعَةً وَقَفُوا غَيْرِهَا الْجَمِيعُ مَنَعَةً That the Ummah have all agreed upon these four, and anything other than those four are not allowed. That's a very bad view. That's not correct for Sahib al-Maraqi to say something like that. And the other poet, he said, وَجَائِزٌ تَقْلِيدُ غَيْرِ الْأَرَبَعَةً لِذِي ضَرُورَةٍ وَفِي هَذَا سَعَةً It is permissible for you to blind follow anybody other than these four under the condition it is out of necessity. كيف? ولذلك العلامة محمد محمد علي آدم الإثيوبي إن مقدمة إس كتاب شرح أو صحيح مسلم يقول قرة عين المحتاج شرح مقدمة صحيح مسلم من الحجاج he mentions there شرح محمد الآدم الإثيوبي he said when he brings those two lines يا والمجمع اليوم عليه أربعة وقف غيرها الجميع منع he says بئس ما قال evil what he said صحيح مراقي and when he brings the other line وجائز تقليد غير الأربعة لذي ضرورة وفي هذا سعى he says بئس ما قال evil is what he said which is the truth and this view مرا صاحب المراقي transmitted إجماع in it أبو عمرو بن الصلاح the same أبو الفرج بن رجب write wrote a book called الرجع على من اتبع غير المذاهب الأربعة أن النفراوي in شرح الرسالة said the same this is a view we don't accept because one of the uh, like the last episode when we were speaking about tashabbu bil kufar we mentioned yeah. you're not allowed to use a universal sign to affirm a legislated legislated matter that's Correct. what the person said because this is one this is the one that's preserved so that means that the truth is in this one no we don't do that we don't take something that's happening universally and happening in the world and we say you know because this is happening it means allah is pleased with it and allah chose mm. this we can't say that because what happens universally is not always what happens universally is not always something Allah is pleased with. It is something Allah willed, but it's not necessarily something Allah is pleased with. Subhanahu okay. wa ta'ala. For example, the disbelievers use this argument. Allah mentions the Quran, say, They said that, if Allah, the, the disbelievers, Allah says, أشركوا, The disbelievers are going to say, لو شاء الله, If Allah willed, we would not have associated partners with Allah. Mm. Fathers wouldn't have done it as well. Ha. We know in the Quran Allah wa ta'ala mentions to us and also told us that Inna Allah, la yarda li kufr. Allah is not pleased for his slaves to associate partners with him. Also they say, Law sha Allah ma'abadna min duni shay. And if Allah wa ta'ala willed, we would not have we, have, we would not have worshipped anyone besides him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. We say that is true. And Allah did will for this to happen. Universally, he did will it to happen. It's kalimatu haq, that's haq. What is intended from it is evil Because Allah does mention that Everything that's happening is that which he intended mm. For the disbelievers to be misguided Is something Allah willed Not not, not what something he's pleased with Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says وَلَوْ شِئْنَا لَآتَيْنَا كُلَّ نَفْسٍ هُدَاهَا If we willed we would have given everybody guidance Also Allah wa ta'ala he says وَلَوْ شَاءَ اللَّهُ مَا أَشْرَكُوا If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willed They would not have associated partners with Allah mm. But they conflated two things Which is what? Because it's university happening It means Allah is pleased with it Subhanahu wa ta'ala We say that No that's not the case Yeah I think the person is coming from Maybe the perspective that Not the fact that The oh, the usul of these four Madahib are preserved Therefore Allah must be pleased with them I think they might be co- Coming from the perspective of uh, If if the other The usul of the other madahib have gone Then how can we follow anything else Like what else do we have The other madahib are mentioned as well mm. They're mentioned in the books They're just not served And created And worked on Like these four have been worked on 
Okay? Yeah. Like in, if you read Kutub al, uh, Kutub al Khilafiyat, and it's, of course it's not the same way that it's going to be transmitted because these Kut madhabs have been worked on, served, and taken care of. Like in Sufyan al views are mentioned, Abu Thawr's views are mentioned, Ya'ani Awza'i's views are mentioned. And you, yeah, of course it's mentioned. Okay. Plus, how can you say that the truth is with these four only and everyone outside that the truth is not restricted to them when they themselves would come back from views? Mm. And Imam Shafi'i, for example, when he was in Iraq, he had a view and a madhab. When he went to Egypt, for example, his view changed and his madhab changed. And he changed his views because of what came to him. Plus, they themselves spoke against Blind following each and every one of them Without the, for knowing their evidences For example, Ibn Al-Qayyim He mentions in his Ilam al muqirin He mentions He says The four Imams prohibited And taqlidim to be blind followed And they rebuked And scolded anyone who took their opinions without proof Ibn Hazmin he said in his Kitab Al-Ihkam Fi Usul Al-Ihkam He says وَقَدْ ذَكَرْنَا أَنَّ مَالِكًا وَأَبَا حَنِيفَةَ وَالشَّافِعِيَ لَمْ يُقَلِّدُوا وَلَا أَجَازُوا لِأَحَدٍ أَنْ يُقَلِّدَهُمْ وَلَا أَنْ يُقَلِّدَ غَيْرَهُمْ Then Ahmed never allowed anyone to blind follow him Okay He also mentions another view Rahimahullah in his Kitab Also Ibn Abdelbar in his Kitab Al-Intiqa' If you go to it There's a lot of aqwal he mentions In his Jamah Bayan Al- that he said, أجمع المسلمون على أن من استبانت له سنة عن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم لم يكن له أيدع عليه قول أحد من الناس that the Muslims are unanimously in agreement whoever the sunnah becomes clear to them it is not permissible for them to leave it for the statement of any mm. individual okay okay um, next question I have on this particular podcast is if everyone is following the sunnah then why is there a difference in the way to pray salah how do these differences arise between the four madahib if they are all following the sunnah repeat again one more time if everybody is following the sunnah, then why is there a difference in the way to pray salah? How do these differences arise between the four madahib if they're all following the sunnah? I would encourage this person to read the kitab Raf'u al-Malam an Aymat al-Alam by Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala L- removing the blame from the worthy scholars. This book Ibn al-Qayyim rah- Ibn Taymiyyah sorry Ibn Taymiyyah Taqiyuddin Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala in this book Ibn Taymiyyah speaks about this particular question you asked. Okay. Why are the scholar- scholars but I'll just mention four, for example, reasons why it would happen. The first reason is Adam al Dalil wa Thubuti wa Fahmihi. The evidence hasn't actually reached this person. Okay? And they, underst- they haven't understood it in that way. For example, uh, Ibn Dhu'aybin, he said, uh, so the, b- this person hasn't got the evidence with them. Ibn Dhu'aybin, he mentions, Ja'atil Jaddatu ila Abi Bakrin as Siddiq. A grandmother came to Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. When she came to him, she was asking him about her mirat, tas'aluhu. Mirathaha, she was saying, I want my inheritance. فَقَالَ لَهَا أَبُو بَكْرٍ أَبُو بَكْرٍ responded and he said to her, مَا لَكَ فِي كِتَابِ اللَّهِ شَيْءٌ In the book of Allah you have nothing. In the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there is nothing for you. وَمَا عَلِيمْتُ لَكَ فِي سُنَّةٍ And in the sunnah of the Prophet I have known nothing for you. Okay? فَرْجِعِي Go back. Come to me tomorrow حَتَّى أَسْأَلَ النَّاسِ I'll ask around if somebody has evidence that I don't have. فَسَأَلَ النَّاسِ He went and he asked the people فَقَالِ الْمُغِيرَةُ بْنُ شُعْبَةُ مُغِيرَةُ بْنُ شُعْبَةُ stood up and he said حَضَرْتُ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ I was present when the Prophet صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ أَعْطَاهَا السُّدُسِ when he gave one sixth to the grandmother فَقَالَ أَبُو بَكْرٍ he said أَلْمَعَكَ غَيْرُكَ do you have anyone else that saw this and was there with you he said Muhammad ibn Muslimat al-Ansari sorry Muhammad ibn Muslimat al-Ansari was sitting there he stood up and he said I was there what did Abu Bakr then do? He gave it to him. This shows you, a Tirmidhi narrated this in his surah, Abu Dawood narrated Ibn Majah, all of them in tariqat Ibn Shihab al-Zuhri, from Uthman Ibn Ishaq Ibn Kharashata, and Ibn Dhu'ib. Ibn Dhu'ib is Qabisat Ibn Dhu'ib. Here you see that Al-Imam, Sahabi Al-Jaleel, Al-Alim, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, the most knowledgeable man in this ummah after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, didn't have the evidence in this issue. So of course, he's going to differ with them on this issue if he didn't get the evidence. The second reason why the scholars they they they, they, go, they differ amongst themselves is ta'arud al Sometimes the ev- evidence that reaches them to them it seems contradicting to them. The evidence in and within itself doesn't contradict one another because it comes from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Allah says in the Quran, "Afala yatadabaruna al Quran, wa lo kana min indi ghairi Allahi la wajadu fi ikhtilafan kathira." If this was to come from anyone other than Allah, you would find contradiction. Mm. But because both the Quran and the Sunnah are from Allah, mm. the Sunnah is from who? Is from the from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah mentions here subhanahu wa ta'ala, Najmi Ida Hawa, Ma Dalla Sahibukuma Gawa. 
Muhammad is not misguided. Everything he said is what? In huwa illa wahi yuha. It's a revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Quran and the Sunnah are both from who? They both come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there's no contradiction. They won't contradict one another. They actually complement one another. Right. So, but the alim, the scholar, when he looks at it, he sees to see they're not going together. The reason is because maybe one is general and one is specific. Mm. Maybe one is restricting and the other one is restricted. Maybe one is abrogating and the other one is an, is the abrogator. يعني الآم الخاص مطلق مقيد ناسخ منسوخ. One is حقيقة one is مجاز. All of these is why scholars would do it. I'll give you an example of give you a few examples for okay. the people to understand this one. We have two hadith of the Prophet sallallahu so. The hadith of the Prophet sallallahu where he said إذا كان الماء قلتين لم يحمل الخبث. If the water reaches قلتين, it can't take Khabat, it cannot be filthy. If the water reaches that amount, which is qullatain, if it reaches that amount, it cannot take impurities. Okay. Abu Dawood and Tirmidhi and Nasa'i and Ibn Majah narrated him in Hadith Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. And it's, inshallah ta'ala, the isnad is sahih. If you want to see the authenticity of it, go to the khulasatul ahkam by Imam Nawi and also the mujumu' of Imam Nawi rahimahullah. Both of them, he authenticated there. Ibn Hajar authenticates it in his kitab Talqis al-Habir. And also Sheikh Lalbani Rahimahullah authenticated in a kitab Irawa al Ghalil. You can find it there, inshallah ta'ala. That's one hadith. This hadith states that if the water reaches Qullatain, that water cannot be impure. Okay. The second hadith we have is that the Prophet said, Inna al-ma'a tahurun, the water is pure, la yunajisuhu shay'un. That the water is pure, there's nothing that can make it impure. Inna al-ma'a tahurun, la yunajisuhu shay'un. Abu Dawood al Nasai, sorry, Abu Dawood, Tirmidhi al Nasai. All narrated in Hadith Abi Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu ta'ala anhu And this hadith is sahih bi mujma'i turuqiha When you bring all the chains of narrations together Again, if you want to see the authenticity Go to the kitab Qulasatul Ahkam by Nawawi Al-Majmu' by Imam Nawawi Talqisul Habir by Ibn Hajar And also Irwai al-Ghalil by Shaykh al-Albani rahimahullah In those three references you can find it Here these two hadiths There is something they're not contradicting in And there are things, a particular thing that they're contradicting one okay. another in Both of the hadith Ida balag al-ma' Both the hadiths what they don't contradict each other is two things. There is two things that they don't, do not, they don't, they do not contradict one another. The first thing is if the water reaches qulatain or more, they don't differ. Both of them that the water yeah. Yeah. cannot take impurity. Yeah. So they agree on each with each other on that. Okay. The second thing that both hadiths complement one another is that if the water is below qulatain, that it can take impurity. If one of the four Description changes And the, well, the reason for this Is because of the Ijma' Imam Ibn al-Mundir Ibn al-Mulaqin mentioned Inna al-ma' ta'uru La yunajisu shayin Illa ma' ghalab Ala rihi Aw ta'mihi Aw lonihi The three things The taste The fragrance And the color If those three changes The fragrance hmm. The taste The fragrance Which is the scent uh, If the Color changes And if the Taste changes This water is impure There's a unanimous agreement Upon that If it's less than Qulatayn and three of those changes, they both agree that it's impure. The question here is, is which is the ta'arul's coming, is that if the water doesn't change, but impurity was thrown into it, mm. and it's below qulatain, this is where the ta'arul seems to come from. How do you reconcile between it? The reconciling here now is, this hadith has a mafoom, and the hadith Abi Sa'id al-Khudri has a mantuq. Because hadith is saying in, in al ida balaga qullatain. If the water reaches qullatain, lam yahmil al khabat. If the water reaches qullatain, it would not take impurity. Means yeah. if it doesn't reach qullatain, it will. It will take impurity. It will take impurity. So here is where the issue comes from. Yeah. And this issue, the reason for the khilaf of this issue is, can a taqsis al umumi be dalil al khitab? Can you restrict a mantuq based on a mafoom? Right, I see. Right, yeah. Sahib al Maraqi he says, Wa ijma'a Sahib al Maraqi mentions that when he speaks about al Mufassil al Mufassil, he mentions that the uh, qiyas, uh, sorry, the mafoom, the two types of mafoom, mafoom al Muafaqa and mafoom al Khalafa, they can restrict the mantuq. And that's the madhab he takes. Remember we spoke about the mafoom. We divide the mafoom into yeah. two types. Mafoom al muwafaqa and mafoom al muqalafa And we said that the mafoom al muwafaqa is two types. Mafoom al musawi and mafoom al awla. And mafoom al muqalafa we said, which is also known as dalil al-khitab, is mafoom al sifa or mafoom al shart. Another example of why the scholars, which I'm, I'm still on the same second one, why the scholars would differ, for example, is can you take money on the adhan? So if somebody does adhan, can he take money on it? Okay. Some of the scholars, they said, you're not, you're not allowed to. And some scholars, they said, you are allowed to. 
The ones who said you're not allowed to, they took the hadith of Uthman ibn Abi As, al thaqafi radiallahu ta'ala anhu, where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said to him, uh, so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, la la yakhudu ala adhari ajra. Take a mu'adhin, this mu'adhin does not take a reward for his adhan. And Imam Ahmad narrated in his Musnad, Abu Dawood fi Sunani wa Tirmidhi fi, fi Jami'i, and Imam al-Nasai narrated in his Mujtaba, which is the Sunan al-Sughra. Now this hadith, the Prophet is saying to him, take a mu'adhin that doesn't take a reward for yeah, it. Yeah. And then we, the, the other party are bringing the hadith where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abu, Mah, uh, Abu Mahdura, Abu Mahdura, the Prophet gave him a surrah, in there was a fiddah. The narration mentioned, ثُمَّ دَعَانِ حِينَ قَضَيْتُ التَّأْذِينَ فَأَعْطَانِي سُرَّةً فِيهَا شَيْءٌ مِنْ فِضَّةً the Prophet gave him, after he did the Adhan, and he finished the Adhan, the Prophet gave him a reward for it. He gave him a purse, inside it there was fiddah. So it's a situation where it's not a lack of evidence, you rather you have two evidences Aynan. that appear to be contradicting. And the scholars then, this, within themselves, they differ upon how do we reconcile between yeah. these. Some of them, they said it's abrogated, that's one view. Second group of scholars, they said, This is a specific situation, we cannot generalize it. Mm. That's the second. The third view of the scholars, which is the strongest and it's the best, because they are acting upon the hadith, وَالْجَمْعُ which is trying to bring the two evidences takes precedence over dismissing one. So how did they do that? So what they said is the hadith Uthman ibn Abi Asin, he said it's, it's, it's talking about al-ashtirat, when the person conditions, and he says, I'm not going to do adhan uh, unless I'm given this. Okay? That's what he's talking about. When the Prophet said, take a mu'adhinan, that doesn't take a reward, it means the one who doesn't condition it. But if he just does the adhan and then someone gives it to him without... He doesn't put a condition. He says, you know what? I'll do the adhan, but you know, I've got a family commitment. I'm not going to put any conditions. I'll still keep doing my adhan. I'm with you. Yeah. That's what they did. So that's the second way why the third way might differ. The third way is this particular word, Adabul Ma'rifati bidalalati al al This particular word, the scholars don't know what it means. I mean, they, or they, there's differences of views. Yeah. For example, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said in a hadith, لا طلاق ولا عتاق في إغلاق. The hadith Ahmad narrated in his Musnad, Ibn Abi Shayba narrated in his Musannaf, Abu Dawood narrated in his Sunan, Ibn Majah narrated in his Sunan. The word لا طلاق ولا عتاق في إغلاق. There is no divorce and there is no freeing of uh, emancipation of your slave. في إغلاق whilst in a state of إغلاق. So what's إغلاق? Mm. Some scholars, they said coercion. Some scholars, they said, no, it's anger. And this is the call of the Iraqiyin. Some of them, they said, it actually means when a person does these three divorce. And there's difference of views on this, the word right. and the meaning. Also, another famous example is that the woman who is divorced, she would wait. This is, the scholars, by the way, as a side benefit, they say, is, خَبَرِيَّةٌ لَفْظًا إِنْشَائِيَّةٌ مَعْنًا And يَتَرَبَّصْنَ means they are waiting. It means they will wait. It's a command. يَتَرَبَّصْنَ بِأَنفُسِهِنَّ ثَلَاثَةَ قُرُوءٍ هَيْ وَسْقُرُوءٍ The word قُرُوءٍ في إجمال. There's ambiguity. As Al-Alam Muhammad Al-Amin Al-Shanqiti mentions. The word قُرْئِ يُطْلَقُ According to Arabic language يُطْلَقُ لُغَةً عَلَى الْحَيْضِ Sometimes according to the Arabic language is حيض. Sometimes it's considered to be طهر. Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what did he say in the hadith? Da'i salat ayyama aqra'iki. Hold back your days where you're on your menstruation, hold back from the prayer. The, the Prophet used the word aqra'iki. The word aqra'iki comes from the word qur'i. Walidhalika the poet, he said, Ya rubba di hanqin alayya qaridi lahu qurwun ka qurwil ha'idi. Which means he, yani, pissed her and, you know, yani, he didn't, he didn't ta'an of her until the blood came from it, like the blood of her menstruation. Mm. Also, it can be used as the word tuhrin, like Al-A'sha said, أَفِي كُلِّ عَامٍ أَنْتَ جَاشِي بِغَزْوَةٍ تَشُدُّ لِأَقْصَاهَا عَزِيمَ عَزِيمَ عَزَائِكَ مُوَرِّثَةٍ مَالًا وَفِي الْحَيِّ رِفْعَةٌ لِمَا ضَاعَ فِيهَا مِنْ قُرُوءِ نِسَائِكَ يعني أَطْحَرِهِنَّ So we have it here being used as tuhrin, and we have it here being used as haydin. Shawkani, because of that, he said, Rahimahullah ta'ala, wal hasilu. The conclusion is, anna al quru'a fi lugat al arabi mushtarakun. That the word, quru' in the Arabic language, it takes two meanings. Okay. Bain al haydi wa al tuhri. Wali ajli hadha, hadha al ishtiraqin. Because of these two people using that same word, ikhtalaf ahlu al ilmi fi ta'ini ma huwa al muradi bil quru'i li madkurati fi la aya. So they disputed one another. So now, and uh, based on that, there's going to be the fourth and final reason is there's a dif dispute in what اختلاف في القواعد الأصولية. 
The qawaid al-usuriya that they're using is different. Ah, I see. Okay. There's a dispute in the qawaid al-usuriya. For example, al-aslu fi sirati al-amri ida tajarrad an al-qara'in. It's a question. If Allah commands us to do something, but the commandments that Allah gives us subhanahu wa ta'ala is stripped from any external factors, merely this command, does it show wujub or not? Mm. There's a discussion. It's not agreed upon. Also, the amr yaqtadi al-fawriyat wa takrar if Allah commands us to do something, does it benefit us? Repetition, and does it have to be done immediately? There's a discussion. It's not agreed upon. It's qa'id right. al-suriya. So, there are many other reasons. Al-Alama Muhammad, Al-Alama Ahmed ibn Abdul Harim, uh, ibn Abdul Salam, ibn Taymiyyah mentions, rahimahullah ta'ala, why there is a uh, dispute amongst the scholars and there's khilafat amongst the ulama. Okay, the last question I have for you on this particular episode is, it's not really a question, it's more of a comment. Salafiyyah is not a madhab. It did not exist during the Prophet Sallallahu time, nor the time of the Tabi'een. It is a newly invented cult. The reality of those who say this is a people who haven't really understood what Salafiyyah means. Da'wah to Salafiyyah, it means those who follow, who hold on to the Quran and the Sunnah and the understanding of the three golden generation. They don't believe in ta'as or fanaticism towards the madahibs. Nor do they call towards turning away from the madahibs in totality mm. and not to give importance to the statements of the scholars. Nor do they call to everyone do ijtihad yourself. Salafiya, I mean Salafis, when it comes to madahibs, there are four foundations which their discussion and argument revolves around. Number one is, their argument is that the truth uh, and the haqq um, is not the statement of the scholars necessarily. Okay. ulama, the statements of the scholars, it's not a delil in and within itself. And you can't say, uh, Imam Abu Hanifa said, and then I would say, oh, سمعنا وطعنا. The one that has that is Allah Azza wa Jalla. إنما قول المؤمنين إذا دعوا إلى الله ورسوله ليحكم بينهم أن يقولوا سمعنا وطعنا. It is what Allah and His messengers say is the one that we just have to follow and adhere to and, fo- and, and submit to. So the أقوال العلماء and the aqwal of the a'imma laysat dalilan fi haddi dhatiha. That's the first, uh, and Shaykh al-Islam Taymiyyah in his kitab Minhaj al-Sunnah al the second, the sixth volume, Ibn Taymiyyah transmits ijma' that Ahlul Ilm unanimously agree upon that the kitab and the sunnah are the evidences. And anybody other than the Quran and the sunnah, their statements, it's not an evidence in and within itself. The second issue when it comes to Salafiyyah regarding tamadhub and madhabiyyah and madhabs is that they believe that the truth is not restricted to the four imams, which, which we already, already mentioned before. Yeah. Shaykh al-Islam Taymiyyah rahimahullah mentions that in also in his Majmu'u Minhaj al-Sunnah Nabawiyah, the third volume. He says, Inna ahl sunnati lam yaqul ahadu minhum. No one from ahl sunnah ever said, Inna ijma' al-aymati al-arba'ati hujjatun ma'asumatun. That the four imams, what they unanimously agree upon, four of them, that the truth is restricted to them. Uh, no one said that from it. Rahimahumullah. Right? Rather, the truth can sometimes be outside these four. Yeah. It could happen. The third thing that the Salafis, when it comes to madhabs, they believe is that the person must look for the evidences if he has the ability to do so. If he doesn't have the ability, then he can blind follow as a rukhsa. Okay. Because Allah says in the Quran, Fattakullaha, mastata'atun. Fear Allah as much as you can. La yukallifu Allahu nafsan. When it came to the ayah, I encourage everybody who can read the Arabic language to go to the Kitab Adwa'u al Bayani fi Idah al Quran bil Quran by Muhammad uh, Muhammad al Amin Shankiyatiyu Rahimahullah when he explains the ayah, Falayat Dabarun al Quran is worth Muhammad. Honey, there's durar, gold, يعني, tens of pages that he comments on there. Pondering over the Quran He argues with Usuleen Who say that you can't do Pondering on the Quran Unless you're a mujtahid And things like that He discusses that in great details And he mentions there Rahimahullah ta'ala He said وَبِهَذَا تَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ الْمُضَّرَّ لِلْتَقْلِيدِ الْأَعْمَى إِضْطِرَارًا حَقِيقِيَّةً بِحَيْثُ يَكُونُ لَا قُدْرَةَ لَهُ الْبَتَّةَ عَلَى غَيْرِهِ مَا عَدَمِ التَّفْرِيضِ لِكَوْنِ لَا قُدْرَةَ عوائق قاهرة عن التعلم أو هو على في أثناء التعلم ولكنه يتعلم تدريجيا فهو معذور في التقليد المذكور للضرورة لأنه لا مندوحة له عنها أما القادر على التعلم المفرط فيه والمقدم آراء الرجال على ما علم من الوحي فهذا ليس بمعذور يعني فبهذا لا يملك 
and he hasn't got the ability, he hasn't got the strength, he hasn't got the knowledge yeah. to you know go follow the Quran and the Sunnah, then he can blind follow. But like in the one who's negligent, he says, and deliberately chooses to take the views of the scholars to, and abandons the Quran and the Sunnah, that person is not excused. The fourth and final point that Salafis, when it comes to madahib, is that they believe mm. Look at the views of the scholars. Mm. Look at who's strongest to the look who is closest to the haq and the truth. Okay? And uh, this is something that uh, Salafiyah and the Salafis when it comes to madhabs, these are the four points they have. Okay. Be open minded, go research and look into the matters. Okay, Jazakallah Um Moving on to the next podcast we did, uh, we actually looked at the the aqidah, the creedal belief of a particular group known as the Ashara. Let's give the viewers a, a short clip just to um, ref- refresh their memory of what we spoke about. Can you please define briefly what aqidah means? And the second one is, please, can you go through who are the Ashara? So Al Aqidah is it's the six articles of faith. And Tu'mina Billahi wa Malaikati wa Kutubihi wa Rusulihi wa Yawmil Akhir wa Tu'mina Bil Qadari Khairi wa Sharri. And there's also other things that scholars add on to Aqidah, which they've taken from the Quran and the Sunnah, and the unanimous agreement of the Salaf al Sadih, the pious predecessors, which is the issue of Musam al Iman. What does Iman actually mean? The issue of Al Imamah uh, related to the Muslim leader. How do we deal with the Muslim leader? And other issues like that. Generally speaking, that is what Aqidah is. The Ashara, they refer themselves back to a man by the name of Abu Hassan al Ashari, who goes back to originally the noble companion Abu uh, Musa al Ashari. Abu Hassan al Ashari's father, he was from the people of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. He was a Muhaddith, his father. Can I define who Ahlul Sunnah so we have an understanding of it? So, okay, you can, but before I allow you to do that, you're saying Ahlul Sunnah are not the Ash'ara because the Ash'ara call themselves Ahlul Sunnah as well. Ahlul Sunnah are. And the scholars say, Fulanun ala Sunnah. It means he's in line with the revelation and the hadith in his speech and his actions can't be from the people of the Sunnah whilst you're opposing Allah and his messenger. And then the Sunnah is the Prophet and the four rightly guided Khulafa Fine. in their speech, in their belief and in their actions. Okay. Is that is that something a person can deny? No, that's perfectly fair. That's fair to say that this is it. But I want you to understand one thing. Like we spoke about last time, that the madhahib in fiqh, and I understand your point that it's different between fiqh and aqidah, no problem. The madhahib in fiqh, mm. they were humans who were attempting to understand the Quran, the Sunnah, and the companions. Mm. In aqidah, mm-hmm. these are also human attempts to try and understand the Quran, Sunnah, and the companions, no, you, they, uh, you might disagree with them. Uh, they might get it wrong. You might say this is this, you know, this goes against the Quran, but it's their interpretation. No, of Shai, Quran. that's my point. And what I'm saying to you is that these issues have unanimously agree, been agreed upon. Every Muslim would agree the Quran and the Sunnah and the Sahabas is the way forward. Sah- yes, yeah, yeah. yeah Shai, I don't agree with that. I'm gonna bring their references and their statements. Anyone I mention from the Shai'ira is not someone they're gonna deny. Okay, go on. And I'm gonna prove today, inshallah Taala, that the Shai'ira today, the Shai'ira that we know today are not a sha'ira of the early way of Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari. The sha'ira of today are Jahmiya Mahab. Fakhruddin al-Razi who gave precedence to that logic over the text. With that premise, he comes to the Quran and the Sunnah. So He's we, going to believe what the Aqal has affirmed. So when you see them interpret verses to a meaning that you're thinking, this is what they, they came to, it's not because they believe the Quran and the Sunnah, to be a source of legislation. Well, let's go. Let's go back a step. Because what part of that, in your mind, goes against the Quran? The Quran takes precedence over our aql. Let me give you another I'm statement. No, I, I'm sorry. If I, if I, I, no, no. Wait one second. I don't yeah. want you to move from this because I, I, I want you to understand something. Because you're looking at it from your perspective, and I can understand the way you're looking at it. But I want you to understand the other person's perspective. When you hear about the Allah descends laws, you say, and someone asks you, "How do you do it?" You say Allah, we don't. Mm, mm, mm. You have just done what um, Fakhruddin Razi is exactly what saying. Say? The aql doesn't understand, so we make tafweed. We say Allah, Allah told us subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran. Again, I'm not choosing to what I want to believe and what I want to do tafweed. Neither of. are they. They don't yeah, say they they're choosing. They are, yes, they are. That's your claim on them. No. So Nusi is one of the great books they, they study. His kitab, he's got a kitab called Sharh al Kubra. So he's saying here anyone who claims that the way to know the truth is the kitab and the sunnah. The refutation on this person is the following. Ya Rajul. Shahid. Shahid, if, imagine I said this to you. They believe it's min usul al-kufri. 
is disbelief of Allah to say I'm going to hold on to the Quran and Sunnah. Bajuri has a risala called Ilm al-Tawheed. This is an aqidah book. It's Ilm al-Tawheed is called. You're an Ash'ari. This is the book you are taught. You learn it. Ibrahim al-Bajuri is considered Shaykh al-Islam for them. They call him Shaykh al-Islam Ibrahim al-Bajuri. Look what it, look how he talks. Just what people understand. What aqidah for them is an Ibn Abdul Wahab's risala, for example. Or Ibn Taymiyyah. Ibn Taymiyyah, if you have read his wasatiyah, mm. we studied it. Wasatiyah, with Dalil Qawlu Ta'ala. So you, three, four pages, it's just Dalil. Mm. Ibn Abdul Wahab, every time, with Dalil Qawlu Ta'ala, with Dalil Qawlu Ta'ala. That's very common in it. Yeah. Look what he does. He says, فَيَجِبُ فِي حَقِّهِ تَعَالَى الْوُجُودِ For Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala, existence is a, is, is a must. وَضِدُّهُ الْعَدَبَ The opposite to existence is not to exist. وَالدَّلِيلُ You're waiting for ayah in the Quran, right? Yeah. The evidence for that is the existence of the creation. Shahid. Wallahi a'udhu billah. It's something to be shocked with a people's studies as a, as a form of tawheed. He negates Allah's names and attributes with not one ayah or hadith. Look at their lectures and their reminders and their lec- and their and their, and their works. The Quran and the Sunnah are very little. It's a very big topic. You've given me a very short period of time. What I want to say, inshallah ta'ala, is that Abil Hassan al Ash'ari. We're out of time. Okay, so we spoke uh, about a number of different issues. We really dissected this this group's belief in a lot of detail. I think you brought a lot of new information to the table which may not have been heard in the English language before. You went into their books, you quoted from their books, you quoted from their scholars, and you really showed how they have deviated and how it was kind of a progressive deviation. You mentioned four individuals, I believe, but it was a kind of progressive deviation into what we end up now where they are so far from Ahlul Sunnah on one side and the Ash'ara on the other side. Um, and also then you also address some of the more contemporary challenges like why are you even talking about Aqidah? Does he, do these abstract matters of Aqidah even affect anybody in the 21st century? So I thought it was a quite a comprehensive podcast. It was a controversial one, um, but I thought it was a comprehensive one. And, and uh, you know, I, I think a lot of people who want to understand this particular group's methodology more than they can refer to the, to the full video. Any thoughts that you have about this particular podcast? It's important to learn Tawheed. You know, بعد فالتوحيد علم ينبل على العلوم كلها ويفضل قد أوجب الرحمن منه قدرا ليس يصح دين حتى يدرى. يعني it's important to study توحيد mm-hmm. and ground yourself with توحيد. It's why you're in this world. Allah says in the Quran, وما خلقت الجن والإنس إلا ليعبدون ما أريد منهم من رزق وما أريد أن يطعمون إن الله هو الرزاق ذو القوة المتين. The reason why you were brought to this world and Allah brought you here is to worship Him سبحانه وتعالى. So you have to study what عبادة is. You have to understand what can nullify your ibadah and your, your, your act of worship. You need to study what la ilaha illallah means. It's the purpose why you're here. Mm-hmm. Alam tala kayfa darab Allahu mathalan kalimatan tayyibatan ka shajaratin tayyibatin asluha thabitu wa far'uha fi sabah. Allah mentions that this word la ilaha illallah is a word of salvation and prosperity. It is It grounds a person in this world and it brings them prosperity in the hereafter. Al-lazina amanu wa lam yalbisu imanahum bidhulmin ulaika lahumul amun wa humu tadun. You're going to have safety in this world and you're going to, paradise is going to wait for you on the hereafter. The Prophet Sallallahu explained in this ayah that the word dhulm here means shirk. And he said, did you not hear the statement of the righteous slave of Allah? In shirk ala dhulmun azim. So studying tawheed, whether it be tawheed al-rububiyya and tawheed al-uluhiyya and tawheed al-asma'i wa-sifat, the three types of tawheed that are found in the Quran. Allah says, Rabbu samawati wal-ardi wa ma baynahuma fa'abudhu wa astabir li'ibadati. Hal ta'lamu lahu sabiya? Allah mentions in this verse the three types of Tawheed. Rabbu al-Samawati wal-Ardi wa ma baynahuma rububiya fa'abudhu wa astabil li'ibadati al-uluhiyya hal ta'lamu lahu samiyya al-asma' wa sifat. Allah mentions in Surah Al-Fatiha Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Allah mentions Alhamdulillahi praises to Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala Rabbil Alameen al-Rububiyya Ar-Rahman al-Rahim al-asma' wa sifat. Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in al-uluhiyya By the way, I can read Fatiha just jumped from those verses to the others. Mm-hmm. So in those verses, Allah wa ta'ala tells us al rububiya and al uluhiya and al-Asma which are mm-hmm. found in the Quran. Great scholars of Islam have also mentioned these three from those great scholars of Islam is Al Imam Abu Hanifa, uh, Ibn Battar Allah mentions it, uh, Shaykh al Islam, Ibn Taymiyyah mentions it, Ibn Jarir al Tabri mentions it in his tafsir. Even Abi Hamid al Ghazali in his kitab Ihya Ulum al Deen, he agrees and he refutes okay. those people. Uh, who deny the concept of taqsim al-tawheed. He mentions in the muqaddimat uh, of his kitab, Ihya' Ulum al-Din. Billillahi alhamdu al-minna, I've read the kitab Ihya' Ulum al-Din ample times. So I'm very acquainted with the kitab. Mm. The point, brothers, is that, and sisters were watching that, 
you have to ground yourself with your tawheed you have to ground yourself with yani aqida you have to study these things and then when you study that you study the tawaif the groups that are out there as the poet said araftu sharra la li sharri walakin li tawaqihi wa man lam ya'rif sharra min al-khayr waqa'a fi la ri the evil allows you to be grounded more on what you uh, are upon the haq will become more clearer to you when you see the falsehood and the evil that is out there hudayfa ibn al-yaman he said kana an-nas yas'aluna rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam 'an al-khayr wa kuntu as'aluhu 'an sharri maqafati ay yudhikani hadith hudayfa ibn al-yaman fa sahih muslim the people used to go to the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and ask him about the good and i would go to him and ask him about the evil mm-hmm. because i was scared that i might fall into it yeah Let's go into some of the questions that people had uh, The first one I have for you is Don't you think defining ilm al-kalam as Greek philosophy is a bit misleading? I mean al-Ghazali specifically refuted the Greeks Yet he still partook in kalam We have to understand the marahil and the stages that ilm al-kalam went through Then you'll understand is ilm al-kalam and is philosophy the same Or are they two different things? The marahil that he went through are as follows The first stage is marhala a stage where it's the early mutakallimin like Waas ibn Ata and Amr ibn Ubaid and Abu al-Hudayl al-Allaf Muhammad ibn Hudayl al-Basri the, these people Ibrahim al-Nadham the Mu'tazila the heads of the figures Waas ibn Ata who took from Hassan al-Basri but Hassan kicked him out of his halaqa Amr ibn Ubaid uh, which Abu Harifa rahimahullah said la'natullahi ala Amr ibn Ubaid may Allah's curse be upon Amr ibn Ubaid and Abu al-Hudayl al-Allaf whose name is Muhammad ibn al-Hudayl Al Basri and Ibrahim al Nadam. These people are the early stage mm-hmm. of the mutakallimin. Like when you look at them, the science of yani ilm al kalam is just yani is all over the place. The mustalahat are all over the place. Mutanatira. They're not organized for them because the science hasn't fully been written properly. Okay, Does that makes sense. Because okay. it's the early stages, but they did have terminologies that they adopted because at this particular time, the Greek logians works like Plato and. Uh, who they call it Aristotle and their works have been pushed into the Muslim world so they they are acquainted with it but the science hasn't been written uh, very well and this particular time the scholars do mention like Sheikh Hussam Taim and other great scholars mention that this particular time Aristotle and Plato's argument and Socrates Socrates arguments are not yet put to the forefront the second marhala is marhala where the Asha'ira came into the discussion Mm. Uh, and they came and they went into this marhala This is called marhala to tatawur Where it evolved more ilm al-kalam Where it has a madrasa and science They introduced something known as Ithbat al-jawhar al-fard And other than that Which they pushed But originally Was taken from the Greek logians works Wasna Ata already mentioned The third marhala Which is a marhala where Ilm al-kalam And ilm al-falsafa Philosophy became one and the other mm. And one beca- they became Yani exactly the same And people studied it The last and final stage is The blind followers who came after that Bejuri and Sanusi And the likes of these people Who didn't add anything else to it Except just manipulate it And play around with it So Ilmul Kalam today When you really look at it And you discuss it And you just study it And you observe it You can't separate it From philosophy It's one and the other Okay the next question I have for you from this episode What is the difference between Maturidis and Ash'aris? Uh, when it comes to the Maturidi and Ash'ara There are a few things we need to look at The uh, first thing is that The Maturidiya is a firqatun kalamiyatun bid'iyatun They are from the Mutakallimin And they are an innovative group um, uh, The Maturidiya uh, They go back to a man by the name of Abu Mansur al-Maturidi And this Abu Mansur al-Maturidi uh, his name is Muhammad ibn Mahmud Muhammad ibn Muhammad ibn Mahmud Al-Maturidiyu Samarqandiyu uh, The place he's from is Maturid And Maturid is a small village inside, Samar- inside Samarqand Which is Ma Wara Al-Nahr That's where he was born um, Abu Mansur Al-Maturidi um, And it's been attributed to him And it wasn't attributed to him uh, when he was alive It just became a, a, Like even the ha- Sha'ara After Abu Hassan Ash'ari yeah. died The group came about Abu, Ma- Abu Masul al-Maturidi um, uh, The group The Maturidiya They came out after uh, He died Okay So it went through stages The Madhab There's a Madhab Marhala Which is known as Marhala to uh, Tasis Where the foundations Were being placed 
And this was at the beginning when he, Abu Masur al maturidi would debate with the Mu'tazila. Everybody was debating with the Mu'tazila. The Mu'tazila mm-hmm. were, were the problem. Every group, argumentation. So he debated with them, um, but he adopted some things from them as well. He took some of their views and their, and he got affected by them in many issues. Uh, after that, he got affected by a man whose name is Ibn Kullab, who died in 240 Hijriya. Okay. He ado- adopted from him the concept of, which we already spoke about, the speech of Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala, Kalam Nafsi. Yeah. You know, Qa'imun Bidatillahi Tabarak wa Ta'ala. He took that from them. So this was the beginning, it was the early stages, Marhalu to Tasis. And then came the Marhalu to Taqween, where it became يعني, structured. And he had followers. Him, Abu Mansur al Maturidi, he, in terms of the madhab that he follows from the four imams, is the Hanafi madhab. Okay. And uh, his madhab, um, يعني, at this marhala, marhala to taqween, where the madhab has been established and everything, it was aided and supported by Abu al Qas, two individuals, marhala to taqween, who, who pushed it, who gave it some, some, يعني, taqween, just structured it a bit. Right. Yeah. Is Abu Al Qasim, Ishaq ibn Muhammad uh, ibn Ismail al Hakim, al Samarqandi, and also Abu Muhammad Abdul Karim ibn Musa ibn Isa al Bazdawi. Now came after that day, but no authorships here, no works have been written. And then came that the Marhalat al Ta'lif, what Tasnif, what Ta'seel, authorship works were being written, foundations were being placed fully. And this is where Abu Al Mu'in al Nasafi and Najmuddin Umar al Nasafi came about. They placed Qawa'id and Usul for the Madhab. يعني مذهب الماتوريدية عقيدة الماتوريدية and then after that is the last and final stage which is where it spread توسع والانتشار and it spread in many lands and it really got helped by the سلاطين الدولة العثمانية they pushed it a lot the Ottoman Empire because hmm. they, they adopted it they loved okay. it so it spread في شرق الأرض وغربها it spread in بلاد العرب in many Arab countries also India that's where it really spread Turkey spreads they follow the مذهب الماتوريدية Persia also, uh, Uzbekistan, all these places spread a lot in those lands. And the one who's pushed it and is Kamal ibn Humam, he pushed it a lot. So in terms of the madhab of the Maturidi, that's the stages it went through. Mm. In terms of the difference between them and Ahlul Sunnah in general, the Maturidi, when it comes to Usul al-Din, Aqeedah, they categorize it into two. They say there's something called al- uh, Al-Ilahiyat and that which they call al shariyat that which they call al-ilahiyat is basically aqliyat. Mm. It is that which ma yastaqillu al-aql bi ithbatiha. The aql can independently prove these things. And here they add in tawheed uh, of Allah tabarak wa ta'ala, Allah's names and attributes. That's what they do. Tawheed of Allah tabarak wa ta'ala. And also Allah's names and attributes, they put it into the al-ilahiyat, al-aqliyat, things that can be proven but logically. Mm. Then they go to Ashariyat, which is basically a Sam'iyat, textually based. And here they put in an Nubuwat prophecy, they put in Adab al Qabri, the issues related to the hereafter, Yawmul Akhirah. Uh, and even amongst themselves, they differ upon the Nubuwat. Should we put it into the Ila Aqliyat or the Sam'iyat or the Ilahiyat or the Shariyat? Which one should we put it, should we put it under? They go against Ahlul Sunnah in many things. First of all, was where they take their deen from. Yeah. They just divided it into Al Aqliyat and Sam'iyat. Whereas Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, where do they take their religion from? Al Quran wa Sunnah and the Ijma'ah of the Ummah. They don't. Also, they agree with the Mu'tazila and the Ashairah in the issue of affirming Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala's existence. Uh, um, it, sorry, mainly they agree with the Mu'tazila and the Ashairah in the issue of how do you believe in Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala. We believe believing in Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala is to know Tawheed. Fa'alam annahu la ilaha illallah. And etc. Right? They believe, as we mentioned, awal wajib al mukallaf. The first thing that's placed upon the person who's mukallaf, who's reached age of puberty, is uh, another. Right? Remember, looking and pondering, which they mean dalilul arad wa al ajsam, which you touched on. And obviously, yes, that's, the, it's a big issue. It's a, big it's a issue. very big issue. So, according to them, the people are not Muslims. They, are, mm. they make takfir of amatul nas. So, from that perspective, the Muslim, the people are not Muslims, according to them. Also. They, when it comes to uh, Allah's subhanahu wa ta'ala characteristics of speech, they, they agree with the Asha'ira. Like in the difference between them and the Asha'ira is, Asha'ira, they, cat- they affirm how many characteristics? They affirm seven characteristics. Whereas the uh, Maturidiyah, they affirm eight characteristics. They say Al-Hayatu and Al-Qudrah 
أن العلم أن الإرادة أن سمع أن البصر أن الكلام أن تكوين. Ah, that's the eighth. That the eighth one on. that they add on to there. Uh, this is what they affirm uh, the uh, Maturidia. Also, the difference between them is the issue of مسألة التحسين والتقبيح العقليين. It's another issue. They are مرجئة, just like the uh, شاعرة. When we spoke spoke about, they are uh, مرجئة when it comes to إيمان. They believe التصديق بالقلب فقط. Just affirm it in your heart. Some of them say الإقرار. In the heart, in the, in the on the tongue, and affirming on your tongue, and actions don't enter in, into and it doesn't increase nor does it decrease. Mm-hmm. They say it's haram to say uh, the masala ahl sunnah mention, which is al istithna fi iman. Yani to say ana mu'minun insha Allah. Huh. They don't allow that. They also believe an Islam wal iman mutaradifan. Islam and iman are just one and the other. Um, so they fall short on that issue. I encourage if anybody wants to really know about them more, more, more. There's a Risala Magister written by Shams al Afghani, Salafi Rahimahullah. He wrote a kitab called Al Maturidiya wa Mokifu wa Mokifu Mituhid al Asma'i wa Sifat. It's a very beneficial kitab. I really admire it. Um, so I encourage people, inshallah okay. ta'ala, to, to read that kitab. Also, Sheikh Muhammad Abdul Rahman al Khamis is a kitab called Manhaj al Maturidiya fi al Aqeedah. Also, Sheikh al Islam ibn Taymiyyah discusses them in great details in his Majmu'u al Fatawa and also in his Kitab al Istiqamah. Sheikh Muhammad ibn Salih al Uthaymin, if you go to his Majmu'ah, Ibn Uthaymin's Majmu'ah, mm. the third volume, page 307 to 308, he also talks about them over there as well. Okay. So, is it fair to say that the Maturidiya and the Sha'ara are very similar in a lot of things? And then there are also some small differences between them, like the, the fact that the Maturidiya are from eight characteristics instead of the Sha'ara, who are only from seven and things There's like that. It's a very small difference between the two, <laughs> but they are one and the other. So one of the things that came up time and time again on our podcast was the difference between textual evidences and using the aql, the intellect. And a questioner has asked, to what extent are we allowed to use aql in the religion? Are we allowed to use the intellect in the religion? First of all, we have to understand the aql according to Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah has a very high station. And we, in Ahl, inshallah ta'ala, may Allah make us from Ahl Sunnah. Amen. We believe, inshallah ta'ala, that the aql has a manzila rafi'a, a high level. For example, if you look at the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu when he speaks about who is يعني, commanded to do acts of leg- acts of worship, who's يعني, manutun bit taklif, يعني, who do we say you have to fast, you have to pray, mm. يعني, or you have to go hajj, is a person who has يعني, aql, right? Mm. Sanity. Yeah. Had the Prophet Sallallahu said in the hadith, Rufi al qalam an thalath, in the pen has been lifted from three. عن النائم حتى يستيقظ the one who sleeps until he wakes up وعن الصبي حتى يحتلم and the one who is you know the child uh, who hasn't reached age of puberty and last but not least وعن المجنون حتى يعقل and the one who is insane until he gains sanity so you can see it's given an importance to yeah. it that's that the, the shara is has made manat al-taklif upon the aql also uh, the Quran and the Sunnah, when you look at it, it urges us to think and ponder and analyze and, you know, critique. We're, we're being told to do all of that. If you look at the concepts of tadabbur and tafakkur and tadakkur, all of those are referring to people to use their aql. Mm-hmm. Also, Allah wa ta'ala, He praised the people who have, you know, great minds. Allah praised them. means the smart people, the clever people, the ones who use their brain. They're the ones who are going to take reminders from all of this. Allah praised them. Also Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala He spoke against those people Who dismiss using their aql In its right place Allah says وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمُ اتَّبِعُ مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ قَالُوا بَلْ نَتَّبِعُ مَا أَلْفَيْنَا عَلَيْهِ آبَاءَنَا أَوَلَوْ كَانَ آبَاءُهُمْ لَا يَعْقِلُونَ شَيْئًا وَلَا يَهْتَدُونَ وَمَثَلُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا كَمَثَلِ الَّذِي يَنْعِقُ بِمَا لَا يَسْمَعُ إِلَّا دُعَاءً وَنِدَاءً their response is قَالُوا بَلْ نَتَّبِعُ مَا أَلْفَيْنَا عَلَيْهِ آبَانَا We will follow that which we found from our forefathers. When Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala, He says, أَوَلَوْ كَانَ آبَاءُمْ لَا يَعْقِلُونَ شَيْءٍ What about if your fathers are not? Yeah. They're say, telling you things that are insane. Are you going to still follow them? Are you going to do it? Also then Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala, He speaks about the people who basically call unto the dead, who can't hear them, who can't speak to them, and they just call unto them. And then Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala, He said, سُمٌ بُكْمٌ عُمْيٌ فَهُمْ لَا يَعْقِلُونَ so this shows you that the importance that the aql has. Also, Allah Taala He mentions that Yomul Qiyamah, the people who are going to regret it, 
other people that didn't use their aql وقالوا لو كنا نسمع أو نعقل ما كنا في أصحاب السعير فاعترفوا بذنبهم فسحقا لأصحاب السعير so we kind of touched on this issue of aql and يعني in the the the, the يعني the aql and the text we made a whole entire podcast uh, on this particular issue yeah, yeah. we spoke about it in great details but what we what I do want the inshallah ta'ala people to listen is that the concept of aql there has to be a middle path that we take regarding it بين الغلو والجفاء we don't go extreme in exaggeration and we don't go extreme in negligence regarding the aql. Yani we have two groups. Mm-hmm. One group of people who've given the aql unrestricted boundaries. <clears throat> Do what you want. Question everything. Critique everything. Analyze everything. And think that the aql hasn't got boundaries, hasn't got limitations. Those people have gone extreme in the concept of the aql. And we have another group of people who yani, dismiss the usage of the aql. And he don't care about the aql, and they're the sufiya, women naha and those who are on their path. They don't care about the aql, and they tell you things that are absurd and يعني, an illogical absurdity. You're like, are you sure you say no? Like mm-hmm. uh, people, some people are like that, mm. and another group of people like the mu'tazil women naha and those who take their path. The aql is the source, and it's the evidence and the proof. And we need to be in the middle when it comes to that. We don't go extreme like these people and we don't go extreme in this one. How can we يعني, be in that middle path? What we have to understand is that aql, it has a great station in our religion. I already mentioned that mm-hmm. and I gave some evidences for it. But Allah did say in the Quran, وَخُلِقَ الْإِنسَانُ ضَعِيفًا yeah. Allah created the human beings weak. In other words, the brain is part of those weak parts of your body. Correct. Just like you can see and mashallah, your eyes are good and 10, 10 out of 10, your sight is good, you can drive, mashallah. But your eyesight is restricted. Yeah. The brain is a part of you that's also restricted. Mm-hmm. And there are things that the aql cannot really speak about. For example, you have to understand your aql has la dakhala lahu fil ghaybiyat. You can't speak about the unseen. Because the aql really speaks about that which it, it has seen. Yeah. Aql compares. If I asked you right now, draw for me an animal that does not resemble any animal on the face of this earth. I won't be able to do it. You wouldn't be able to. You're going to make the wing. It's a bird's wing. You're going to take the 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 uh, the uh, the whiskers from a cat. Yeah, and you're going to take yeah. characteristics mm-hmm. from animals you've seen. You can't bring something to the table you haven't seen. So the aql cannot really speak about the unseen. Mm-hmm. Its brain is. It's not like that. Second thing is la yastaqillu bil hidayah. The aql independently cannot know the detailed matters of guidance. That's why Allah Tabarak wa Taala He. Uh, said in the Quran وَلَقَدْ مَكَّنَّاهُمْ فِيهِ وَلَقَدْ مَكَّنَّاهُمْ فِيهِ وَجَعَلْنَا لَهُمْ سَمْعًا وَأَبَصَارًا وَأَفْئِدًا فَمَا أَغْنَى عَنْهُمْ سَمْعُهُمْ وَلَا أَبَصَارُهُمْ وَلَا أَفْئِدَتُهُمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ إِذْ كَانُوا يَدْحَدُونَ بِآيَاتِ اللَّهِ وَحَقَ بِهِمَا كَانُوا بِهِ يَسْتَنْزِئُونَ Also Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala He mentions in the Quran يعني, The guidance in the hands of Allah Allah is guides Allah says وَإِنِ اهْتَدَيْتُ If I become guided فَبِمَا يُوحِي إِلَيَّ رَبِّي It's the revelation that came to me from my Lord. Also Allah says in another ayah وَكَذَلِكَ أُحَيْنَا إِلَيْكَ رُوحًا مِنْ أَمْرِنَا مَا كُنْتَ تَدْرِي مَا الْكِتَابُ وَلَا الْإِيمَانِ وَلَكِنْ جَعَلْنَهُ نُورًا نَهْدِي بِهِ مَنْ نَشَاءُ مِنْ عِبَادِنَا وَإِنَّكَ لَا تَهْدِي إِلَى صَرَاطٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ the third thing that the aql cannot really speak about. So you just give a translation of that verse. Right Allah says, وَكَذَلِكَ أَوْحَيْنَا Like that, Muhammad, we have sent the revelation down on you. وَكَذَلِكَ أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْكَ رُوحًا مِنْ أَمْرِنَا مَا كُنْتَ تَدْرِي مَا الْكِتَابُ وَلَا الْإِيمَانُ You didn't know this. None of this. مَا كُنْتَ تَدْرِي مَا الْكِتَابُ وَلَا الْإِيمَانُ You didn't know these the detailed issues of iman. Yeah. You didn't know the details issues of the religion. You didn't. But Allah Tabarak wa Taala gave it to you. Beautiful. So this shows you that the guidance is in whose hands? Allah wa ta'ala. Mm-hmm. The aql can bring you to the general concept of guidance, but it can't bring you to the detailed matters of guidance. Last but not least, the aql cannot speak about, يعني, or the aql لا يستقل بالفص بين الناس فيما تنازعوا فيه. If two people are arguing on a matter, okay, and a third person comes, let's say these two people are very smart people, they have okay. a conflict. Okay. If a third person comes who's smart as well, mm. can he distinguish between the two of them? No, he just becomes a third problem. Yeah, just another insight to add to the original two, uh, original two. Well, yeah. Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah, in his lines of poetry, he says, "Rahimahullah Taala, لا يستقل العقل دون هداية بالوحي تأصيلا ولا تفصيلا كالطرف دون النور ليس بمدرك حتى تراه بكرة وأصيلا وإذا النبوة وإذا النبوة لم ينلك ضياؤها فالعقل لا يهديك قط السبيلا نور النبوة مثل نور الشمس للعين البصيرة فاتخذه دليلا طرق الهدى مسدودة إلا على من أم هذا الوحي والتنزيل فإذا عدلت عن الطريق تعمدا فعلم بأنك ما أردت وصولا يا طالبا درق الهدى بالعقل دون النقل لن تلقى لذاك دليلا So the person has to understand that 
the aql is like the eyesight it's like uh, other parts of your body yeah. It has restrictions and limitations And that's when you say I believe Allah and his messenger What they say hasn't got those limitations Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Speaks about the unseen As much as he can see, speak about that Which is, is seen to us Subhanahu wa ta'ala Because we have the pixel And Allah has the He has the whole jigsaw Yeah Not to mention that their intellect differs from Different person people, person. human beings, uh, yeah, right person to person. So whose insights are you going to use to understand the Muslim chain? Okay, um, let's move on to the next podcast then. So in this one, we actually went into a little bit more detail about the same group, the Sha'ara, and we looked at one of the one of the main deviations that has occurred between them and Ahlul Sunnah, and that was how to understand Allah's names and attributes. So let's play a short clip for the viewers at home to see what we discussed. And since we're going to be talking about Allah's names and attributes, we have to understand that we're not going to take any of this from anyone after the Prophet and his companions. And this the f- that's the first people we take it from. Okay, that's and, and I think that's very important that we agree on that. Al-Imam al-Shafi'i debated a man by the name of Hafs al-Fard. Now, Abdi, Abdullah ibn Abdul Hakam, he said, after he debated with him, Al-Imam al-Shafi'i was in utter disappointment and he was... And he hated ilm al-kalam. And Imam al-Shafi'i used to say from that day after that discussion, yeah. when he saw what this kind of ideology is, he used to say for a person to do a mistake. And then people just say, oh, he did a mistake. Khalas. It's just a mere mistake. It's better for him than to make a mistake. And that mistake leads to her heresy, which is ilm al-kalam according to Imam al-Shafi'i. Yani, I think we did it before, but just translate kalam like roughly. Wallahi, well, loosely. Just the truth is it's Greek philosophy. Okay. It is the, yani, it's the knowledge that was taken from Aristotle and the likes of these people. Also, by the point, by the way, I believe the whole entire Quran, there is no mutashabi. The whole Quran? There's no mutashabi in the Quran. Alif, Lam, Mim is not mutashabi. Uh, again, we're talking about word. Alif, Lam, Mim is huruf. So you don't believe a single word in the Quran. So what's Allah talking about here? Alif, Lam, Mim, we know the wisdom for why Allah wa ta'ala chose it. Ijazul Arab, to make the Arabs feel unable. But no one asks about the meaning of letters. We ask the meaning of words. So what does Allah mean in this verse what when he says there's mutashabi? What does ABC mean? Exactly. Alif, Lam, Mim. If we don't read it as Alam, we read it as Alif, Lam, Mim. They're letters. And the basic knowledge that you take in Nahaw is when he mets, when he speaks about a kalima or a kalam or the types of, he mentions, وَحَرْفٌ جَاءَ لِمَعْنًا Basic book of Ajrumiya mentions that. The huruf are two types. Huruf yeah. al-ma'ani and huruf al-mabani. So no one asks about the meaning of huruf al-mabani. No one ever says to you, what's the meaning of Alif, Ba, Ta, Ta, Jim, Ha, Fine. Ha. Yeah, but I'm, I'm, so the Quran, to ask that is, in, is incorrect. And it wasn't, but Allah affirms that there were ayat in the Quran in Mutashabi. How can you you say and say there's no mushab in the Quran. You're going against what Allah says directly. I'm saying to you, there's no word in the Quran which is mutashabi. Then you said to me, Alif, Lam, Mim. Yeah. And I said to you, a word okay. that's considered letters. So what does Allah mean in the uh, Ali Amran, ayah number seven, when he says... There's mutashabi. Yeah. Okay, the mutashabi here is nisbi, subjective. Each person has mutashabi. There might be a verse in the Quran I read and I don't know what it means. Oh. So I take that subjective verse to the verse which are muhkam. It might be mutashabi to me, but not necessarily somebody else. So can the forward say it might be mutashabi to us, but no to Allah it's not? No, no, no. But that's mean you're making it on everybody, the people. So you're saying within the creation, the yes. ulama, yeah, there no, is someone at least ha, always ha, living ha, on this ha, planet ha. that Sahih. knows. Sahih. So as you can see from that clip, it, the whole discussion on this podcast particularly revolved around an ayah in Surah Ali Imran, ayah number seven, where Allah talks about muhkam ayat and mutashabihat. And some of the asha'ala or the asha'ala themselves have actually broken up into two different sections here in terms of how to understand Allah's names and attributes. Um, one of them make ta'wil, which means that they interpret them and they give them an, another meaning. And then some of them, uh, the other part make tafwil, which they say, we don't know what these names mean. Or attributes mean was Ahlu Sunnah affirmed the apparent meaning of these names and attributes, and we had a very lengthy discussion. I think two, three hours plus uh, into that particular topic, and we went back and forth on some of the different arguments. So I refer anybody who wants to get an insight into some of those details, they can watch the main episode, inshallah. Let's move on to some of the questions that people had. Um, the first question is: Can Khabul al Ahad, which is like singular narrations, benefit us with certain knowledge? And can we use them in Aqidah? So this concept of categorizing the khabar into ahad and mutawatir, first of all, let's take a step back. This, by the way, the concept of uh, khabar and, and, and how it came to us and stuff like that is actually a science or it's a matter that's discussed in the science of hadith. Even though the usuliyin do talk about it, it shouldn't be something they talk about. It's none of the 
concern. Okay. They should be dealing with how to extract the understanding from the textual evidences mm. and how do we, you know, understand the Quran and the Sunnah. That's what Usuriyin should be dealing with. Um, whereas the Muhaddithin and the people of Hadith are the ones whose job is to bring the authentication and how it came to us, that's their job. Okay. So it's it's not meant to be for the Usuriyin to talk about it. So that's why when it comes to Usuriyin talking about these issues and the issue of Marasin and Mursa, I really don't take it from them. I, I stick to the Muhaddithin on this issue. But when I go to the issue of how do we then take the ruling out of the Quran and the Sunnah, because they deal with the Dalalatul sure. Al-Fad, which is the bulk of Usul al-Fiqh, Aam, Khas, Mutlaq, Muqayyad, Mujman, you know, they're the ones who deal with this. And that's how do I benefit from this text? Yeah. Because the definition of Usul al-Fiqh is, it's ilmun yubhathu an adillati al-ijmaliyya wa kayfiyyati al-istifadati minha wa halu al-mustafid. That's the definition of Usul al-Fiqh. Usul al-Fiqh's job is a science where you research Basically, Dalalatul Al-Fad, this is a general text. This is a specific text. This is uh, restricted. This is unrestricted. This is ambiguous. This is clear. This is abrogated. This is not abrogated. That's Usul Al-Fiqh. Right, okay. Like in the concept of how did this narration reach me? Did it reach me with in mass transmission? Did it reach me? Yeah, and a few few people narrating it. That's most muhaddithin. Is it authentic? Is it weak? Should the mursal be accepted or not? Mm. Uh, that's something that the muhaddithin but usuli and they have their they have their say in those issues, so you, it's important to know whose sure. whose job and who isn't. So, anyways, the muhaddithin mentioned in the kutub al hadith. Uh, by the way, this is not something that sahabas and they, they mentioned and they, they they were not acquainted with these mutawatir and ahad. So it's important that we understand that they said that the khabar, the news, it should be divided into two. Bi'atibari usulihi ilayna how it reached us, and bi'atibari man usnida ilayhi. And in terms of who is it being attributed to? So they said, in, let me mention the second one. Who is it being attributed to? It's either Allah, then it's called Hadith Qudsi. Mm-hmm. It's the Prophet, it's called Marfu'ah. It's, it's attributed to the Sahabi, it's called Mawquf. It's attributed to the Tabi'i, it's called Maqtu'ah. Simple as. Okay. Then they go to the second type, the first type I mentioned, which is, بِعْتِبَارِ وُصُولِهِ إِلَيْنَا How did this narration reach us? They, they divided that into two. They said that it's either Mutawatir or it's Ahad. Now, mutawatir, it's mass transmission. It's two types. It's lafzi and ma'nawi. In terms of its wording, mm-hmm. it's mutawatir. Like the hadith, man kathab aliyya muta'amidan falyataba wa maqadahu min anar. This is mass transmission, they said. Mass transmission is multitude narration. The people who narrated it and mentioned it are large in number. So they they basically define it as ma rawahu Jam'un, uh, a large people narrated and jam'in uh, from a large number of people yastahilu fil adati tawatu'uhum ala al-kadibi where they normally these people cannot all agree on this lie it's just it, not possible min awali sanadi ila akhirih from the beginning of the chain until the ending okay and then they said ahad is you know basically masi wal mutawatir it's anything other than the mass transmission okay and then they broke the mutawatir or the ahad into uh, two types the type that we want to focus on is in terms of his turuq. And then, then they say this is three types. Mashur, Aziz, and Gharib. Okay. These three are basically mutawatir. Uh, sorry, uh, Ahad. The Mashur is Ahad. Aziz is Ahad. And Gharib is Ahad. Some of the scholars like Abu, Hak- Abu Abdullah Hakim and Saburi fell into a shortcoming where he thought that Bukhari's ahadith are all of them are Aziz. And Amir San'ani refuted him. He said, وَلَيْسَ شَرْطَ لِلْسَحِيحِ فَعَلَمِي وَقَدْ رُومِي مَنْ قَالَ بِالتَّوَهُمِي عَلَى كُلِّ حال. The concept and this idea that we hear people saying, I will take a hadith if it's mutawatir and I'll take it on board and I, it's fine. I like it. It's mutawatir. I'll accept it. But I won't accept it if it's ahad. This is a statement which you don't find in the early three noble generations saying this. Did, you know, earlier in, in that discussion, you mentioned the mas'ala that Abu Bakr, as-Siddiq, radiallahu anhu, he came to the people and he didn't yeah. he didn't know the answer. And he asked someone in uh, Sahabi, he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then he said, does anybody support you in this? Yes. How do we reconcile that with this, with what you're saying now? Even another hadith that they, you can say, for example, hadith of Dhul Yadain, when the Prophet prayed the salah and he finished, and then they said, Ya Rasulullah, is, uh, is the salah shortened or mm. did you fa- did you forget? Or is the salah shortened? It's one of the two. And he said, neither. Hmm. And then he said, Ya Rasulullah. The Uliya stood up, he said, Ya Rasulullah, you prayed less. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, who agreed, like, huh. he looked for anybody else to affirm yeah, the statement. There's, there's other narrations like this as well. This is different from the concept of saying, I won't accept it unless it comes from more than one. Then someone, does that make sense? The difference hmm. between, 
Abu Bakr requesting for someone else Does it oh. mean he wouldn't have accepted it If I it only came from one person These people are saying If it comes to me from one person I, won't, I will not accept it How reliable this person is By the way The ahad itself Is not all of the same level Aslan the hadith, the hadith which are had that are narrated, narrated in Bukhari and Muslim, they call it al muhtafu bil qara'in. The ahad in Bukhari and Muslim are not like a normal ahad because Bukhari and Muslim talaqatul ummah bil qabul. The ummah unanimously agreed upon these two books, mm-hmm. so the ahads in it is unanimously agreed upon. Ah, I see. I see. Are you with me? Yeah. Um. So, what about the hadith which are had narrated from Musalsal bil Aima, like Al Imam? Uh, Ahmed narrated it from Shafi'i Shafi'i narrated from Malik Malik narrated from Nafi' Nafi' narrated from Ibn Umar Ibn Umar narrated from the Prophet Malik Nafi' and Ibn Umar na is asahu al-asanid even that do imsakuna an hukmina ala salad bi annahu asahu mutlaqan wa qad khada bihi qawmun faqila Malikun an Nafi'in bima rawahu anhu al-nasiku sahib uh, uh, Imam al-Iraqi he says it in his mustalah al-hadith kitab al-fiyah in his al-fiyah it's like a golden chain the golden chain that's a golden chain and Imam Bukhari considered Malik and Nafi and Ibn Umar to be the Asahul Asani, the best, the most authentic chain. So we are here we have Ahmed narrating from Shafi'i, Shafi'i narrated from Malik, Malik narrating from Ibn Umar. Uh, sorry, Malik narrated from Nafi, Nafi narrated from Ibn Umar, Ibn Umar narrating from the Prophet. Here we have Ahmed who is a beast and a great scholar in knowledge. Jabalun Asham, Ahmed, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, La Tushakulahu Ghubar. Imam Imam Da Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah ta'ala Muhammad ibn Idris al-Shafi'i the great isiqa imam then we have al-Imam Abu Abdullah Malik ibn Anas rahimahullah ta'ala you know Imam Dar al-Hijrah these three is that a had can be no more no it's muhtafun bil qara'in anyways scholars have transmitted ijma' that we have to take that ahad hadiths in all matters of the religion all sciences all fields yeah because when Allah says in the Quran Allah Rasul, obey Allah and his messenger mm. why the, yani, why is there no taqsis only when there is mutawatir except obey the prophet mm. there's none of that Allah says you and I both agree that this is authentic the prophet did say this and you're saying, I'm still not going to take it because, you know, you, you feed the one, it benefits speculations. I mean, what I want you to understand is whether it, feed, it benefits us, speculation and doubt, or whether it benefits us certainty, taking it is obligatory. Mm. We're not going to lie and say, if a hundred people tell me something and one, one person reliable tells me something, mm. it's not going to be the yeah, same. Yeah, we yeah. can't blind ourselves. And a hundred people are stronger, right? Yeah. But that doesn't mean I I, I don't know. I, this person, I can't can't doubt him. If he's he never, says something and these guys don't oppose it, he yeah. says something, doesn't mean he's lying. He's lying, yeah. Just, so there's no reason for me not yeah. to. Half of the Taala, he says, وَقَدْ شَاعَ فَاشِيرَ عَمَلُ الصَّحَابَةِ وَالتَّابِعِينَ بِخَبَرِ الْوَاحِدِ مِنْ غَيْرِ نَكِيرٍ فَاقْتَضَ الْإِتِفَاقُ مِنْهُمْ عَلَى الْقَبُولِ فَتْحُ الْبَارِ Half of the Hajar says that. He transmitted his ma' the Sahabas and Tabi'een. They all accepted the Khabar al ahad the one person's transmission. Ibn Abi Al-Izz Al-Hanafi in the Sharh of Aqid Al-Tahawiyah, he says, وَخَبَرُ الْوَاحِدِ إِذَا تَلَقَّتُ الْأُمَّةُ بِالْقَبُولِ عَمَلًا بِهِ وَتَصْدِيقًا لَهُ يُفِيدُ الْعِلْمَ الْيَقِينِ عند جماهير الأمة وهو أحد قسمين المتواتري ولم يكن بين السلف الأمة في ذلك نزاع. There's no dispute in this issue. The ones that are in Bukhari and Muslim are other than that. ولذلك an Imam Al-Bukhari, he said, I had Al-Humaydi, Abdullah ibn Zubayrin, saying, Kuntu عند Shafi'i, I was with an Imam Al-Shafi'i, Muhammad Idris Al-Shafi'i. فأتاه رجل, a man came up to him, asked him a question, and then he said, قضى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم كذا وكذا. The person said to Imam Al-Shafi'i, the messenger, he judged this, this, this issue in the matter. Uh, فقال, uh, فقال uh, الرجل الشافعي, the man, he said to an Imam Al-Shafi'i, رحمه الله تعالى, ما تقول أنت? What do you say about this issue now? And then Imam Shafi'i said, Subhanallah, Tarani fi kalisa, Tarani fi bay'ah, Tarani ala wasati zunnar. Do you see me uh, between fires? Am I Zoroastrian? Hmm. Am I in the church? Subhanallah. Aqulu qada Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kada wa kada. Wa anta taqulu li maada maada taqulu. You are telling me Allah and his messenger judge this issue. Am I the messenger judge this issue? And then you say to him, what do you think? What do you think? Of course, I'm going to take what the Prophet said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ibn, uh, uh, Imam Ibn Qayyim mentions in the kitab, Muqtasar Sabah, Yaqul Mursala, Ala Al-Jahmeet Wal-Mu'attila. And also, uh, Imam 
الذهبي مانشستر يصير على من وبلاه الامام الشافعي ايفن سيد اف يو ايفر سي مي ريجكت ا حديث اوف ذا بروفيت صلى الله عليه وسلم صحيح اوثنتيك ان اي دونت تيك ان اي ريجكت ات ان اي ليف ات اي يعني اول اوف يو بير ويتنس ان اي هاف لوست ماي مايند سمثينج از نوت رايت ويت مي اولسو الامام احمد بن حنبل هي سيد وكل ما روي عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم ايفريثينج ذات بين ترانسميتد فروم ذا بروفيت صلى الله عليه وسلم باسناد جيد اقررناه if a hadith comes to us from the prophet sallallahu alaihi which is sahih aqrarna bihi we will affirm it wa idha lam nuqirra bima jaa an an-nabi sallallahu alaihi if we don't affirm that which has come to us from the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam wa dafa'nahu wa radadna ala allah and we reject it and we turn it back uh, then that means we will reject what wa radadna ala allah amrahu it will mean that we will reject allah tabarak wa ta'ala's commandments mm. and then he recited the ayah wa ma atakum ar-rasul fa khudhu wa ma nahakum anhu fa antahu yeah So here we find that Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal all he conditioned was what? Authenticity. As long as it's authentically transmitted from the Prophet ﷺ. Ibn Taymiyyah said, As-Sunnah idha thabatat. If the Sunnah has been affirmed, فَإِنَّ الْمُسْلِمِينَ كُلُّهُمْ مُتَّفِقُونَ عَلَى وُجُوبِ تِبَعِهَا All of the Muslims are unanimously in agreement that it has to be followed and adhered to. So as long as the hadith is authentic, regardless, regardless of whether it's mutawatir or ahad, we take it and what i want people to really understand is that the rejectors of the hadith are two type mm. there are people who reject the hadith in its totality and they're the ones who falsely call themselves qur'aniyuna and the quran is free from him, from them the way that the wolf was free from the flesh of the son of yaqub yusuf alayhi salam and he was alive when they said that yusuf was eaten mm. by the wolf right mm, yeah. these people are also free from the quran as they attribute it to themselves now pay attention here The, those we call them munkiri sunnah the rejectors of the sunnah yeah. uh, I mean, the rejectors of the hadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam those ones are one type of rejectors of hadith who there's another reject all of the hadith in totality, in its totality. Okay. and we have another group of people who are they have they come with a rad which is juzi they partially reject the hadith which is khabar al-ahad mm. and this is a stepping stone to the complete and ultimate yeah. rejection of hadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam it's very dangerous very very dangerous, very, very dangerous. Okay, the last question I have for you on this particular podcast, and we had a number of questions around this about the number of uh, Ash'ari scholars, and one name kept coming up over and over again. Why do you read Imam Nawawi's books if he was a deviant? Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah are munsifuna. We're just when it comes to rulings that we place upon people. May Allah make us from Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Um, the rulings that are placed on people is two types: a mistake a person falls into, and an innovation that makes a, renders a person an innovator. An Imam and Nawawi, great Imam, noble Imam, mukhlis, sincere individual, illustrious, rahimahullah. The Ummah have agreed upon his nobility and his righteousness. Imam and Nawawi is not ma'asum. I don't think anyone should think that he's not infallible from mistakes. ولا ابن تيمية ولا الذهبي ولا ابن عبد الوهاب ولا ابن باز ولا الفوزان. Nobody is free from mistakes. Every single person, they're judged based on the Quran and the Sunnah. Mm-hmm. If they get it right, it's accepted from them. If they get it wrong, it's rejected. The one whose statement is taken unrestrictedly is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Imam Malik, he said, كُلُّ يُؤْخَذُ مِنْ قَوْلِهِ وَيُرَدْ إِلَىٰ صَحِبَ هَذَا الْقَبْرِ So it makes no sense to me that some people, when Nawawi is criticized, or Ibn Hajar is criticized, or Ibn Taymiyyah is criticized, or Muhammad Ibn Abdul Hajj is criticized, they get frustrated and angry. These great Imams, they themselves said it and mentioned That our statements, it's not the final ultimate goal. It's not the final ultimate truth. Our statements, take it. Scale it. Look at it. If it goes in line with the Quran and Sunnah, take it. If not, smack it against the wall. So Al Imam al-Nawi is from those great scholars whose works we admire, we benefit from it. Without it, yani, many of us wouldn't have an understanding of the religion properly. He's got great books. He's a faqih shafi'i. His Kitab al-Minhaj is one of the greatest books You know, sometimes if you look at Islamic history, you find that the the, the dowry of a woman would be Kitab al Minhaj. That the man who, not just by the way, giving the book to her, it would actually be he teach her the Kitab wow. and educate her. This is this is not a joke. He sharh of Sahih Muslim, يعني لا يستغني منه طالب علم. A student of knowledge cannot be without it. ولا العالم a scholar can't even be without it. It's a big Kitab. It's a great, يعني big book. Now we wrote, رحمه الله تعالى. مع ذلك Some of his statements in Allah's names and attributes are wrong. It goes against the madhab of Salaf. Okay, which I believe sincerely that Al Imam and Nawawi, rahimahullah, if he was alive today and he was with us today and he came across those mistakes and he was brought to his attention and he looked at it and it was brought to him like that, I believe Nawawi would go back from his mistakes because he's a sincere person, 
a person who wanted to get, who wanted to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who wanted to distance himself from mistakes and errors. That's what he was. That's what mm-hmm. he's known for. Rahimahullah, rahmatan wasi'a. But what I do not accept and I don't agree with, whoever says it, whoever says it, that an Imam al-Nawi is an Ash'ari. I don't care who says that. An Imam al-Nawi is not an Ash'ari. Yes, he did agree with Ash'ari on some issues. Mm. Like to say he's an Ash'ari means that he, he's upon the foundations of the Ash'ari. Right, yeah. Like an Imam al-Nawi does not reject a single hadith. Mm. That's one of the fundamental beliefs of the Ash'ari. Nawi rahimahullah accepts single narrations in hadiths. Okay? Look at his explanation of Sahih Muslim. An Imam al-Nawi rahimahullah ta'ala, an Imam al-Nawi says, Giving precedence to the aql over the naql. Never. Never. Lakin, with that being said, Al Imam al Nawawiyu has fallen into mistakes in the religion. Hmm. Errors and mistakes. They are pointed out, they're mentioned to the people. That's the summary of what. Just, just, because, you, just because you agree with a group on one thing doesn't mean you agree with them on everything. No, it doesn't. Ibn Taymiyyah. Some of his views we criticize it. We say this view of Mutaim is wrong. Mm-hmm. Ah, we don't accept it. We say to Muhammad Abdul Hab, some of his views here, no, we don't agree with it. So Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Abdul Wahab, Ibn Hajar al Asqalani, Bayhaqi, great scholars of Al Islam who have seen from all through Islam history, we look at their statements fairly. Also, recently I, I've been I mentioned even in my last podcast, and I've looked deeply into it. That there's a risala that came out It's called Juz'un Fihi Dhikru I'tiqad al-salif al-hurufi wal-aswat And this is attributed to Al-Imam al-Nawi Rahimahullah wa ta'ala Okay uh, The tahqiq of the kitab is Abu al-Fadl Ahmad ibn Ali al-Dimyati When I look deep into this issue Is this kitab actually truly attributed to Al-Imam al-Nawi hmm. I came to the conclusion that this is not his works Okay Even though I came across Sheikh Salih ibn Abdullah ibn Hamad al-Usaymi Saying that it is Al-Imam al-Nawi's book But by kulli insaf when I looked into it, I checked the you know, manuscripts and everything. Uh, and I have the manuscript. Uh, I checked it and I verified it. I, I come to the conclusion that this kitab attributed to half of Nawawiyu, rahimahullah ta'ala, is null and void. There are many reasons when you look at it. First of all, the muhaqqiq of the kitab who did the tahqiq, uh, Abu al-Fadl al-Dimyati, who did uh, Ahmed ibn Ali al-Dimyati, who did the tahqiq of the kitab, did not mention in any way, shape or form uh, the attribution of the uh, Risala to the author himself mm. In the way that the scholars of Ilmul Tahqiq And the ulama who do Tahqiqat al-Qutub The way they attribute it to There's a tariqah There's a uslub There's a manhaj When you attribute a book to the author He didn't do it accurately and That's number one The second one is The makhtut is unknown Its attribution uh, the copy, the, the makhtout that he used is majhul al-nisbah. It's unknown. Um, last but not least, um, every single body who wrote about the Imam al nawis biography, yeah. everybody I looked at, in every places I went back to, to check the biography of Imam al nawi rahimahullah ta'ala, not one person ever mentioned this particular, it just, no one mentioned it. That the Imam al nawi rahimahullah ta'ala wrote this. No one ever mentioned it. And this is an aqidah related book. Mm. They never mention it. They mention other ah, works of his. Okay. So this is a book that Sheikh Salih Al-Saymi said that Imam Nawi repented from here or changed his position. He changed his position. Oh, his position. But you're being just and fair and saying you've looked into this and you don't believe this no, book is his. I don't believe it. It okay. would be good. It would be, it would be a something praiseworthy to be honest. Yeah. And it would be good, yani, uh, uh, a good thing for us to say that half of Nawawi Rahimahullah and Imam Nawawi Rahimahullah Ta'ala <coughs> And Imam Nawawi rahimahullah ta'ala came back from this issue and this is a risala for it. Mm. But what we know is that Imam Nawawi did, okay. did, did not seem to come back from it. This was his belief. This is his view. Rahimahullah. Also, I did mention something in my po- podcast previously. Ibn Attar, mm. Uddin al- Ibn Attar, who is a student of Imam Nawawi, one of the greatest students, the pro- most profound, has an i'tiqad book. Okay. When I was speaking about it, I kind of spoke about it as though it was the Mu'taqad al sunnah in everything he was saying. But even him, he still has in him. Okay. He still has in, uh, um, He still has, when he affirms Allah's subhanahu wa ta'ala's names and attributes, he does tafwid in it. Okay. Because I went back to my notes. Hmm. That, was also, that was also a slip of the tongue from okay. the podcast as okay. well. Jazakallah khair for clarifying. Yeah.
Let's move on to the next podcast, inshallah. We then went on to an issue of music and whether that was permissible or not in Islam. Let's play a brief video just to give the viewers a reminder of the kind of things that we discussed. Cool. So I've looked into the books of the ulama, what they've said about al-ghina, for example, that's the term. Al-ghina means singing. Al-ghina, the ulama, when I looked at their categorization or their definition of the word, I found that their categorization revolves around three. These types are, of course, the Quran has shown it and the Sunnah and also the istilah uh, al-ulama the usage of the scholars and other than them inshallah ta'ala so okay I know, I know I know I don't want to get too deep into discussion because I've also got some points I want to contribute but I just want to finish this foundation okay so you, you split up music into uh, singing into three types yes. first one being permissible second one being impermissible and the third one is when people actually take the impermissible form and they use it in an attempt to get closer to Allah yes. it's like an innovation in the religion so the evidences that support me are the Quran the Sunnah of the Prophet والسلام, and the Ijma. In Surah Al-Luqman, Allah Ta'ala says that from amongst the people, those who buy lahu al-hadith. Okay. Now, we have to, now we've got an ayah. Yeah. When an ayah comes up like that, what we have to do is we have to say, okay, what did the early imams of Islam say about this? Fine, okay. The people, we take it back to other companions, number one. Okay. Did the Sahabas comment on this verse? We have three noble companions, three, yani not just companions, but real knowledgeable imams and ulama of the Sahabas commenting on this verse. We have Ibn Mas'ud who didn't just say lahu al-hadith, he means ghina. He actually swore by Allah that this is music. The Prophet sallallahu there has come from him 14 evidences and 14 hadiths that say it's haram. Music, clearly mentioned Mu- music. Music, 14 hadiths. First one is the most famous hadith of Imam al-Bukhari. لا يكون أن there will be in, من أمتي from my ummah قوم a people يستحلون they will permit for themselves الحرى which is zina Hira means al-farj mm-hmm. And al-harir means silk Wal-khamra and alcohol Wal-ma'azif and music Okay, now you're going into an issue of ijma' sukuti yeah. You're saying that there's an ijma' upon the companions Because this statement was made and nobody opposed it We have no one opposing it Wallahi, when you look at the salaf What they were saying about music Like Qur'an al-shaytan And ruqyat al-shaytan And innaha yunbitu fil qalbi al-nifaq Yeah, it brings hypocrisy in the heart yani, You're saying they don't even know the music Where, where we're seeing today Wallahi, this is the way that shaitan gets to a person. And it's been from the deceptions of shaitan. I found my personally that many people who've been struggling with sins, who've been yeah, and falling into zina, who yeah, and they, it's through music. Music, killing, zina, all of it, it makes it f- easy. Specifically, the lyrics they use, it makes it people. Also, this concept of depression and anxieties, this is, it gives you it. A lot of people, they connect themselves to it. I know people who, who told me that I listen to when I'm sad, this music. Mm. And when I'm happy, I listen to this music. And when I'm reading, I, I, when I'm walking, I do. I listen to this music. And when I do this, I'm, and then what happens to them is when they strip themselves from the music, they're dark. They're, mm. feel, they're feeling hurt and heartbroken. Anyone who has the Quran and has Muhammad Khalil al-Husari and Manshawi, Wallahi, I don't, yani, subhanallah, haqiqatan, Muhammad Khalil al-Husari and Manshawi and these great imams of the Quran, when you have them, why would you ever want to listen to it or somebody else? Or why would you want to listen to music? La shak? Okay, this was an interesting one for me. I remember when you first suggested the topic, and this was actually most of the times I actually suggest the topic for the hot seat, but this is one that you came up with. And I kind of looked at you and said, yeah, we can, we can do like a 30, 45 minute discussion. You know, we've had a couple of longer episodes. I didn't even realize this was a discussion until I really looked into it. Um, and it shouldn't be a discussion. It shouldn't at all. And you made that very clear on the podcast itself. You brought many, many ayat from the Quran uh, and not your understanding of those ayat, but the understanding of the companions about what certain words mean. You then brought many, many evidences from the Sunnah. I think the, the strongest one being the fact that music was actually categorized with things like alcohol, zina, and uh, silk for men, which are clearly haram, and everybody will agree they're haram. And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said there will be a time where people from my ummah will make these things halal. And then finally, you even bought ijma as if the Quran and the Sunnah alone aren't enough. You bought ijma from thirty different scholars that clearly and categorically said music is haram. You did, to be fair, at the start of the podcast, and again, I do recommend, like I have been doing throughout this discussion. Anybody who wants to get a more detailed view, go to the main episode because the summary they've just seen is is exactly that. It's a very brief summary. You did categorize music into three different types, the permissible music, 
the impermissible music and music where people use it to get closer to Allah, which of course is an innovation in the religion and therefore by default that's also impermissible. Um, yeah, I, I really didn't realize that there was even this discussion going on, um, but I looked into, and I, I, we never mentioned names on, on the hot seat, but there's certain people that I normally go to who talk about these things and they would bring their statements forward try to bring their evidences forward. Even in the Arab world, it's quite popular. Not, I wouldn't say quite popular, but there are some individuals who try and push the view that music is permissible. Um, but I think the job that you did really, and you spoke about Ijma' al-Sukuti and Dalalatul Iqtiran and all of these terms that anybody who wants to benefit from, they can go to the main episodes. Um, anything that you'd like to contribute or should we go straight into the questions? Go to Insha'Allah. Insha okay. The first question I have is, what is the ruling on Nasheed's? You see, the problem with the nasheeds nowadays is that it's it's become musical instruments are being used inside it, and they call it nasheeds. That's the first one, and that we already spoke about in the podcast of music. If yeah. it's got musical instruments, it falls under prohibited. It becomes a music, which we already spoke about. The second part is that it is the nasheeda. The, the, sorry, the nasheed is called nasheed al-Islami, hmm. where the person. Um, an Ashid al Islamiyah, which basically the person is trying to get closer to Allah by it. And this becomes an innovation. It's taking a path and a tariqah where the person is trying to get closer to Allah by it, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, we're left with if the person is using their voice yeah. in a way that's beautiful, but it's not cutting it up in a way that it's, you know, they're not following a rhythm. Okay. This, inshallah, we, we can't say it's haram uh, unless the person is doing this. And it's become their day dinner, the way they, they, they do things, always just doing this. And it's taken away from their remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's getting it's getting in the way of the recitation of the Quran and etc. That makes it haram, for example. Also, if the person is using their mouth, like in it is Tushbihu Sawt al Alat al Musiqiya, but it re resembles the music instruments. Yeah, that's very common, yeah. Like for example, beatboxing, for example. Mm -hmm. Or even when you hear it, somebody in the back is just making noise yeah. that uh, is called an acapella. Acapella, I think, is when there's no background noise at all. It's just it's just a person either singing or talking. Yeah. Um, but I think it's very common because a lot of people, they have these nasheeds, which they sound just like music, but they'll say a message at the start, no musical instruments were used or something yeah. like that. Yeah. This is kind of what you're talking about, whether your voice is used, but it sounds very, very similar to music. But d d some people, they get... They take it, they put it in the computer. It's their voice like him. Ah, okay. And then there are no instruments that was used. But the voice gets put... Auto-tune. Auto-tune, Auto -tune, right? Yeah, yeah that's yeah. what you're talking about, yeah. So all of this, la shaka wa it's musical instruments. Mm. It's all musical instruments. Technology is evolved, correct? Those types are not allowed. And uh, when you look at the kalam of the ulama, you realize that their conditioning of it is, number one, um, there is nothing haram in your voc in your vocabulary that you're using the second one is there isn't no musical instrument number three is it you're not your mouth and your sound that's coming out of your mouth doesn't emit doesn't, doesn't resemble mm. the musical instruments number four is it shouldn't be your norms every time this is who you are as some of them call themselves and sheet artists this is not permissible as well because it takes you away from the recitation of the Quran, calling the people to Allah wa Taala, yani good, righteous actions. Number five is it shouldn't be women who are standing in front of men who are reading it. Women's voices, for example, shouldn't be that. Um, also, the passage should stay away from words which are raqiqa, yani words which are yani fitna for the people, um, which kind of resembles the fusaq, yani what the, the what kind of ways that they talk. The person also should stay away from pictures that some people put in in front of their their cassettes and things like that, which cause mm. any muharramat and things okay, like that. Yeah. Yani, scholars mention those shurut, those conditions, which you can take from the kalam of the ulama. If it's, all of those are not there, then and it's also not trying to get closer to Allah by it, mm -hmm. then inshallah ta'ala it should it should because it can't be a form of da'wah. Okay. The means of da'wah, we already spoke about it. It's tawqifiyah. It's, it's closed. You can't do da'wah through anashid. Okay. And that's why a lot of people call it anashid al-islamiyah. They call it al-islamiyah because they want to get closer to Allah. No, no, we don't believe you get closer to Allah by doing this. Okay, barakallah fikum. Um, 
The next question is, what about music? And this is, again, something that's very popular, unfortunately. What about music in the background of documentaries or nature shows or what's, again, quite common? A YouTube tutorial will have music in the background. So the listener or the watcher is not intending to listen to music. They're trying to get the benefit of the tutorial or the documentary, but there happens to be music in the background. I mean, remember when you spoke about the word sama, uh, hearing something, and istima. Yeah, I do, yeah. We mentioned that Ibn Taymiyyah used that concept. You're walking somewhere and there's music playing in the mm -hmm. background, but you're just talking to someone. You can't really hear it. Your aim is not to listen to the music. You're, 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 talk, you're listening to the, your friend's conversation. You don't even know this is playing. Yeah. That, you're not going to be held account for it. Okay. And the deen is to go and not stay there. Mm -hmm. But you're not going to be held account because you're not listening. Okay, You can yeah. only listen to when you stop the conversation with your friend and you listen to it. And at times we're like that. We walk into a place, we're just preoccupied with other things in mm -hmm. our minds. We're on the phone. Yeah, and you, we don't even know this place music yeah. until somebody sometimes points it out and says, ah, you do know where it was music, Allah. Then you realize yeah. it. Yeah. That one we said already, there's, there's no sin on you. Okay. Like in documentary that has the music, you have to actually listen to the music. Because you're trying to listen to the words of the documentary, so you're actually using your ear to, you're actually listening. Yeah, yeah I see what so you're the, that's different to being in a restaurant where you're talking or you're eating, and the objective is not listening, you know. it's just talking and eating. Okay, I'm with you. Correct. So that is not permissible. It's not permissible okay. for a person to listen to a documentary that has music in it. Man. Okay. Uh, the next question is uh, you mentioned on the podcast that even reciting the Quran in an overly melodious tone is, is not permissible. A lot of people are really kind of, they want some clarification on this point. Um, you know, to what extent, like, what do you mean by an extremely melodious tone? And how do you reconcile this with a hadith that encourages us to recite the Quran beautifully? You see, the hadith that you're referring to is the hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Laysa minna man lam He's not from amongst us, the one who does not beautify his voice with the Quran. So what we have to understand is, there are two types when it comes to reciting the Quran. There are people who recite the Quran, this is who he is. He's got a beautiful voice. When he recites it, penetrates the hearts. And it's just natural. He hasn't studied any science for this. He hasn't gone to any musical school. Mm. Uh, he hasn't. He's naturally a beautiful reciter. When he recites the Quran, it's just a beautiful يعني, recitation. It's beautiful when you hear it. It penetrates the hearts. That is permissible. And that definitely goes under the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam لَيْسَ مِنَّا مَنْ لَمْ يَتَغَنَّ بِالْقُرْآنِ All natural There's a second type which we find Which is that the person His recitation of the Qur'an Or his reading of the Qur'an Is in accordance to musical يعني, rhythms and beats It's in line with that Okay, okay. And um, for you to actually So they say when you're talking about adab for example You need to read it like this Oh. When you come to Jannah, read it like this. It's like a science or something. Yeah, you know, it's 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 it's, it's, it's a there's a particular structure, science yeah. structure behind it, and it's actually called maqamat. Okay, you go and you study it and you learn it, and uh, many of the big Qur'an that you see actually did study this. Abdul Basit, Abdul Samad, and Husari even as well. All yeah. of them they study this. They go and they study this. So when they recite, Husari, I heard after that he repented and he left all of this. So it's not permissible. This is qawaid um, principles that's taken from music. Okay? And it's prohibited and it's haram and a person should stay away from it. And great scholars have spoken about this. Great imams of our time, uh, the qurra of this time even, who يعني, have given fatwas, the impermissibility. Sheikh Abd Aziz Mubaz gave a fatwa on that issue. Um, and now we even have it, subhanAllah, some people who use yeah, and they computerize their recitation now. Mm -hmm. The Quran, the yeah. Quran one gets, so it goes under, and it gets, and if the voice has been crisp and it's just been cleansed from any, you know, your lips and everything, that's yeah. fine. But this one's auto tune and in an wa inna rajul. So this is not permissible and it's not allowed. And a person should fear Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, uh, not to play with the book of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala in that way. The last question I have on the music podcast. Regarding the issue of, of ijma' al sukuti, and that is basically when like uh, there's a view that is held by a companion, for example, and it's become so prevalent and it's been so widespread across a number of different people, a number of different generations, and nobody held a view other than it. Nobody affirmed it verbally, but nobody held a view other than it. It's ijma' al sukuti, and that is the delil. You know, there, there's, we discussed that on the podcast. Um, the question is asking: Are there not reports from companions such as Abdullah ibn Zubair? 
and Hassan ibn Thabit listening to music. Hassan ibn Thabit ibn. Yeah. Uh, Abdullah ibn Zubair radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, Imam al-Haramain and Ibn Abi Dam uh, both transmitted that that Abdullah ibn uh, Zubair for example, he had jawarin awad, uh, awadat uh, that he had slave girls that used to re- read for him. Ibn Umar entered onto him and he saw this and he had musical instrument and stuff like that. And he said to him, Ya Hada, Hada, Ya Sahibu Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This, first of all, mm. just to simplify it for the people, where is the chain for it? Al Isnadu min Adina wa Lawl Isnadu la Qala man Shaa man Shaa. Where is the chain for this? Where is the Senate that Abdullah ibn Zubair, radiyallahu taala? Plus, Abdullah ibn Umar's statement is regarding music is well known. It's established, radiyallahu taala anhu. That's one. Okay. So there's no chain for that one. Um, as for Hassan ibn Thabit, radiyallahu taala anhu. Then um, the narration, when I saw it, I looked at it and I yani, checked it out. It mentions in the chain of Hassan Mithabit's one, it mentions The ta'bir of the Sahabi was, Rukhsa was given to us for lahu fil a'rasi in the weddings. So we already spoke about in weddings and when somebody's coming back from a journey and yani, for people to sing for him and stuff like that, we said, which falls into the permissible type of We spoke about yeah. it But here the point that really touched me Which is that The ta'abir of the sahabi Where he used Rukhisa lana mm-hmm. Rukhisa was given to us And this term Rukhisa lana If you look at the kalam of the usuliyin The ulama usul al-fiqh Like for example Al-faqih Abu Muhammad Al-dishtiyu al He says the word An-nahyu an al In his kitab uh, In his kitab He's got a kitab called An-nahyu an al It's called An-nahyu an al wa sama naam he mentions it, he says, قَوْلُكَ رُخِّسَ فِي الْغِنَى فِي الْعُرْسِ It means دَلِيلٌ عَلَى تَحْرِيمِ الْغِنَى فِي الْأَصْلِ ثُمَّ جَاءَتِ الرُخْصَةُ فِي الْعُرْسِ لِمَعْنَى لَا تَعْقِلُهُ وَلَا تُمَيِّزُهُ So the word رُخِّسَ لَنَا, it was made, رُخْصَ was given to us. He says it shows that it was haram before and now رُخْصَ was given. Mm. Al-Ghazali in his kitab Al-Mustasfa, the first volume, 97, no, 98, he says ما أباحه في الأصل من الأكل والشرب لا يسمى رخصة ويسمى تناوله الميتة رخصة He says that the, what Allah permitted like eating and drinking yeah. you can't use رخصة for that ويسمى تناول الميتة but eating dead corpse when you have to eat it because you're about to uh-huh. die or you're fearing death he says you can use رخصة for that Something that was originally حرام أي نعم ابن حزم in his كتاب الإحكام he mentions لا تكون لفظة الرخصة إلا عن شيء تقدم التحذير منه. يعني الرخصة can only be used yeah. for something that you were you, you, that was you were like the ruling changes. أي نعم you prohibition نعم. Yeah. So actually that evidence that they're trying to bring towards you actually turns back on themselves mm-hmm. because of the wording that was yeah. used. Okay. Um, let's move on to the next podcast. Um, this was when we spoke about the issue of niqab and whether that was obligatory or not. Let's play a short clip to remind the viewers what we spoke about. The differences here are not about whether she can wear tight clothing or not. The difference here amongst the scholars is the niqab, is it obligatory or, or is it not? I strongly hold a, an opinion after research, after looking into the issue. I sincerely believe that it, the woman should cover her face. It's, a, it's an obligation. She must. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَإِذَا سَأَلْتُمُوهُنَّ مَتَاعًا فَاسْأَلُوهُنَّ مِنْ وَرَاءِ حِجَابٍ ذَلِكُمْ أَطْهَرُ لِقُلُوبِكُمْ وَقُلُوبِهِنْ This ayah is in Surah Al-Ahzab, ayah 53. Allah tabarak wa ta'ala, he says, when you ask these women about a matter, فَاسْأَلُوهُنَّ أَسْتَ مِنْ وَرَاءِ حِجَابٍ from behind a veil. Verily, this is a purification for their hearts and the hearts of uh, the men. Now this ayah, so the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where he says, يَا إِيُوَ النَّبِيُ قُلِّ أَزْوَاجِكَ وَبَنَاتِكَ وَنِسَاءِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ فَسَيْ to your wives and your daughters and the believing women that you place over yourselves your jilbabs. And this is of course going to be a means and a way for the woman not to be harmed, right? Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala and may Allah be pleased with him. He said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he commanded the believing women that if they leave their houses for a reason, you atina wujuhahunna that they cover their faces from above their heads with the jilbab. Now, this is a very powerful point that I want inshallah ta'ala to be taken on board. Qawlu ta'ala wal qawaidu bin al-nisa illa ti la yarduna nikahan falays alayhi na junahun an yadana thiyabahunna ghayra mutabarrijatin bi zina. This ayah is Surah Al-Nur, ayah 60. Ibn Jarir al-Tabari, he mentions in tafsir of this ayah, he says, this woman, she cannot have no children anymore because of min al-kibari, because she's aged. This woman, Allah says, There's no harm upon this woman, 
Thiab, who know that they take off their thiab. You are in trouble if you say this is not the niqab and the gloves. Do you mean that she's going to take off her clothes? The first hadith I'm going to bring is probably the most clear and the most direct of them. Okay. And this is the hadith of Aisha and the son of Abi Dawood. Asma bint Abi Bakr, the daughter of Aisha's radiallahu anha sister, came in front of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he corrected her dress. He said, Oh Asma, when a woman reaches the age of menstruation, it does not suit her that she displays her parts of body except this and this. And when he said except this, he pointed to his face and in this, he pointed to his hands. This is a clear cut statement. Mm -hmm. Unlike some of the, you know, quotes that you bought in the ayat and the understanding of this and that, this is a clear cut statement from the messenger himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that the woman can leave the face and the hands uncovered. The hadith of the woman at the Eid Salah and her cheek being shown. So this is the majority of hellfire will be taken by women. We narrated this hadith again? No, it's well. Bukhari and Muslim, right? Maybe Bukhari and Muslim. Hadith Jabir, right? Yeah. Why are all those narrations only Hajj, marriage, you know, all situations mm. like, which we already mentioned. I think this was the first time that we did a, a, a topic on the hot seat that where there is a genuine difference of opinion. Uh, great noble scholars have taken both sides. Some people say niqab is wajib and mm. some people say that it's recommended. And we kind of broke the podcast down into different phases. We first spoke about whether hijab or niqab is a cultural thing or if, whether it's an act of worship it was also very relevant at the time if you remember the mufti of chechnya just came out with a statement saying that the niqab is a wahhabi saudi arabian cultural practice after we went through that we discussed the different evidences that both sides of the table bring forward on the scholars that you you know you took the position that the niqab is wajib it's obligatory and i took the position that it's not obligatory but it's still highly recommended and encouraged for the for our muslim sisters and i think this was I think I shared with you that it's the first time I looked into this issue and having read kind of my research that I did leading up to the podcast, I thought Sheikh Al-Bani came strong like he normally mm. does. I really thought that I was really believing. I thought this is very, very strong. After the podcast, I, I kind of got a glimpse into the other side, the one that says that Niqab is mm. wajib. I kind of went back. I did a bit of more additional research, looked into the ayat, had a conversation with you as well offline. And now I'm like, yeah, I think it's very, very clear that, <laughs> to me personally that niqab is uh, is wajib. So mm -hmm. an interesting discussion, uh, probably the longest podcast to date that we've had. Um, let's go on to the questions, inshallah. Okay, the first question is that there was a particular hadith in there, the hadith of Aisha and talking about Asma bint Abi Bakr. And Sheikh Al-Albani believed this hadith to be authentic. And if it goes in for him, it's very clear. I think the Prophet is saying that the woman has to be covered except the hands and the face. Very, very clear wording. You actually, and not just you, but other scholars as well, have weakened the hadith. Mm. The questioner asked, many times on the Hot Seat podcast, you said, Sheikh al-Bani authenticated this hadith. Sheikh al-Bani authenticated this hadith. Why now, when hadith goes against what, you, what you're pushing, do you say that Sheikh al-Bani got it wrong on this one? Mm -hmm. First of all, from Sheikh Nasr, ta'ala, from his tapes, from his works, we learned not to blind follow anybody. He taught us it, rahimahullah ta'ala. When I say he taught us it, from his works, if you read Sheikh Nasr, rahimahullah ta'ala's works, and I think I've read nearly everything that Sheikh Nasr, rahimahullah, has written, I've learned this concept of not to be fanatic to anybody, alhamdulillah, and it's helped me a lot. I don't base my religion on individuals, and where if a particular person, yani, is critiqued, I like to know why and what's the proof. Mm. If you take it, if you bring it, I'll take it from you. And Sheikh Nasir proved that in his works, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. And so um, I'd actually be following him by doing what he yeah. yani, encouraged us to do, um, you know, educated us to do. And anyone who reads the, yani, the first portion of his kitab, Sifat Salat al Nabi, the beginning of it, when he speaks about. Yani the statements of this Aymatul Arba'a, Abi Harifa, and uh, Imam uh, Malik ibn Anas and Muhammad ibn Idris al-Shafi'i and Ahmad ibn Muhammad ibn Hanbal, what they said regarding blind following, you would see how Sheikh Nasr Hamana pushes for the idea of following the Quran and the Sunnah and not to be fanatic for people. So I, I still believe I'm following Sheikh Albani in that regard. Mm -hmm. Secondly is that every hadith that Sheikh Nasr Grades and authenticate I can't always check them up I don't check every single Grading hadith of Sheikh Albani Sometimes I just stick to what he says Rahimahullah ta'ala And I stick to it But if there's a mas'ala I believe That Sheikh Nasir Rahimahullah ta'ala May not necessarily agree with him On this issue And he grades the hadith to be sahih And that hadith goes against My whole particular view that I have 
I'd have to see the authentication. I go, I take a step further. Yeah, okay. And I look into the hadith with him. So I, I look how the view of the, uh, I mean, the grading of the hadith, how he did this one. That makes sense. And if I find that he's grading is sahih, I've changed my opinion because I have now a delil in front of me. Mm. But uh, there are views, there's, sorry, there are issues which I don't agree with Shaykh al-Bani, rahimahullah ta'ala. The issue of Tariq al-Salah, for example, I don't agree with him. The issue of the niqab, I don't agree with the Shaykh. Uh, and there are other, many other issues, like the issue of al-lihya. Hmm. If it reaches hand, uh, yani hands, fist, fist. Fist for, yeah. Uh, if the beard reaches a fist, Shaykh al-Bani said it's wajib for the person to cut it. If they don't cut it, they're sinning. I think that's a very strange opinion. And there are many other issues like that that Shaykh Nasir rahimahullah gave fatwa in. That I don't see how the issue of fasting Yom, yom, yom Sept mm, Saturday. Uh, yeah, Saturday. The way he looked at the hadith and everything, I also don't agree with him on that issue. There are handfuls of issues that I don't agree with him, but in general, uh, he's a great Imam that I admire. Rahimahullah, rahmatan wasi'ah. Okay, um, a sister then asked, and this is the next question When Shahid kept asserting that the statement of Asma, her statement, we used to cover our faces when in the state of Ikhram. Uh, I kept saying this isn't sarih. This doesn't prove the obligation. It could be recommended, and of right. course, they're going to cover their faces. Um, she said, "Why did Ustad not mention that the asal in ikhram is to leave the face uncovered?" And we discussed that as well. So only another obligation can remove the initial obligation. So what she's saying is that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told the women that they can't cover their face in ikhram. Then we have narrations from Asma bin Abi Bakr saying that we used to cover. Our our face in ikhram Surely this can't be recommended Because if it was recommended And obligatory Then this can't overwrite The other one The only way is that If this is obligatory Then it can overwrite How do you know the question Is a male or female I think the username The oh, username the user said, yeah, Um something I think From memory So the first thing I think the sister fell short In the question Is that The uh, Prophet Sallallahu Did not prohibit A person from covering their face He just said That they can't wear niqab mm. So I think that, that, that the, the ground that the yeah. person is arguing on, which is that the face has to be covered in the state of ihram if men come by a woman. She just can't wear a type of face covering, yes. which yeah. is the niqab. Now. Yeah. So how does, you know, this question also comes up, how does someone cover without a niqab? How can someone cover their face? The jilbab. She, yeah, she, she, from the top, yeah. She yeah. can do it from the top, and sometimes you can just get, grab the side from the... Gym. Yeah, exactly. Okay, great. Um, the next one is, is it obligatory for a woman to cover her hands? Aynam, we mentioned the general hadith, al-mar'atu awra, the woman is awra. So her whole, her whole entire body is awra, she has to cover it. And so the whole podcast was about the face and the hands. Mm -hmm. And that's what we were trying to prove, that the woman has to cover her face and also her hands. Aynam. Okay, next question is, I do not believe the niqab is wajib, but I do wear it. So this is obviously coming from a sister. Um, however, if I'm at home and sometimes my cousins come around or even my friends who have sons, I see them as kind of my sons, I don't cover my face. Am I committing a sin? You know, I do, am, Is this sinful? Am I wrong for doing this? If the sister doesn't believe the niqab to be wajib, yeah, she's she of the opinion that it's not wajib, then of course she's not sitting. Okay. According to her madhab. Yeah. From my madhab, yes, I yeah, see her yeah, to be course, sitting. Yeah. But from her own madhab, yeah. she believes that it's not wajib. And I hope that she's reached that conclusion that it's not wajib after researching. Mm -hmm. She can't just say these two views, this one seems nice and applicable to my life. If she's taken that view based on that, she's a sinner. Mm. She has to come to this conclusion. Uh, of course, she's a sinner if she has the ability to research. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So if she can research and look into the issue and then come to that conclusion that, you know what? I don't actually believe, genuinely, I don't believe that... Uh, the niqab is wajib I've researched it I've looked into the issue The arguments are not strong to me If she's reached it in that, From that base And that ground Then of course no She can uncover her face um, Inshallah ta'ala Keeping in mind She can't beautify herself mm. Because both parties Agree upon that There's no yes. dispute In that matter She can't put in anything That will beautify herself And attract her Etc Okay final question On this episode I don't understand How Ustad Abdul Rahman Believes that if the husband Or father Thinks it's wajib For the woman To wear niqab but the woman doesn't believe it's wajib. He cannot and should not enforce it on them because there's a difference of opinion. If you're a husband or a father, you are responsible for your women to, to make sure that they follow what is wajib. And as a man, you're supposed to have ghira for your women and not want their beauty to be seen by non-mahrams. Before I go into the question, I'm not, I'm not a person who encourages people to always refer to me as Ustad Abdul Rahman or Sheikh Abdul Rahman. So if people just call me by my name, then I'm happy with that. And so when people use the word 
Ustad Abdul Rahman. Yani we've come to accept Ustad now because mm-hmm. Ustad is just a teacher. Yeah. You could be a disbeliever still be Ustad because mm. you're just a teacher. Mm. Um, definitely not the term Sheikh shouldn't okay. be used for 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 me or anyone like me. Shouldn't be using those terms. Those terms are very big and important. Should give it to people who are senior in age, righteousness in actions. Yani senior people. Okay. Um, but now Ustad has just become one of those words yeah. that everybody just takes on board. May Allah keep give us sincerity and truthfulness in our knowledge. Um. Coming to the question, um, what? So the person is saying, why are you saying that? Why can't the man enforce the niqab or enforce his woman to wear the niqab if he believes it's wajib? They don't, but surely it's the man's responsibility to make sure his women are doing what is wajib. <laughs> no, the scholars, when it comes to the issue of difference of opinion, they divide it into two. Masail which are yani ikhtilaf is two types. There are masail which are ikhtilaf sa'ir. The differences are you know acceptable. It's valid difference of opinion. And there is a second type of difference of opinion which is ghayru sa'ir. It's not valid. Well, this statement that many people use la inkara fi masail al khilaf. There is no yani inkar. I don't know how to translate that properly. That you can't I don't know, like rebuke someone. Yeah, yeah something like that. In in matters which are difference of opinion, that's wrong. That statement is wrong. You can't say la inkara fi masail al khilaf, but you can say la inkara fi masail al ijtihad, because masail al ijtihad is at, at the valid difference of opinion. It's the type of khilaf which is acceptable. For example, we have khilaf with ashaira. That's not valid difference of opinion. Mm. We have difference of opinion with the rafida mm. regarding Abu Bakr and Umar. Well, that's not a valid difference of opinion. Do you understand my point? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Well, Idalika, you even mentioned it yourself. All of the all of the series that we've had on the podcast are not valid difference of opinion. Correct. correct. Like, for example, apart uh, from the niqab issue, that's it. Yeah. So issues which are valid difference of opinion, the scholars they mentioned a qaida for it. La inkara fi masail al which is imposing your on your wife to wear niqab. When she doesn't believe it to be wajib She's done her research She's mm-hmm. looked into the matter She's come to the conclusion That this is not wajib For you to come and impose it on her Does kind of go against yeah. Yeah. You can teach her You can, you can educate, educate her. her You can discuss it with her You can go back and forth on it Also the Prophet Sallallahu uh, He didn't rebuke the both parties When he said La illa fi bani Quraydha, kama yeah. qala alayhi salam. This is a mas'ala which is Ijtihadiyya Valid difference of opinion The Prophet didn't rebuke any party even that though a party of them and he delayed the prayer. Mm. But they, they looked at the hadith and they understood this from it. Also, the, the statement of Imam Ahmad ta'ala, that Ibn Muflih mentions in the Kitab Al Adab al Shari'ah, where Imam Ahmad and also in his Furu'. And Imam Ahmad mentions, he said, It is not befitting for a faqih to impose on his free people or on the people his, يعني, his fiqh view. You not, shouldn't force your fiqhi view on other people when there is a valid difference of opinion. Yeah. What is a valid difference of opinion? A valid difference of opinion is the f- opinion that does not go against the Quran, the Sunnah, and the Ijma'ah. Generally speaking, masail which are ijtihadiyah is a, is, a, is, a, is a dispute in qiyas analogy. Mm. Some scholars they see this qiyas to be khafi, some say, see, see, you know, jelly, wama ila dalik. Not all the time, but generally speaking. Generally speaking, yeah. So, masail, which are ijtihadiyah, it doesn't go against the kitab, it doesn't go against the sunnah, it doesn't go against the ijma, and it doesn't also go against qiyas al jelly. It goes against qiyas, which is khafi, mm-hmm. the hidden type of analogy. You find it, it has ihtimalat, possibilities here or there. Like, for example, did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam see Allah? In, that's a dispute. Hmm. That's a valid difference of opinion. Do the dead hear? That's a valid difference of opinion. Scholars are discussing this issue. Does touching your private part break your wudu? Valid difference of opinion. Yani, there are many issues that the scholars mention which are valid difference of opinion. We don't go about causing people havoc and dispute and argumentation, but we still discuss it. And Imam Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah mentions that those issues you can still discuss it with a person. You can research it with them, back and forth, but in a friendly environment. Mm. As long as we don't take anything to heart, we go back and forth with each other because it's a valid difference of opinion. Mm. And when you start making those matters very hard on the ummah and you cause division, then you fall under the ayah, وَلَا تَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ تَفَرَّقُوا وَاخْتَلَفُوا مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَهُمُ الْبَيِّنَاتِ 
أما من الذين فرقوا دينهم وكانوا شيعا كل حزب بما لديهم فريحون specifically this ayah the second ayah it goes under that you're causing division and disunity amongst the Muslims mm. unnecessarily unnecessarily and there's a great many scholars that mention this issue that I just mentioned Ibn Taymiyyah mentions it in two places the way I categorized it Ibn Taymiyyah mentions it in his kitab Dalil Bayanu uh, Dalil fi Putlan in page 210 and 211 if you look at it you'll find it there expands on it there also in his Majmu' al Fatawa, if you go to the 20th volume page 207 expands on it exactly the way I said it Ibn Al-Qayyim in his Ilam the third volume page 300 Ibn Al-Qayyim rahimahullah expands on it Ibn Qudama Ibn Muflih mentions it in his Kitab Al-Adab al Sharia, the first volume page 186 also the Kalam of Al-Imam Nawi in his Sharh Sahih Muslim he actually says لَيْسَ لِلْمُفْتِي وَلَا الْقَاضِي أَنْ يَتَعَرَّضَ عَلَى مَنْ خَالَفَ وَإِذَا لَمْ يُخَالِفْ نَصًا أو إِجْمَاعًا أو قِيَاسًا جَلِيًا mm. as long as the person doesn't go against the Kitab and the Sunnah and the Ijma' and the Qiyas which is Jali uh, also Muhammad Abdul Wahab in the Kitab Durr al if you go to the fourth volume page, page 8 he explains it like that Shawkani in his Kitab Sayyid al-Jarrar if you go to the fourth volume, page 588, you find it there. And also Shaykh Ibn Uthaymin, rahimahullah ta'ala, in his Liqa Bab al-Maftuha, if you go to the um, yani the middle volumes, Ibn Uthaymin, rahimahullah, expands on this issue. So it's it's something those great imams of Islam, those seven great imams that I mentioned, mm. mentioned, la inkara fi masa'il il jitihad. Okay, um, let's move on to the final podcast, the one that we just did last week. Um, we thought, again, we like to address the contemporary issues. It is the towards the end of the year where the Christmas comes about and New Year. So we decided to talk about uh, whether Muslims are allowed to imitate disbelievers. And if they are, then what kind of conditions are they, do they have to fulfill? Let's play a short clip just to remind the viewers of what we spoke about. Imitating the disbelievers. And we're going to find out, inshallah, is it allowed for Muslims to do this? And if it is, then are there certain rules and regulations that Muslims must abide to and must abide by when doing this, inshallah? There are many reasons why this topic is very important. If you look at the waqa of the Muslim in the reality of the Muslims today, you find, you'll see that the issue of imitating the non-Muslims is so high and it's so great. A lot of Muslims are imitating the non-Muslims. They are following the Christians, the Jews, the atheists. Social media has now become that place where you go to even if you want to you know do something if you want to dress in a certain way social media you you take it there's someone on on instagram or someone on twitter or someone on facebook who you'll take as a role model and you'll follow and they will set you guidelines of what to do and what not to do secondly it's to clarify the truth and what i mean by that is there has uh, in any everything Allah has commanded subhanahu wa ta'ala There's always a people who go extreme in exaggeration And there's always people who are extreme in negligence There's always ifrat and tafrit And Islam always propagates Encourages us to be in the middle path The middle path is what Allah and his messengers say It's not what you and I feel is the middle path mm. yani, uh, Someone could say for example There's a woman who's wearing Yani, niqab and everything and she's wearing jilbab and another woman is wearing a tra trousers uh, and there's one who's wearing miniskirt the one says I'm wearing trousers I'm in the middle I'm you know mm -hmm. I'm the middle path I'm not extreme like the one who's wearing a miniskirt and I'm not extreme like the one who's wearing niqab and mm -hmm. she's jilbab and blacked out I'm in the middle I'm wearing trousers I'm still there no we say what is middle is set by who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in the Quran, Muhammad, if you follow these people's path, العلم, after knowledge has come to you, which is the revelation, you are not going to get any support or aid from anyone. Also Allah wa ta'ala, he says, we have made you upon a legislation, mm. follow it. And before that Allah mentions, الْكِتَابَ We gave them all of that. We gave them so many things. But Allah is telling Muhammad, you, we've placed you upon a legislation. You have a path. Also Allah says in another ayah, I do not be like the people of the scripture before you. Okay. Don't be like them. Allah is telling the Prophet wasallam. It goes back to the custom and the urf. And the urf is not determined by one person's feeling. Custom is determined by what the community sees. If I walked in today, if a non-Muslim came walking to you right now with a bisht and a igal and uh, you know, all of that, what would you say to him? Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> He never said anything to you. He never spoke to you. Just by seeing him. Are you there? Mm. I remember one time, subhanAllah, it was Halloween. They knocked on my door and they, one of them were wearing that. As a costume. As a costume. 
And I said, Assalamu alaikum. I think he's a Muslim. And he said, Oh, I'm not a Muslim. Check or treat. Mm. And just close the door. The point I'm trying to come to is that clothing, yani, that's unique for a people, makes you, th- be- people start to believe you're part of those people. Eid are matters set on stone. What do you mean by Eid? Eid means celebration. Okay. Celebrations and festivals for Muslims is set on stone. In other words, the Prophet والسلام, when he came to the city of Medina yeah. and he saw the companions and he, uh, they told him about their celebrations that they had, the Prophet والسلام, he said to them, Inna Allah abadalakum. Allah has exchanged for you. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah has what? Hmm. He's exchanged for you. Your celebrations, and it, 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 changed for you means it's all of it, it, it as Ibn Taymiyyah mentioned, Rahimahullah ta'ala, that everything that you are ce- currently celebrating, all of it has been eradicated. Yeah. And it has been changed with what? It's been changed with uh, these Eid, Eid al Adha and Eid al Fitr. So we tackled this issue quite comprehensively. I think the final video ended at around three hours. We talked about imitating them in their clothing, in their celebrations, even to the granular detail of haircuts and uh, even talking about this, their language and use, usage of slang. Uh, so I've got four questions for you from the audience for this one. The first one is, um, what is the evidence to say that all celebrations are religious, even though they are celebrations without any religious elements and people don't intend to come closer to Allah by those celebrations, for example, National Day, Mother's Day, Birthdays. The ulama, Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, Imam Ibn al-Taymi rahimahullah ta'ala, the great scholar Dhahabi rahimahullah ta'ala, Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani rahimahullah, Nawawi rahimahullah, Bayhaqi, all of them they stated that the al-a'yad min al-shara'i'i la min al-adat. That the celebrations are from the, yani from the sharia. They are leg- their religious issues. Or they are so not from the norms. Yes. Or, or, or reoccurring celebrations, we yeah, should yeah, say. Yeah, yeah, Okay. ولذلك ابن عباس رضي الله تعالى عنهما ما الله be pleased with him and his father when he came to the ayah لكل جعلنا من سكنهم ناسكوه عبد الله بن عباس he said عيدا the ayah says لكل every individual لكل أمة every أمة جعلنا we have place for them من سكن هم ناسكو the منسك ابن عباس here it means عيد Allah made for every people عيد so that shows you that the concept of Eid is a, a shara'i issue. Allah okay. sanctioned And define Eid in, in English. Eid is celebrations, yeah. yani festivals. Mm. Recurring, it's, it comes, what's the, what's the language? Adi, language? Yeah. Comes something like every yearly. Somebody says, look, this time of the year, I'm going to celebrate. Your birthday, haram. Yeah. The reason is because al-ayad min al-shara'i ila min al-adat. Also, another few evidences that show it as well is the hadith al-imam Abi Dawood al-Nasai narrated in hadith Anas bin Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Which said, كان لأهل الجاهلية يومان في كل سنة يلعبون فيهما. The pre-Islamic jahiliya, they had two days in which they used to celebrate. فلما قدم النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم when the messenger عليه الصلاة والسلام he came to Al Medina, the city of Medina, he said to them, كان لكم يومان تلعبون فيهما. You used to have two days which you used to يعني enjoy yourselves and have fun. وقد أبدل كوب الله. Allah has changed it, سبحانه وتعالى به ما خير منهما. That which is better than it. يوم الفطر and يوم الأضحى. Now, Shahid, I want you to ponder here with me, and I want the people who are watching this to also mm-hmm. ponder with me. If it's a custom and it's norms, why is the Prophet صلى الله sanctioning something for them? Why doesn't he let them have it? If it's norms and it's customs, and yani the Prophet didn't say to them, I, I've now come, you all have to eat this food. Mm, yeah, he didn't the, say yeah, that yeah, somebody, so. It wasn't connected to their religion These these celebrations he, Unrestrictedly He said to them so Some of them they just created They just made it up oh, okay. The Prophet وسلم, He changed it The fact that he tampered yeah. with this yeah. Or he changed this وسلم, It shows you that this is a matter of religion And not a matter of norms yeah. Also the Prophet وسلم, He said to Abu Bakr عنه, Inna li kulli qawmin eida Wa hadha eiduna and Imam al-Bukhari narrated Bukhari and Muslim both narrated in the hadith Aisha the Prophet which goes with the ayah لِكُلِّ أُمَّةٍ جَعَلْنَا مَنْ سَكَنْهُمْ نَاسِكُوهُ when the Prophet said oh ya Aba Bakr إِنَّ لِكُلِّ قَوْمٍ عِيدًا every nation have their Eid وَهَذَا عِيدُنَا and that's our Eid ولذلك الشيخ من عثيبين رحمه الله تعالى he says تخصيص الأيام أو الشهور أو السنوات he says restricting a day or a month or a year with Eid, marji'u ila al-shar'i wa laysa min al-ila al-''ada. It goes back to the shar'a. If you want to give a day 
in the year significance mm -hmm. or you want to give a month significance or you want to give a year that a year, that particular year I, it's, a, it's a special year for me if you want to say that you take it from the sharia and not from the uh, the norms of the people and the custom of the people well um uh, Ibn Rajab al Hanbali, he authored a kitab in this issue just to show us the days wow. which are significant, the months which are significant. He called it Lata'if al Ma'arif. Abu Bakr al Sunni read a kitab uh, called Al Amal al Yawmi wal Layla, what the Prophet used to do every day, every night, well, times which are significant. Why? Why is he writing it if just everyone could just do what they want? Mm. So in Islam, you're told what you can do this time, you're told what you can't do uh, at this time when mm. it comes to celebrations and Beautiful. stuff. Okay, the next question is, what is the evidence, and I think this is a context of this question, you mentioned on the podcast that imitating the disbelievers, even if you don't intend to imitate them, is still haram. Yeah. What is the evidence to say that even if we don't intend to imitate, it will still count as imitation? Because I heard from a prominent speaker's lecture that there is a difference between tashabbuh and tashabuh. Very important that you understand this. Great scholars, Ibn al-Qayyim, uh, rahimahullah mentions this in his kitab, Ahkam Ahli Dhimma. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah mentions in his kitab Iqtada wa Salat al-Mustaqim Mukhalifat Ashab al-Jahim Ibn Dhahbi rahimahullah ta'ala He mentions it uh, Rahimahumullah Those three great imams And other great scholars are Which uh, These three should be enough for anybody who mm -hmm. But I'm going to give the evidence for it They mention La yushtaratu al-qastu aw al-niyatu fi tashabwi bil-kuffar It's a qaida they mention They mention sorry it's That it's you English. do not condition a person's intent and their motive when it comes to imitating the non-Muslims. Okay. We don't condition it. They mention it. And there's evidence there that support them. Few, just few evidences. I'll give you two. The first one is Qawluhu Ta'ala, the statement of Allah, which we mentioned in the podcast, where Allah Tabaraka Ta'ala, He said, Ya ayyuhaladzina amanu la taqulu ra'ina wa qulu nzurna wa sma'u wa lil kafirin a'adhabun alim. Allah Tabaraka Ta'ala, He spoke to the believers. He said, oh, the, oh, oh you who believe, la taqulu ra'ina, don't use the word ra'ina. Wa qulu say instead of ra'ina, Say that. What is kafirin and for the disbelievers is what? A severe punishment. Ibn Kathirin, a great scholar, the student of Ibn Taymiyyah, he said something. He said, Allah prohibited the believing men and women. And yet, Allah ta'ala, he prohibited what? He prohibited the believers, the servants. For, from what? Imitating the, the, the behavior and deeds of the disbelievers. Hmm. The Jews used to use devious words that they hide when they really, to hide what they really meant. They would say something to the Prophet Sallallahu but they don't. They hide behind Tawriya, they hide behind words. Mm. They use indirect words. For example, they use the word Ra'ina. The word Ra'ina in Arabic means hear me and listen to me. So it's not an insult in the Arabic language. But in the Hebrew language, which is their language, it's an insult. It's tanqis to put someone down. So here they're using this word to try to put the Prophet ﷺ down. So if you ponder here and you analyze, the Sahabas, Ridwanullah, when they were saying ra'ina, were they intending to put the Prophet down? No, they weren't. The Jews were, on the other hand. They were trying to put the Prophet down and try to belittle him, والسلام. Allah Taala knows that the intent of the believers is good. Mm. They're trying to use it in the appropriate way. They're trying to say, Ya Rasulullah, hear us out. Ya Rasulullah, look at us. They were using it in, the, in, in, the, in a good way. Like in the Jews were using it in a bad way. Bigaddin nadar of what your intent is, Sahabas. The Jews are using it, leave it. That's what's taken from the ayah. Also another evidence that proves the concept of la yushtaratul qastu awin niyatu fi is the famous hadith of uh, Amr ibn Ambasat al-Sulami, which Imam Muslim narrated in his Sahih. That the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said, "Salli salat al-subh." He prayed the, dawn prayer, the fajr prayer. ثم أقصر عن الصلاة حتى تطلع الشمس حتى ترتفع. And basically um, hold back from praying until the sun rises. This famous hadith is a very long hadith. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentioned the ending of the hadith. He said, "وحين إذن يشجد لها الكفار." The disbelievers they prostrate at this particular moment. Mm. Now we know that the believers they're doing that for that reason. Why am I not allowed to pray at this particular time? Jesus, the disbelievers are doing it for that reason. Sorry, the yeah. disbelievers are pr prostrating to the shaitan and they're prostrating to the, 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 the yani shaitan. Like in, the believers are prostrating for, 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 for what? To Allah. To Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But are they still allowed to pray? Why? Why are they not allowed to pray? Just because it happened at the same time. It's because both of you, from the outer, you look the same. Even though the intention was for Allah. Wow, yeah, okay, that's very powerful. And another thing that 
شيخ الاسلام تيميه really drove home in his كتاب اقتضاء الصراط المستقيم لمخالفه اصحاب الجحيم and I encourage every student of knowledge to try to read this book is that the outer appearance will finally يعني يعني don't ever think to yourself your outer appearance hasn't got an effect with your inner appearance dressing from the uh, like the non muslims and being like them from the outer will finally become your motive and your intentions and everything will, will it will finally uh, uh, يعني sink into your heart yeah so at the beginning maybe you don't have that intention and maybe you don't uh, intend or wish to do it in that way but finally it will become imitating them and uh, doing it because you want to be like them so i think that's very important we understand it um that the qaida is la yushtarat al qasd aw al niyyah fi at tashabbuh bil kuffar ay na the next question i have for you is does the hadith wa man tashabbaha bi qaumin fa huwa minhum apply to the muslim rulers this hadith wa man tashabbaha bi qaumin fa huwa minhum is the hadith of abdullah ibn umar radiyallahu ta'ala anhu bu'thu bayna yadayi as-sa'ati bi sayfi hatta yu'bada allah wahdahu la sharika lahu وجعل رزقي تحت ظل الرمح وجعل الذلة والصغار على من خالف أمري ومن تشبه بقوم فهو منهم and this hadith eight great scholars have narrated it ibn abi shayb narrated it in his musannaf ahmed ibn hanbal narrated it in his musnad abd ibn humayd narrated it tahawi narrated it abu sa'id ibn al-arabi narrated it al-harawi fi dhamm al-kalam also ibn asak in his kitab tarikh dimashq these are the seven scholars who've narrated this hadith and also bukhari rahimahullah narrated it muallaqan uh, he narrated it وَجُعِلَ رِزْقِي تَحْتَ ذِلُّ الرُّمْحِ that part وَجُعِلَ ذِلَّةُ صَغَارُ عَلَى مَنْ خَالَفَ أَمْرِي that part Bukhari narrated it also Abu Dawood narrated the last portion of the hadith وَمَنْ تَشَبَّهَ بِقَوْمٍ فَهُوَ مِنْهُمْ just give a translation of that for the people the last part وَمَنْ تَشَبَّهَ بِقَوْمٍ فَهُوَ مِنْهُمْ is anyone who imitates a group of people he's from them okay. and Al-Imam Ibn Taymi rahimahullah ta'ala he mentions that this مَنْ تَشَبَّهَ بِقَوْمٍ فَهُوَ مِنْهُمْ تُعْتَبَرُ أَصْلًا مِنْ أُصُولِ هَذِهِ الْمَسْأَلَ مَسْأَلُ تَتَشَبُّهُ Ibn Taymiyyah says that this وَمَنْ تَشَبَّهَ بِقَوْمٍ فَهُوَ مِنْهُمْ is actually a fundamental issue that the whole discussion of imitating the disbelievers goes back to. Mm. يعني, it's one of the strongest ahadiths in this issue. It came uh, up several times in our discussion. Uh, yeah, we discussed it in great details. So what you are asking here is that the word وَمَنْ تَشَبَّهَ بِقَوْمٍ فَهُوَ مِنْهُمْ is it referring to the Muslim ruler? Does it apply to the Muslim rulers as well as everybody else? يعني, in أصول الفقه or in Qawaid al the scholars they speak about, Sulul al-Fiqh, the scholars they speak about Dalalat al A particular word, what can it indicate? What can this word show? And the scholars, like a small kitab written by Sheikh Abdul Nasr al Saudi, where he says, Kadaka man wa ma tufidani ma'a kulal umumi ya ukhayya fasma'a. That the word man and ma, they benefit generalization. But the word men, by the way, not the word min, min is harfu jar. Mm-hmm. We're talking about men. Men benefits you, uh, generalization. If it comes as a shartiya, like how do you tell if a man يعمل مثقلة ذرة خيرا يرى يو وما يتق الله يجعل له مخرج يو فمن ات فمن اعتدى بعد ذلك فمن اعتدى عليكم فاعتدوا عليه بمثل ما اعتدى عليكم يعني that man is shartiya, so it shows generalization. When you say فمن يعمل مثقلة ذرة خيرا يرى anyone. When you say ومن يتق الله يجعل له مخرج anybody. When you say فمن اعتدى عليكم فاعتدوا عليه بمثل ما اعتدى عليكم any any and everybody it also comes as istifhamiyah which is inter- integrative uh, basically qala qawlu ta'ala man dha alladhi yashfa'u 'inda illa bi idhnihi it's a question you've been yeah. asked a question ama man dha alladhi yuqridu allah qardan hasana shows generalization who whoever who who uh. also it comes as a mawsula which is a connective like qawlu ta'ala wa lahu man fis samawati wal ard wa man 'indahu la yastakbirun so this is umum and the evidence to show you that the word man shows generalization is the famous hadith that uh, al-imam uh, bukhari narrated it uh, and muslim narrated it and the wording here is the wording of al-imam uh, muslim the prophet ﷺ spoke about a person who has a horse mm. he takes care of that horse he feeds the horse but then what happens is that the horse leaves and he goes somewhere you're going to get the reward for the horse drinking from somewhere you know you you, you took real good care of that horse right. mm. then it wanders off and he goes to the ocean and the sea and he drinks from it you're not the one who gave him the water, but you used to take care of him. The Prophet ﷺ said, you get rewarded for that. So the Sahabas, they asked him about, okay, what about the donkey? Because the hadith was talking about? Horse. The horse. Then the Prophet ﷺ, he said in a hadith, this is the wording of Imam Muslim, he said, مَا أُنزِلَ عَلَيَّ فِي الْحُمُرِ شَيْءٌ إِلَّا هَذِهِ الْآيَةِ الْفَاذَّةِ الْجَامِعَةِ فَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِتْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ خَيَرًا يَرَهِ وَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِتْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ شَرًا يَرَهِ The Prophet ﷺ said, as for the donkey, 
Nothing has actually come to me regarding it. Mm. I haven't been said anything. Except the Prophet said, إِلَّا هَذِي الْآيَةَ الْفَادَّةَ الْجَامِعَةَ Except this comprehensive verse, which is, فَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ خَيْرًا يَرَى وَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ شَرًّا يَرَى So the Prophet brought the donkey into the discussion through the what? Umum of the word man. Yeah. Yeah. So the word man, it shows generalization. So when we say, وَمَنْ تَشَبَّهَ بِقَوْمٍ فَوَ مِنْهُمْ It refers to the believer uh, sorry, it refers to the uh, the it person. Applies. It, 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 yeah, it applies. You mean? It yeah, applies. yeah. It, um, it, it, it implies the uh, the the, the ra'i and the mar'i, the 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 leader who's leading the people and the people who are governed. It refers to everybody. Yeah. Anybody, whoever that person may be, is mean adawat al umum. Uh, last question I have for you on this final podcast. Uh, again, to contextualize the question, we did speak about language and imitating slang, for example, speaking in slang. A question asked, are you saying it's haram to speak in slang? You see, I've actually, in university, I studied linguistics. I studied ling applied linguistics. I did it on a BA's level. Uh, and I also did it on a master's level. Mm. So it's something I studied. I my dissertation was actually code switching from one language to another. Okay. But I do look into linguistics. I do yani, yani admire the science of linguistics, especially mainly for the for the science of Arabic language. Mm -hmm. I like to um, you know, learn a lot about languages, how they work. And if you study linguistics, you really can, you know, grow in the uh, knowledge even of the of the Arabic language. And it's something I, I love, the Arabic language. But when you look at language features, they mention you look at a language feature from a lexical perspective, you look at it from a phonological perspective, you look at it from a morphological. And a phonological perspective is how you pronounce the word. Mm -hmm. And you look at it from a morphological perspective, which is a sarfi perspective. Yeah. You look at it from a syntactical level of the language. When you look at slang, for example, and you observe it from those different variations, those different levels, you first of all come to, without a doubt, before you even look at that, that slang is a social dialect. It's not a regional dialect. It's not a country. It's not a. It's not like true. Yeah. It's just a little so. I mean, people who speak slang in in America is not the same as slang spoken in the UK. Correct. Yeah, it's true. So it's like a social dialect. It's people. When you look at it, speaking slang, it's my humble opinion, it makes you sound less intellectual. Mm. It makes you seem uneducated. And it also can be a hindrance if you're trying to build connection with the people. It could could be a, an obstacle. And a lot of the people who, the words, for me personally, you know, from my observation, from my looking, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go into great details of slang and where it came from, and even if the word itself is, is it right or is it wrong? And what does it actually mean? The point I'm trying to say is to, to you is, the slang, I found it, that it connects the people to, you know, use, 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 using slang, it connects a lot of people to a, a type of evil, yani music, yani killing, yani you know, uh, zina, consumption of alcohol and things like that. When you learn it, you, it this, this door opens for you. ولذلك when you even look at the kitab اختضاء الصلاة المستقيم لمخالفة أصحاب الجحيم ابن تيمية one of the things he mentions is do not speak the language of the disbelievers mm. يعني scholars are talking about are you even allowed to speak English wow. and mm. there's a discussion whether you can't even speak another language other than the Arabic language and scholars are saying this can it fall under the imitation of the non-Muslims the reason for that is because a lot of people the shah shubuhat comes to them from what, from what perspective the media the English media the language yeah. for example when I listen to you know, rappers and I listen to artists talking. I honestly don't understand what they're saying. <laughs> yeah, honestly, I don't know what they're saying. Yeah. So this, I can't connect with them. So when they, when they crack a joke, I don't know what's happening here. You, <laughs> so recently I had a family family member, you know, I was talking to them and I, and I, he's, he said to me, your, your, he said to me, your clothing is drip. <laughs> Have you heard that word before? I saw it on Twitter. I saw it. Someone said it on Twitter. That's the first time I heard of it. I had to ask someone. They told me what it means. You, they told you what it means? Yeah. I was like, what do you mean drip? Are you insulting me? Are you praising me? What, yeah. what, what does it mean? So for me, it's an, it's, 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 uh, it's a, um, it's, it's a f obstacle for me to understand them. So in other words, they don't entertain me. I don't like watching what they're saying. Um, yeah, that's true. Because of that lang language barrier in slang. And I think it's a na'ma that you don't know that this type. Not to mention, to be honest, and uh, 
I had a linguist teacher, his name is called Kazuya, you know, Korean teacher in Berkeley University. I think it's Korean, yeah. Mm. And subhanAllah, one of the things we were talking about is, you know, in linguistics you study insults, you know, foul language, yani, insulting and everything. They right, study okay, it as a language. Yeah, yeah. They study it as a language. Oh, as a language on its own? Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow, okay. And why does it affect people? And yani, they talk about it, the relationship between all of that. It's actually, a, some people do their dissertations on it. Mm. On it. And um, we love we study theories on, on regarding that. Like in the point I'm trying to come to is this concept of slang came up. Mm. So they're very politically correct. They can't say slang because they think if they do, it's offensive, and okay. you know they won't ever say this. Yeah. But I said to my teacher, I remember Wallahi, one of the things I said to him was that, do you believe within language standard, I meaning the way that a person uses language, it can actually determine whether a person is intellectual, is educated? Can a person be looked down at just because of the language they speak? He said, yeah, without a doubt. Mm. And even now, put slang aside for me, even even if I hear somebody speaking um, yani, Amiya, they're not educated from just speaking Amiya. When they speak Fusha and they don't do a mistake, that's when you say, mm. Allahumma barik. It's, it's a level higher than speaking Amiya. Mm -hmm. Is that my point? Yeah, definitely. And slang is not, it's worse than Amiya. It's lower than Amiya. Yeah. Because Amiya is just, um, yani, uh, Ami is just an informal way of speaking, but it's not. It's, it's, it's everybody speaking that yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, with you. Mm -hmm. It's Ami is more like when you go to the office. There's a language you speak, huh. which is a formal language. But when you go outside, there's that informal way of speaking. It's not a level of slang. It's just slang is actually yeah. even lower. Slang, no one uses it except youths and youngsters. It's restricted to them, mm -hmm. and it's also used by. It has a connotation, a bad connotation to it. So I'm not saying lashak. I'm not saying here it's haram. Okay. Um, I'm not saying it's haram, but it's something a Muslim should stay away from. And and I personally wouldn't want my child speaking slang with me. I wouldn't want them to speak to each other in slang at all. Um, and I would never use slang. I don't ever use slang with anybody. Never in my life have I ever had a conversation with somebody in slang. So uh, I might joke about a term that's used here or there. Yeah. I can to keep a conversation, I feel like it's, it's pathetic to be honest, and it's just unnecessary when I can get my point across in a, yeah, in a, in a decent, um, standard yeah. language. Plus, I don't even, in person, I don't even speak like classic, you know, intellectual, just this, just speak normal, just don't use slang, just speak normal, mm -hmm. and everybody will understand you, and you'll be appreciated what you're saying. That brings us to the end of our questions for today. There were two questions, by the way, that did come up quite often, but they're going to remain hot seat secrets. And that is, where do you get your drip from? Where do you get your clothing, your headgear? But that's going to be a hot seat secret. And the other one was actually about the clock. A lot of people are really interested into the clock. Like, where did you find this clock from? But Can I ask a third question? Okay, go ahead. Are you going to stop inviting me over and bring somebody else? <laughs> inshallah, I inshallah, there's going to be someone else as well. Inshallah, inshallah. Um, I think I just want to kind of say on behalf of the people really, just to thank you and to ask Allah to reward you for all the effort and you put into these you. podcasts. I personally know how much effort it takes. We've had episodes that have been three hours, four hours, 23 minutes. I think the Niqab issue was, I don't know how long we've been speaking today. Maybe this is even longer than that. But I know that um, it's a lot of work that goes into it. And I ask the people at home to make dua for you, I mean, to increase your knowledge, your family, everything. If anybody's, any, any, if anybody's benefited from this podcast, then ask people to ask Allah to accept it from you. And I just want to personally thank you as well for all the time that you put into it. Barakallahu feekum. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu wa la ilaha la ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk.